Chapter 1 Excuse me, which way to the gymnasium? Kelly pushed her hair out of her face with her mitted hand. Her hat slipped, and she tried to catch it as it fell. Down the hall and to the right. The teacher finished tying a little boy's shoe and handed her hat back to her from his kneeling position. Kelly blinked in surprise. He was incredibly hot for a nerdy teacher type. With dark blonde hair, thin wired glasses, and preppy clothes, he really had something going for him. Maybe it was the gray eyes. She shot him a smile. Thanks. You're welcome. He gave her a hesitant smile in return. Come on, Bentley. Kelly pulled her son after her, following Mr. Cute Teacher's directions. She hoped he was Bentley's teacher. She could start looking forward to parent-teacher conferences then. Kelly jogged the last steps and then skidded to a halt at the doors of the gym. It was nearly deserted. There was a small group of women around a table, but no one else was to be seen. "'Excuse me?' Kelly walked over to the ladies. "'Is this where we are supposed to register?' They looked so poised, and they wore very nice clothes. Kelly knew she was out of her league, but she straightened up and smiled at them. They forced smiles to their faces as they looked at her. The blonde in the middle broadened her fake smile a little further. "'You're late.' "'I'm sorry, but the bus doesn't extend all the way out here. "'We ended up walking quite a piece,' Kelly explained. "'She dug in her purse and held out several forms. "'I brought everything Bentley needs.' "'Perfectly manicured hands took the papers. "'Where are your parents?' "'Kelly stiffened. "'She was joking, right? "'Pardon? "'Your parents? "'You can't register yourself or your brother.' "'The blonde raised a plucked eyebrow.' Kelly bet she was Botoxed on a regular basis. That eyebrow had barely moved. Kelly strained her shoulders and said firmly, I'm Bentley's mother. I'm Mrs. Islington. Kelly knew that she looked a lot younger than her 29 years. If she didn't have a driver's license and the age of majority card to prove it, she wouldn't believe it herself. However, good genetics, a short stature, and dimples conspired against her. Most people pegged her for a teenager, and depending on the day, they guessed from fourteen to seventeen. It was embarrassing and frustrating. The blonde tittered, and so did her group of lackeys. How very funny. Really, now? Please inform your mother that she'll need to register Bentley and you to Livingston Academy. Until then, I can't help you. Kelly took the paperwork back that she had spent her breaks at work filling in yesterday and fake smiled. "'Could I have your name, please?' "'Susan Hythe,' the blonde replied. "'Thank you.' Kelly smiled sweetly and marched out of the gymnasium, holding on to Bentley's hand firmly. "'Mom, I don't feel very good,' Bentley said morosely. Kelly sighed and stopped, facing her son. "'Bent, we talked about this. It's natural to feel a little nervous about starting at a new school, but some of your friends will be here, too.' Anyone who lived near us, like Charlie or Ryan, should be in your class. You'll be fine, okay? He nodded. Okay. Kelly straightened. He was only in second grade, but he was growing too fast for her. She ruffled his hair, and he tried to duck away from her. Which way do you think the office would be? Bentley shrugged and scuffed his shoe against the floor, leaving a black mark. She'd forgotten to get his indoor shoes from first elementary. Maybe she would manage it at some point this week if her schedule allowed for it. Kelly sighed and saw Mr. Too Cute Teacher walking through the hall. Excuse me? He turned to look at her, and she hurried to catch up to him. Hi, do you know where the office is? I was just headed that way. He smiled at her, and Kelly's heart skipped a beat. Who is this young man? This is Bentley. He was attending first elementary, she explained unnecessarily. Ah, he said knowingly. "'What's that supposed to mean?' Kelly frowned. "'Nothing?' he shrugged, a little wary of her tone. "'I meant nothing by that. "'Just because one set of vandals decided to cherry-bomb all the toilets in the school "'does not mean the entire student body are criminals.' "'Kelly hotly defended her son's school. "'Just because he was cute didn't mean he could insult her son "'and the other first elementary students who had been transferred to Livingston Academy "'for the duration of the repairs. "'I didn't say it did?' he remarked mildly. "'Well, Bentley is a good boy,' Kelly huffed. "'I'm sure he is,' Mr. Cute Teacher said. "'Don't worry. I'm sure the board will get the first elementary fixed soon, and all of your students will be safe from our fleas soon enough,' 
She marched into the office. Who said anything about fleas? He wondered, following her into the office. Some posh woman in the parking lot. Kelly scowled at him before beaming a smile at the secretary. She put Bentley's paperwork on the countertop. Excuse me, I've had a misunderstanding trying to register Bentley for school. Mrs. Hythe sent me here. Perhaps you could help me. The secretary looked Kelly over. We don't allow siblings to register each other. You'll need to get your parents to come to the school. Kelly felt like she could scream. Instead, she put her hands on Bentley's shoulders and stirred firmly behind him. My name is Kelly Islington. This is my son, Bentley, whom I'm supposed to register this morning, preferably before my shift at work starts. If you can't help me, then I suggest you get the principal immediately. I need to see some identification, the woman said. Kelly pulled her wallet out of her purse. She set her hospital pass and her age of majority guard on the counter. Driver's license? The secretary asked as she perused the cards. I don't have one, Kelly replied. You expect me to believe this? The secretary held up the age of majority guard. What do you mean? Kelly's voice became a little brittle. This would make you... Her voice trailed off as she tried to calculate Kelly's birthday from the current date. Twenty-nine, Kelly flatly replied. Yes. The secretary gave her a look of disbelief. Please take a seat and I'll speak to the principal. Kelly gave her a tight smile. Thank you. Why did some silly kids have to pull such a stunt as blowing up toilets? Kelly took Bentley to the hard wooden bench and they sat down. At least at first elementary, they knew her, and dealing with Bentley's teachers hadn't been any problem. Kelly looked at her cell phone. She hoped this wouldn't take long. She couldn't afford to be late for work again. She noticed a message and opened her snapshots to find a picture of Michael and his daughter Amy on it. She sighed and closed the app. Now was not the time to be replying. Kelly tried to ignore Mr. Too Cute Teacher sitting beside her. Just because he was cute didn't mean he was very nice. Mr. Ramsley, a pleasure to see you again. A man came out of the side office, greeting Mr. Too Cute. Kelly frowned as the two men shook hands, and Mr. Too Cute was led into the side office, which had the plaque principal on the door. He didn't look like the Ramsleys Kelly knew. Now she'd wish she'd managed to get a quick picture of him and Snapchatted it to Michael. Surely Michael Ramsley would know who he was. How was that fair either? This Ramsley guy had come into the office after her and was now ensconced in the principal's office, talking about who knew what, while Bentley had to miss even more of the morning classes. Kelly tried not to grind her teeth. Bentley, if you're hot, you can take off your coat, Kelly suggested as she divested herself of her own winter coat, scarf, hat, and mitts. Her scrubs looked a little out of place in the office, but since she was going directly to work after Bentley was registered, they were what she had on. Bentley shrugged and leaned against her. She helped him out of his coat and rubbed his back, checking her cell phone for the time again. She was going to be late. "'Excuse me,' Kelly called out to the secretary. "'Is there any way we can hurry this up? I have to get to work.' "'I'm sorry. Principal Weston is currently busy.' The secretary gave her an insincere smile before going back to her typing. Kelly bit the inside of her cheek to prevent herself from saying anything uncharitable. She didn't want to set a bad example for her son. Twenty minutes later, she phoned Dana. How bad is it? Sandra spotted that you weren't here right away. I told her you were in the washroom with cramps, but I think she knows, Dana whispered. Where are you? Still at the school? Kelly frowned. You shouldn't have lied for me. I don't want you to get in trouble, too. I'll be fine. Just get here. Dana's voice became cajoling. Mr. Milton, if you would just take your pills, I can get you your breakfast. Thanks, Dana. Kelly ended the call before her friend could be caught talking on a cell phone at work. She looked calculating at the secretary. Do you know how long it's going to be? I'm sorry, the woman shrugged. Okay, Kelly stood up. Why don't you give me back Bentley's paperwork and my identification? I'll bring Bentley to the sitter today and we'll be back tomorrow to deal with this. The secretary looked at Kelly. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Excuse me? Kelly frowned. I'm not going to give you back your fake ID, she said firmly. You're kidding. Kelly couldn't believe the woman. I'm not, she stated. The principal will deal with this. 
That is my legal ID. Give it back. Kelly felt like yelling, but she restrained herself. She was Bentley's role model. No, the secretary said smugly. That's it. Kelly hopped up, leaning her upper torso on the counter, and swiped Bentley's paperwork with her IDs. She shoved them into her purse. Hey! The secretary got up and came around the counter, arms flailing. You can't do that! Kelly grabbed Bentley's coat. Get dressed, Bent. We're leaving. Mom, I really don't feel good, her son said as he got reluctantly to his feet. I know, you've said that already. Kelly held up his coat. Come on, I'm late for work. Give me back those papers, the secretary demanded. What is going on here? A new voice said. Kelly looked up to see the principal and Mr. Ramsley standing in the doorway behind him. She stole paperwork, the secretary accused. My son's paperwork and my IDs, which you refuse to give back, Kelly said hotly. The argument came to an abrupt halt as Bentley threw up, most of it hitting Kelly squarely in the abdomen. Kelly felt it seep into her clothes as it dripped downwards. Oh, Bent. I told you I didn't feel good, he said miserably as he wiped his mouth. Kelly nodded. I'm sorry I didn't listen better to you. She carefully tossed his clean coat onto the bench. Miraculously, her son had managed to stay clean. If he's sick, he needs to go home, the secretary stated scathingly. I have had it with this school. Kelly rolled up her top and managed to get it over her head without getting vomit on her face or in her hair. She threw the scrub top on the floor. Fortunately, she wore a long-sleeved shirt underneath. I have never met such a bunch of stuck-up, unhelpful, unfriendly people! She furiously grabbed their winter gear in one hand and Bentley's hand in the other. Snobs! Rude! How dare you! I don't know where I'm going to find another school for Bentley, but I will find one where they put the child first! Kelly marched out of the office, Bentley following her. Her cheeks were flaming. She was angrier than she'd been in a long time. Where are we going? Bentley asked. We're going to Grammy's house. She'll have to look after you while I go to work, Kelly grimaced. She was still wet on her long sleeve shirt and smelled like vomit. She hoped her spare set of scrubs in her locker at work were clean. I don't want to go to Grammy's house, Bentley whined. Kelly really didn't want him to go there either but her mother would look after him for free. You get the day off of school with Grammy. You can sleep all day and watch cartoons. Maybe even play video games with your Uncle Josh when he gets home from school. Bentley brightened at the thought. Kelly helped him on with his coat and hat. It was going to be a long walk to the bus stop. Excuse me, Mrs. Islington? A hesitant voice asked. Yes? Kelly looked up to see Mr. Ramsley looking down at her. He extended a hand in greeting. Dylan Ramsley. Would you like me to call you a cab? She couldn't afford a cab. She hesitantly shook his hand. Kelly Islington. Thank you, but Bentley and I will walk to the bus stop. He frowned. It's a bit far and you have a sick child. Would you like me to give you a ride? Get in the car with a complete stranger? She might think he was cute and liked his voice, but Kelly wasn't about to give her son bad examples to follow. Thank you, but no. She smiled to soften the rejection. He really was handsome. I'm sorry for what happened earlier today. Normally Livingston Academy staff were very welcoming and helpful. His warm gray eyes looked a little troubled. Well, I guess I came on the wrong day. Kelly tried not to grimace. I'm sorry, but I'm really late for work. Of course, he nodded. Kelly gave him one last forced smile before hurrying Beltonley down the long lane toward the road. She was super late. Sandra was certain to know that she hadn't made it on time, no matter how Dana had tried to cover for her. Kelly braced herself as she came out of the staff room, having changed into clean scrubs. She hurried to the nurse's station to look at the schedule. "'We've all pitched in, but you need to get yourself together,' Cheryl said. "'Sandra knows you're not here and wants to speak to you right away.' "'I'm sorry,' Kelly apologized. "'I was at the new school.' "'Don't tell me about it.' Cheryl put up a hand as she signed off on paperwork. I love you, Kelly, and I know how hard it is to be a single mom. However, you have a job to do. I know, Kelly sighed. I'm trying. Try harder. Cheryl pursed her lips and left to see a patient. Kelly sighed. 
Mentally preparing herself, she went to Sandra's office and knocked on the door. Sandra motioned her in. She leaned back in her chair and watched as Kelly took a seat. I am very sorry, Kelly said. I was at Bentley's new school and there was a problem registering him. Then he was sick and I had to take him to my mom's. I'll make up my hours during breaks. Kelly, I have your employee file here. She motioned to the pages on her desk. You have too many days where you come in late or have to leave early. I'm a single mom, Kelly tried to reason with Sandra. It's not easy. I'm trying really hard, though, and I'm a good employee. You might be a good employee, but I need team players. You're letting the other nurses pick up your slack. If that's not being a team player, Sandra frowned. I have decided to put you on notice. On notice? What does that mean? Kelly felt a little panicky. She needed to keep her job. One more late, one more leaving early, one mistake, and I'm going to have to let you go. Sandra closed Kelly's file with a finality on the discussion. You can go back to work now. Kelly continued to sit in her chair. Is there anything I can do? I really need to keep my position here. Honestly, Kelly? Sandra asked. Kelly nodded. I'm really not holding out much hope for you. Sandra opened a file drawer and put the file away. Now, please go back to work. Kelly felt let down at Sandra's bluntness. She had always tried her best at work. She thought she was a very good nurse, but she also knew that Sandra didn't really care about that. Sandra cared about having everyone follow the rules. There was no point in arguing with her boss. Kelly sighed and returned to the nurse's station to take over her patients for the day. She was scheduled to work eight hours in the ward and then the rest of her shift in the emergency room. Dana grabbed her. Have you been to see Sandra yet? Dana asked. Yep, it was painful as always, Kelly said grimly. She wasn't about to let Dana know how bad it really was. She didn't need it spread all over the hospital that she was about to get canned. Realistically, she knew that it was unlikely that she would never not be late again. That meant that she needed to start job shopping now. However, the job market wasn't exactly great at the moment. Nor was she likely to get such a plum spot at a hospital again if she had a bad review from her current employer. She's not too pleased with me, either, Dana rolled her eyes. Kelly sighed. I told you not to cover for me. I don't want you to get in any trouble. It's not any trouble. We're friends, Dana grinned. Thank you for trying, Kelly gave her a smile. Now I'd better get some work done. Eight hours later, found Kelly in the emergency department. She was tired, sore, and dirty from a child who had thrown his entire lunch tray at her. Considering her other scrubs had puke smell, she'd wiped off the lunch as best as she could and continued working. "'I'm sure the doctor will be with you just as soon as he can, Mrs. Whittle,' Kelly forced herself to smile and stay upbeat. "'As you can see, there's a lot of patients here, and everyone needs attention.' Mrs. Whittle gave an angry snort and crossed her arms. Kelly left while she could. She grabbed her next chart on the pile and headed to the next exam room. "'Hey, Tinkerbell.' Can I get some more gauze or something? A voice called out to her. Kelly stopped to see a guy sitting in one of the exam room beds, holding a blood-soaked pad to his eye. She grabbed a couple of sterile gauze pads out of the supply cart and came over to see him. Max? Kelly asked. When did you get tattooed? Lady, I don't know who Max is. He pulled the pad away from his face to show a split eyebrow that was still bleeding. Taking the new gauze, he pressed it to the wound with a grimace. That's going to need stitches. Kelly cocked her head to look at him. Are you sure you're not related to Max Ramsley? You look just like him. I wouldn't know. He looked at her. What am I getting stitched up? Kelly had a feeling that she'd just been lied to. Once your wound has stopped bleeding so much, I'll clean it, and the doctor will stitch you up. Great, he muttered. Look, I have places to be. Is there any way you could just stick a bandage on it and I can leave? You've got a two-inch gash. It will scar, Kelly warned. I'm okay with that, he said. Let me check with the doctor in charge to see if that's okay, Kelly advised. I'll be back. She went to the nurse's station and grabbed her phone out of her pocket. Taking a quick look to make sure Sandra wasn't around, she surreptitiously snapped a photo of the guy in exam room six. Kelly sent the photo to Michael, along with a question mark. Michael Ramsley had been her patient when he had a couple of tumors removed from his brain. 
As a result of the surgery, Michael now had a condition called speech aphasia. He could no longer write, read, and had issues with speech. When Michael and his wife, Anne, came to the hospital for follow-up appointments, Kelly had hit on the idea of teaching him to Snapchat so he could communicate over the phone with friends and family. Now they were Snapchat buddies. Kelly loved that she got to see Michael, Anne, and their daughter, Amy, in pictures. Max Ramsley was Michael's brother. If anyone knew who the guy and with the bleeding head wound in exam room six was, Michael should. Hey, the guy in six, what's his name? Kelly asked the desk nurse, Clarissa. Why, trying to get his number? She winked. He's a little short on charm, even if he's hot. I noticed. He wants to be bandaged up and sent home. Kelly smiled. What he really needs is stitches. Clarissa pulled the file. Andrew Colburn Ramsley. Kelly frowned. He'd said he wasn't related to Max Ramsley. Maybe he didn't know Max personally, but they both had the same last name in the same city. It was pretty likely they were related. Thanks. No problem, she smiled. Kelly continued to work her rounds. The hospital was packed with people, and it was slow going, getting through them all. Don't worry about it, Mr. Robbs. It happens all the time. Kelly smiled at the older gentleman and closed the privacy curtain. Hey, Tinkerbell, the familiar voice said. When am I getting out of here? Kelly jumped. He was right behind her. She turned and gave him a brilliant smile. Hi, hopefully after you've had your stitches. You should go back to the exam room. Andrew Colburn Ramsley looked down at her, unamused. I've been here for two hours. I can't wait any longer. Well, we've had a car accident and a few other more urgent cases, which have unfortunately bounced you back a little bit in the list of priorities, Kelly explained. Please just be patient and the doctors will see you as soon as he can. He rolled his eyes and turned away, answering his cell phone. Kelly shook her head and went back to the desk area. She looked at Clarissa. That Colburn Ramsley guy from exam six? Who's his nurse? He looks like he's going to be a runner. Let me check. Clarissa looked through her paperwork. He's Shelley's patient, but she just got off shift. Do you want him? Kelly rolled her eyes. Not really, but someone has to make sure he stays to get stitches. He's all yours, honey. She smiled and handed over a chart. Thanks. Kelly grabbed the paperwork and gave it a quick scan. She walked back to exam six to find the bed empty. There was also a lot of blood on the blankets. Kelly checked Shelley's notes again. All it said was the split eyebrow. She hadn't even cleaned the wound before she'd gone home. Kelly frowned and quickly scanned the emergency room. She didn't see him. Worry began to gnaw at her. She couldn't afford a missing patient. Kelly went back to see Clarissa. Have you seen him? Who? Clarissa was distracted by another chart being handed to her by one of the residents. Andrew Colburn Ramsley, the hottie from exam six? Kelly looked around the room again. He should easily stand out. He was over six feet, wearing a black tee and jeans with tattoos down his arms and dark hair. Nope, she typed at her computer. Call security. Kelly was feeling a little panic setting in. He might have left. Did Shelley say anything about him other than the gash through his eyebrow? Kelly, Clarissa frowned. I don't have time to read everyone's charts or talk about every patient. I understand, but I'm worried there's something more going on with him. Kelly knew it was policy to change bed linens between patients. Either he'd gone into the exam room before he was supposed to, or Andrew had more injuries than what Shelley had assessed. Please, Clarissa, just call security. Clarissa rolled her eyes. You know how many false alarms we get each week? He's probably in the washrooms. He's not here, Kelly insisted. I'm going to check the parking lot. You're not supposed to leave during your shift, Clarissa said as she picked up the phone, punching in the extension for security. Kelly ignored her as she walked out the automatic doors into the chilly evening. She rubbed her arms and looked around the dark parking area. She couldn't believe that Shelley had been so careless. Crossing the right of way for the ambulances, Kelly searched the row of cars. Finally, she had nearly exhausted the parking lot when she saw a dark figure on the ground by a motorcycle. Kelly grabbed her phone. Using the flashlight app, she could see that it was her patient. Tinker Bell, he grimaced. She crouched and grabbed the t-shirt on his back. It was soaked. She lifted it up to see multiple stab wounds. Why didn't you say anything? What? he asked, his voice slurring. Some punk got me in the face with a knife. Well, he got you in the back, too, Kelly stated. She knew he was in shock and wasn't going to be able to walk. 
Billy, he blinked. Huh. You didn't notice? She asked in disbelief. Kelly also couldn't believe that Shelley hadn't asked about any other injuries or documented them. She looked around. They were alone in the parking lot, but she could see an ambulance attendant cleaning out his rig on the other side of the lot near the emergency entrance. No, he seemed surprised. My face hurt. Kelly gave him a firm pat on the cheek so that he would look at her. I'm getting help. Stay right here. Okay, Tinkerbell, Andrew replied. She hoped he would listen. Kelly raced to the ambulance attendant. Hey! The EMS guy looked up. Hey! Kelly repeated and pointed back the way she had come. I need you and a gurney over here. Soon, with the help of the EMS, she had Andrew on a gurney and back to the emergency room. Exam room six. He has multiple stab wounds on the back and one to the face. She helped transfer Andrew back to his original bed, grabbing scissors to cut off his shirt when she was interrupted by Sandra. Kelly, Sandra said, come with me. Kelly looked at the team of nurses and the doctor who were with Andrew. He's my patient. Now, Kelly, Sandra's tone was firm. Putting down the scissors, Kelly stripped off her disposable gloves and followed Sandra. Ed, the emergency room security, followed them to a quiet hallway. Kelly, you can gather your things from your locker. Ed will see you out, Sandra said. You're firing me? Kelly asked in shock. I'm letting you go, yes, Sandra said calmly. Why? she demanded. You left the property. We discussed what would happen if you left during your work hours again, Sandra sighed. This shouldn't come as a surprise. My patient was outside, bleeding in your parking lot, Kelly's voice rose. What was I supposed to do? Patients are allowed to leave voluntarily at any time. We are not a prison, Sandra stated. He didn't sign out, which means the hospital would be liable if he died, Kelly said hotly. Do you even know who he is? He's one of the Ramsleys. They own this hospital. I'd love to see what they'd do with the people in charge if he died here through our negligence, because no one would go out to the parking lot to make sure that he was okay. Kelly, I'm not debating this, Sandra cut her off. You disobeyed the rules. You're fired. Ed, please make sure she gets her things and escort her off the property. I just saved you a lawsuit. Kelly couldn't believe this was happening. I just saved your job and you're firing me. Give me your hospital badge. Kelly wiped away an angry tear and yanked off her hospital ID, slapping it into Sandra's hand. She spun on her heel and marched to the staff room where her locker was. She was so furious. Ed tried to sympathize with her, extending his apologies for Sandra's decision, but Kelly wasn't in the mood to listen. She grabbed her stuff, throwing it into her oversized purse, and pulled on her coat. It wasn't right. It was humiliating. She wanted to yell at someone and demand that Sandra give her job back. She knew it wasn't going to happen. Sandra was in a serious relationship with her supervisor, so she could do no wrong in his eyes. There was no point in taking this up to anyone higher. Kelly left through a side exit. She didn't need people to see her get escorted from the building. Ed said good night and wished her luck. Kelly burst into tears. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 2 Dylan didn't know why he did it. Perhaps it was because he had seen Kelly Snapchatting his cousin Michael. After she had left, walking down the long lane leading away from Livingston Academy, he had called Anne, Michael's wife. With a few easy questions, he had confirmed Kelly had been Michael's nurse and did indeed work at Mercy Hospital. Dylan had then taken it upon himself to talk to the school's principal to ensure that registering Bentley Islington would go smoothly tomorrow when she returned. He had also gotten promises that the principal would investigate why it had been so difficult for Kelly to do a simple routine registration. Dylan didn't like to think that anyone at their school would give the new students from First Elementary or their parents a hard time. Now that he was home with the boys this evening, he had been going over the paperwork from the insurance of Mercy Hospital. It was due for another annual report, and Dylan felt that he should have someone from the Ramsley Insurance go and look over the hospital. He knew that Rhonda Coventry was looking to further her career, 
Perhaps he would let her assist him on an assessment, and then let her run the next few. The thought crossed his mind as he did something he normally would never do. He googled Kelly Islington. He was sure it was just idle curiosity. That was the problem with having so much information at one's fingertips, he decided. You could just put in a name and learn all sorts of things you weren't meant to. Dylan had learned that Kelly had been married to Christopher Islington, son of Margaret and Terence Islington. The Islingtons were small-time benefactors of various local charities. Terence had a chain of furniture stores. Their son, Christopher, had died of cancer at age twenty-five. He had been married to Kelly for maybe a year. Dylan wondered why an Islington was enrolled in First Elementary, a public school in a not very good section of the city. Surely the grandparents could have paid for a private education of the boy. He also learned that Kelly had a Facebook account. She didn't post many pictures to it, and had only thirty or so people as her friends on it. It looked like it wasn't used often. Mostly she turned down invites from her friends to go places or do things, citing she couldn't get a sitter or other excuses such as having a shift to work at the hospital. Dylan decided he'd seen enough and closed his laptop. Hayden, what is the term for someone spying on other people through Facebook again? Creeping! You're a creep! Caden shouted back from the living room where he was busy doing homework. Thanks, Dylan said wryly to his oldest son. Eleven going on adult, Caden was ever helpful and had more attitude than was sometimes necessary. What are you working on? Art, Caden's voice conveyed his disgust. I don't understand why I have to take a subject that I'm not any good at. I'd be better off spending my time working on subjects that I excel in. Says who? Dylan came over to the table to see how Caden was progressing. Avery had already finished his homework and was watching a program on television. Me? Caden frowned. I'm wasting my time. Maybe so that you can have appreciation for it, even if you aren't good at it, Dylan replied. Also, it helps for you to try to do some things that you aren't good at. How can it help? he asked. Dylan thought about it. It helps your coping skills, expands your patience, and you are learning from it. What am I learning? Caden lifted an eyebrow. You might be learning that you don't like Art Deco, so when your pal says, let's go to this Art Deco exhibit, you can say you'd rather go to the abstract gallery, Dylan said. Is it really important to know this stuff? I mean, how often do you use it? Caden rolled his eyes. Not often, Dylan admitted. Mostly to impress girls like your mom. She liked art. However, there are careers like architecture or museum curator where a knowledge of art is essential. I'm going into the insurance business with you, Caden said confidently as he colored in another area of his project. You don't have to. It's your choice what you do. Dylan wanted his sons to be able to choose their own directions, not to feel pressured like he had by his father. Dylan and his siblings, Jake and Everett, had all followed their father Robert's footsteps into the family insurance business. Dylan barely saw his brothers any more as Jake was overseeing the western half of the country, while Everett was trying to break into the European insurance market. The last time he had seen them had been for Shannon's funeral. Dylan pushed the thought aside. I know, but I like math and numbers, Caden spoke up. I want to work with you. Thanks. Dylan knew by the time Caden went to college that might change. Until then, he would enjoy the sentiment behind Caden's words. Need any help with this? Nah, I got it, Caden said. Dylan nodded and went to check on Avery. Sometimes he worried that he worked too much and didn't spend enough time with his sons. He sat down on the couch beside Avery. What are you watching? Avery shrugged. There's nothing good on. I buy a hundred or more channels every month. I'm sure there's something good on, Dylan said dryly. It's all kid stuff, Avery complained. Thank goodness for parental controls, Dylan thought. Avery was only seven. So you're just bored, then? Avery shrugged. Do you want to do something? Dylan asked. We could play a game while Caden finishes his homework. Okay, Avery hopped to his feet. Foosball? You're on. Dylan followed Avery to the game room. Soon enough, they were engaged in a battle over the ball, gently ribbing each other and talking tactics. Dylan was having fun, and he knew Avery was enjoying it. Then his cell phone rang. Dylan automatically answered it. He was always available to his staff. 
he assured Avery that he would just be a moment to retrieve a file in his office. Two hours later, Dylan closed his laptop and ended the call. He hadn't meant for things to go on so long, but there were serious questions about the viability of a new customer. The restaurant franchise had some big gaps in their application for insurance, and time was running out on whether Ramsley Insurance would take them on as a client. Things needed to be investigated further before any commitment would be made. Dylan inwardly winced as he checked his wristwatch. Going out of his office, he found that the lights were off. Both boys had already gone through their bedtime routines and were sound asleep when he found them in their rooms. Dylan watched them for a moment, knowing he would have to make it up to Avery somehow. Feeling restless, Dylan went down to the kitchen. He thought about getting something to eat or having another coffee, but he didn't want the caffeine. The house really was too big for the three of them. It felt unused and half-empty most of the time. It also contained too many ghosts. The only reason Dylan stayed was that it had adequate parking for his car collection, which, if he was honest, wasn't bringing him much pleasure any more, and because he didn't want to upset the boy's routine by moving. Dylan wandered through the main floor and wondered if he would sleep at all tonight. The guilt was eating at him again. Guilt at not finishing the game with Avery. Guilt at not being the best father since he worked too much. Guilt over his daughter Shannon's death. Guilt over his wife, Wren. He looked over the manicured lawn and felt the house pressing in on him. "'Mom, what do you mean he's not here?' Kelly asked. She'd just come into her mother's house, wiping her wet shoes on the mat, when her mother had announced that Bentley wasn't there. "'I brought him here this morning. You were supposed to watch him.' Meredith blinked. "'Well, I can't watch him all the time. He just disappeared.' Bentley doesn't just disappear. Kelly followed Meredith into the kitchen. Where is he? I don't know. Meredith lifted a shoulder. I don't know where anyone is. Kelly rubbed her eyes. Did Josh go with him? Or Moose? Moose hasn't been around for a few days. She hiccuped. I think he's working again. Kelly ignored her mother's scathing voice. Moose working would be good. She concentrated on the hiccup instead and leaned in to sniff her mother's breath. You've been drinking again. Don't judge me, Meredith hissed. Mom, I need to find Bentley. Kelly tried to stay calm. After the day she had, it wasn't working. When and where did you see him last? I don't know, Meredith clutched at the sink. Tell me what happened today. Kelly felt like she was grasping at straws. She'd known it was a bad idea to leave Bentley with her mom, but she didn't have many choices these days. Where did you go? What did you do? Ah, uh, you brought Bentley over? Meredith scrunched up her face as she tried to think. We had a nap, then lunch. I made mac and cheese. That's nice, Mom. Kelly tried not to be impatient. Then what happened? Josh came home from school. We argued. He tried to make me feel responsible, Meredith huffed. When I was his age, I was on my own. No one was responsible for me. Nowadays, kids think you need to coddle them until they're 25. Mom, what happened after you argued with Josh? Kelly interrupted her mother's rant. Meredith blinked. I don't know. I suppose they left. Did Bentley go with Josh? Kelly asked desperately. Maybe, she shrugged. Do you know when Moose will be back? No, Kelly gritted her teeth. She had no idea when her stepdad would return. I don't know, Mom. Oh, Meredith sniffed. Kelly ignored her and started searching the house. She looked for anything that might give her a clue as to where Bentley had gone. She finally found a note taped to the light switch in Josh's room. Kelly, gone to your place, Josh and Bentley. Thank goodness. Kelly closed her eyes and slumped in relief. At least someone was responsible in this house. The sad part was that it was the barely fifteen-year-old. Kelly took a calming breath and decided not to deal with Meredith at all at the moment. She didn't want to get sucked into her mother's drama right now when Bentley had been sick today and now only had Josh watching him. Kelly went straight through the house, locking the door behind her. It didn't take long to get to the bus stop, and a half hour later she was in her own neighborhood. She dug out her keys and was about to unlock the door to the house when her landlord opened the door. "'Mrs. Islington,' 
the old woman grimaced. You're late on the rent. I need you to get caught up. I have other people waiting on the apartment. Kelly tried to dig up a smile for the old biddy, but just couldn't. I will get you your money as soon as I find it. The landlady gave a hump of disbelief. She pushed a letter at Kelly. What's this? Kelly asked, taking the envelope. Your eviction notice. If you don't pay in full by the end of the month, you're out. The landlady stomped off and slammed her first floor apartment door. Kelly swallowed hard. She knew her bank account had nothing in it. She lived paycheck to paycheck, despite working sixty-plus hours a week. She felt like she hardly ever saw her son. The way things were going, she'd be moving back with her mom by the end of the month. That would be the ultimate failure in Kelly's eyes. She closed the door against the cold and trudged up the steep, uneven steps to the attic apartment. Josh, her half-brother, must have heard her on the steps because he opened the door to let her in. Shh, he's finally sleeping. Thanks, Josh, Kelly whispered. She shucked her coat off and dumped her purse on the ground. Do you know what she did? Josh said in disgust. She fed him candy. He's sick, and she stuffs him full of mac and cheese and then goes to the convenience store to buy twenty bucks worth of useless candy to gorge on. No wonder he was throwing up again when I got home from school. Oh, Josh, Kelly rubbed her eyes. Classic mom trying to buy love. She went to check on Bentley, who, while flushed, didn't seem to have a fever. She would have to take his temperature later. He was sleeping peacefully right now, and she didn't want to disturb him. Kelly went into the tiny kitchen. Have you eaten yet? No. Josh took out his homework and spread it on the coffee table. Can I live here? I can sleep on the couch. He asked that at least once a month. She didn't think he would ever move in because he took it upon himself to care for Meredith when Moose was away. Kelly tossed the eviction notice on the coffee table for Josh to read. She looked at the nearly empty fridge and opted for peanut butter sandwiches. Where are you going to go? Josh looked up from the letter. I don't know. Kelly sat down and offered him a couple of the sandwiches. She kept one for herself. I lost my job today. He wrapped an arm around her in a hug. Kelly leaned on him for a moment. He was such a good younger brother. I guess you could always live with us. Kelly grimaced. It might come to that. I was joking. Josh looked at her in concern. I'm really hoping you get yourself together so I can move in with you. Kelly rolled her eyes. If I ever manage to get it together, I'll let you know. Kelly groaned as the alarm went off. It was still dark outside. She didn't understand why people chose to create schedules that required them to get up before the sun. She stumbled out of bed to the shower and got ready for the day. While she brushed her teeth, she tried to find her natural optimism back. There was no point in being gloomy. She had a month to figure something out before she had to go home and beg her mom for a place to stay. Until then, she would do her best to find a good job. Something that paid more and let her not work as many hours. Something with a signing bonus so she'd get her finances figured out. She was probably dreaming, but hey, she had until the end of the month to figure it out. She would figure it out, she told herself firmly. There was nothing else to do. Kelly shook Bentley awake. Rise and shine! How are you feeling today? Bentley stretched and yawned. I'm fine. Is Grammy in trouble? Kelly smiled ruefully. Maybe a little. She knows better than to feed sick little boys candy. Josh yelled at her. Bentley rolled out of bed. Only because he doesn't like to see you sick. Kelly ruffled her son's hair. He loves you. He's a good uncle. Bentley nodded. Am I going back to that school today? Yep, Kelly sighed. We'll give it another try. I hope they're nicer today, Bentley picked out clothes. Me too. Kelly made sure he was okay in the bathroom before getting cereal and juice ready in the kitchen. Josh looked up from the couch. What time is it? You've got another hour yet. We have to leave early to get to Bentley's new school, Kelly explained. Josh grunted and pulled the blanket up over his head. Kelly hurried Bentley through breakfast, and they made it to the bus stop with plenty of time. Thankfully, Bentley seemed fully recovered. An hour later, and they were making their way up the two-mile trek to Livingston Academy. Kelly wasn't looking forward to doing this every school day. 
Why don't they have a bus stop at the end of that enormously long lane? Tiana groused as she and her son Patrick walked along beside Kelly and Bentley. Patrick was in grade eight, and technically Tiana didn't have to walk with him, but since she had time before her shift at the nursing home and she wanted to talk to Kelly, she chose to make the trek. Probably because they don't have kids who ride the public transit, Patrick said dryly. They're too rich for that. Kelly looked at Patrick's ripped jeans and sneakers with a hole in them. She knew that the kids from First Elementary were going to have a hard time fitting in. It looked like the Academy students wore uniforms. Is there a dress code? Kelly asked. Tiana snorted. Yeah, minimum $2,000 worth of dress code. They suggested First Elementary kids might want to look at purchasing uniforms to fit in. Right now, it's not mandatory, since hopefully the school will be opening once the plumbing issues get fixed. I heard it's going to take until summer of next year, Patrick said. Where did you hear that? Kelly asked. Denny. His dad's a teacher at first, Patrick explained. He said they found lead pipes, which means the entire plumbing system needs to be overhauled, not just the Johns. Great, Kelly tried to find the good part in all this. That means the two of you are going to get an exemplary education for the next seven months. Some of those students you're with are going to be future Congress members. Patrick rolled his eyes. What's a Congress member? Bentley asked. Someone who is in the government, Tiana said. Speaking of taxes, Kelly looked at Tiana. Are you guys hiring? At the nursing home? Tiana shook her head. I wish. We're so overworked, it's not funny. I think three of the aides are ready to burn out, but if you're looking for a nursing position, they're filled. I thought you were happy at Mercy Hospital. Kelly grimaced. I got let go. I need a new job ASAP. I'll ask around, but it's tight right now, Tiana sighed. I wish I had better news. I'll start with the job agencies this morning after I get Bentley registered, Kelly said. I thought you got Bentley registered yesterday, Tiana asked, surprised. Kelly rolled her eyes. I'll tell you about that later. This time, Kelly brought Bentley straight to the office. She sighed when she saw the same secretary on duty, but pasted on a determined smile. Hi, I'm here to register my son Bentley. Please take a seat, Mrs. Islington, while I get the principal. The secretary immediately got up to knock on the principal's door. Kelly was surprised when he came out and went directly over to her. Mrs. Islington. He extended a hand in greeting. I'm Principal Wright. Hello? Kelly took his hand. I must apologize for yesterday, he smiled. There seems to be a miscommunication with the PTA ladies and my staff. Mr. Ramsley was very concerned that you have a smooth experience in registering your son this morning. This must be Bentley. Kelly was a bit confused. Yes, this is Bentley. You said Mr. Ramsley talked to you? Yes. Principal Wright led them into his office. He asked specifically that I take care of your registration. He did. Kelly was surprised. That was nice of him. We at Livingston Academy are pleased to be able to help out First Elementary during their reconstruction process. It's through generous donations like Mr. Ramsley's that we can afford to do so. The principal held out some paperwork. While you fill these forms in, I'll make copies of Bentley's transcript and other documents. Kelly held out the paperwork that she had. Actually, I downloaded all the necessary forms from the email that was sent to us. It should be all here. Even better. He gave it a cursory glance. Where is the uniform page? I was given to understand that uniforms for first elementary students weren't mandatory. Kelly hesitated. They're very costly. Principal Wright smiled. Mr. Ramsley mentioned that it might be an issue and has offered to purchase the basic uniform package for each first elementary student that comes to Livingston Academy. Kelly blinked. There were at least forty kids from Bentley's school going to Livingston until the pipes were fixed. That meant Dylan Ramsley had just casually dropped eighty grand without blinking. Wow. He is a very kind and generous man, Principal Wright said. We're very pleased to have his children Caden and Avery attend our school. No doubt, Kelly thought. He has very deep pockets. Principal Wright set aside her paperwork. Why don't I give you the tour and then we can get Bentley settled in his new class? That would be great. Kelly couldn't believe how easy getting Bentley registered was this morning. 
Dylan Ramsley had obviously said something after their talk yesterday, and it had made all the difference. She wondered, not for the first time regarding the Ramsleys, what it must be like to wield all that power and wealth. Then again, there were some things money couldn't buy. Kelly put her hand on Bentley's shoulder. They followed Principal Wright as he talked about the history of the building, the art gallery, the large cafeteria, and what types of healthy meals and snacks were served, the large gymnasium with the impressive sports programs they had, the academic programs, and the large library. Kelly was going to be very disappointed when she had to bring Bentley back to the regular public school. It wasn't that she didn't think the school system wasn't good. It was just inferior compared to what money could provide at Livingston Academy. She felt very poor, and hoped Bentley didn't feel the same way. She didn't want him feeling any less than any other kid here. Finally, they stopped at the grade two class. Bentley was introduced to Mrs. Connor, his new teacher who made him feel welcome. Seating was alphabetical, but Kelly was glad to see Ryan and Charlie, two kids from First Elementary. At least Bentley would have immediate friends. Kelly reluctantly left Bentley in the class, following the principal back to the office. He obtained a school uniform brochure for her and asked her to indicate what sizes would work for Bentley. He also assured her that Bentley, with all the other students from First Elementary, were enrolled in the cafeteria program so she didn't need to worry about sending snacks or lunch with him. "'Was that Mr. Ramsley's idea?' Kelly asked. Principal Wright smiled. "'He's been very helpful in ensuring that all of the children have a seamless transition into Livingston Academy.' "'I see.' Kelly looked down at the uniform guide. It looked very expensive. "'I'll be sure to thank him.' She took her leave and walked back to the bus stop. Thankfully, since she was unemployed, she wouldn't have to pay for any after-school programs or child care which had always eaten a huge chunk out of her budget. However, Kelly needed a source of income as quickly as possible. While on the bus, she filled out the basic package sizes. Two thousand dollars bought six shirts, four pants, two pairs of shorts, two ties, a sweater, and a jacket. She could go to the local thrift store and get something similar for under a hundred, but it wouldn't have the school crest on it. Kelly shook her head at the extravagance. Thank goodness she wasn't the one paying for it. She could only hope there wouldn't be any expensive field trips. Hours later, Kelly was back at the school feeling dejected. She'd been to four employment agencies, and all of them cited an overcrowded job market, especially in nursing. They promised to keep her resume on file, but since she had been terminated from her job, it was unlikely that she would receive any contact from potential employers. There were just too many people looking for work. Kelly handed in the uniform guide order form and went to collect Bentley from his class. She was surprised to see Dylan Ramsley approach her. "'Good afternoon, Mrs. Islington,' he said. "'Good afternoon,' she replied. She took a deep breath for courage, or maybe to break the spell of that voice and those nice gray eyes behind the glasses. "'I want to apologize for yesterday. I was having a tough day, and it's no excuse for some of the things that I said.' Dylan grimaced. "'Actually, I think you are very right about some of the things you mentioned. The truth is, we've been patting ourselves on the back at Livingston Academy for being charitable enough to take in students from First Elementary. However, the school didn't think through the entire situation. It's one thing to offer free education to First Elementary students in their time of need, but we neglected to think about uniforms, food issues, finances for field trips, the things that are going to help integrate the students so that they make friends here. For instance, how long of a walk is it to the bus stop from the academy? Two miles? Kelly was startled that he had bothered to remember that they were walking. She was surprised that he put so much thought into the matter at all, considering it didn't directly involve his kids. She knew the other Ramsley brothers were really considerate people, too, but they had an inborn conceit that all of those born with money seemed to have. It wasn't distasteful, it was just slight arrogance that they could solve any problem since they had the cash to do so. That means you're walking eight miles a day just to drop off and pick up Bentley, he asked. Yes, Kelly replied simply. That's unacceptable, Dylan frowned. Kelly shrugged. There's no choice. I have to do it. I can't let him walk it on his own. Tomorrow there's going to be a shuttle service, Dylan stated firmly. Today is the last day that anyone needs to walk that distance just to get to school here. A shuttle service? Meal plans for the cafeteria? The basic package for school uniforms? 
He must be blowing through money, Kelly thought. It's not really necessary, Kelly said. Kids from all around the city walk to school each day. But it is necessary for those parents who have small children yet still need to get to work on time, Dylan pointed out. Obviously, he remembered their conversation from yesterday when she had been late for work. True, Kelly allowed. The bell rang, and she hurried to add, I wanted to thank you for everything you're doing, the meals and the uniforms. Dylan frowned. Who told you? Principal Wright. He wasn't supposed to say anything, Dylan sighed. Well, I'm glad he did, because you're going to make things a lot easier for our kids, Kelly insisted. I know that some parents will think it's charity, but I appreciate it. Anything that will help Bentley be like the other kids and give him the chance to make friends is a win. Thank you. I really do appreciate what you've done. Dylan looked a little uncomfortable with the praise, and Kelly wondered how often he was given gratitude. They were interrupted as Bentley ran to greet Kelly, and another boy went to see Dylan. Kelly ruffled Bentley's hair. How was your first day? Great, he smiled up at her. I got invited to my new friend Avery's birthday party. Really? She was glad he had made friends so fast. That's awesome. It's this weekend, Bentley said. Can I go? Sure, Kelly smiled. She loved that Bentley was so easy to get along with and had a natural knack for making friends. Are you ready to go? Yep, he waved to the boy near Dylan. Bye, Avery. Kelly realized the boy was Dylan's son as he gave a quick wave back, then grabbed his dad's hand, chatting a mile a minute as they slowly walked down the hall. She wondered if Avery's dad had put him up to inviting Bentley and the other boys from First Elementary to his birthday party. Even if he had, at least Bentley was being included. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 3 I should have looked at the invite before I said yes, Kelly groaned as she complained about the upcoming birthday party Bentley had been invited to. The address isn't connected to any bus route. I'll have to use a cab, which costs money I don't have. Then there's the gift. Any kid from First Elementary would be happy to get a ten or twenty dollar toy. What do you get the rich kids? Josh, Patrick, and Bentley were all in Tiana's living room playing video games. That meant Tiana and Kelly could have some much needed time together in the kitchen, attacking ice cream to soothe their woes. I have the solution to our problems, Tiana said as she dipped her spoon in the pecan caramel. I'm all ears, Kelly said around a mouthful of Rocky Road. Our kids are in that fancy new school. She popped a spoon into her mouth. There've got to be at least two single dads in the place. I don't care how fat or ugly he is. If he's got enough cash to send his kids there, I'll take him. Tiana! Kelly laughed. She tried to ignore that her mind immediately focused on Dylan Ramsley. She hadn't seen a ring on him, but that didn't mean anything. What? I can be a kept woman, Tiana said. When we were growing up, I thought your goal was to be a mom and housewife. Fine, Mr. Filthy Rich, and you can do that. I did get to be a mom, Kelly pointed out. How many kids did you want? Tiana asked. Before I knew what labor was, Kelly laughed. She tried to ignore the twinge in her heart that said she still wanted more kids and a loving husband. I wanted six, at least. I thought big families were awesome probably because I was only child for so many years until Mom married Moose and had Josh. See? Tiana pointed at Kelly with her spoon. Now is your chance. Is this guy single, the one who is hosting his son's birthday party? Yes, Kelly reluctantly agreed. At least I think so. Then you've got until the end of the month to get him to think you're irresistible and ask you to move in with him. She grinned and sipped her coffee. I don't think he's the type to just shack up. Kelly rolled her eyes. I'm not that type, either. You're in a desperate situation. Think of Bentley and all the advantages he would have as the stepson of some rich guy, Tiana said. You know that you could stay with me, but it's going to get crowded. I have three roommates. It's the only way I can make the bills work. I know, Kelly sighed. I'll probably end up back at my mom's. Tiana made a face. All the more reason to snag Mr. Rich. Is he cute? Kelly tried not to blush. He's not exactly hard to look at. You think he's cute, Tiana grinned. Spill. 
Okay, Kelly laughed. He's got really great eyes and an amazing voice. The type that just makes you feel gooey inside when he speaks. Oh boy, Tiana was amused. You like this guy already. How's his figure? Kelly shrugged. Nice. Oh, so now you're trying to downplay it. Tiana eyed her. You had better stake your claim before I see him. I have decided I am in the market for a sugar daddy. Hey, do you have data on your phone? Kelly suddenly asked. Sure. Tiana dug her cell phone out of her purse and handed it over. It only took a few moments to Google Dylan Ramsley. They looked at his picture together. He's nice, Tiana said doubtfully, not exactly a heartthrob. It's the glasses, Kelly decided. He would look better in contacts. Dylan Ramsley, COO of the Eastern Division of Ramsley Insurance, third son of Robert and Beverly Ramsley. Robert owns Ramsley Insurance. Tiana quirked an eyebrow upward. He's got big money, then. Kelly scanned the page. He's widowed, has three children, most of the rest is about awards and company stuff. Three kids is a lot to take care of. Tiana ate another bite of ice cream. He needs some help. You'd be doing him a favor by making him your sugar daddy. Patrick rolled his eyes as he grabbed a glass of water. Sugar daddy? Really, Mom? Hey, Tiana called after him as he left to go back to gaming. You will be thanking me when you can afford college. Kelly scrolled through the search engine results. She clicked on a random result and was rewarded with a picture. Oh, wow, look at them all. Tiana leaned in to see. It was an older picture in GQ of the Ramsley men titled Ramsley Brothers, Inc. All of them were in it. Patriarchy brothers David, Robert, James, and Oscar, each who headed up a division of the family business from pharmaceuticals, insurance, hospitals, and hotel chains. Then there were the men's sons, each of whom were part of the business. All wore expensive tailored suits and looked serious for the picture. There were fourteen sons. To the side there was one lone daughter, also in the family business. They throw a lot of boys, Tiana commented, reading the names. There's Michael, Noah, and Max. Kelly blinked. They look a lot younger. This must be from nearly ten years ago. Where's your crush? Tiana asked. Kelly shook her head at Tiana's teasing. He was easy to spot since he was nearly the only dark blonde in the raven-haired bunch. Dylan is right there. Brothers Jake and Everett. Tiana pointed them out. Fourteen boys and one girl, all of them working in their dad's business. Talk about family pressure. Kelly looked at the photo. Dylan looked so somber. Not much had changed, except Kelly thought he seemed sadder and a little older. She had this horrible instinct to hug and mother him, plus maybe do a few other things to him that weren't so motherly. Kelly sighed and looked over the rest of the names. She frowned. There's no Andrew Colburn Ramsley. Who? Tiana questioned as she looked over the men on the page. The guy from the hospital. Kelly gasped. I forgot all about him. Tiana gave her a puzzled look as Kelly grabbed her phone and called the emergency room extension. She checked her watch and was relieved that Clarissa would be on the desk. Hey, Clarissa, it's Kelly. Remember that guy, the hottie from exam room six? Andrew Colburn Ramsley? I was just wondering how he was. Kelly, Clarissa greeted her. I can't believe what Sandra did. Are you okay? I'm good, Kelly grimaced. I'll find a new job. It was wrong, firing you for helping that guy, Clarissa sympathized. If you need a reference, let me know. Thanks, I'll take you up on that. Kelly tried to steer the topic back to Andrew. How did he do? Is he okay? He went straight to surgery after you left, Clarissa said. Let me just check the records. Looks like he was admitted and stayed overnight. He's not in ICU, so he must be doing well. Good, Kelly breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks, Clarissa. She ended the call and was surprised that Michael hadn't Snapchatted back a comment about Andrew. Maybe they were distant cousins, or perhaps Andrew had been truthful when he said he didn't know Max Ramsley. Is Max single? Tiana asked casually. Kelly laughed, happily married with two boys. She showed Tiana a picture from her Snapchat account of Max, Paget, and their two boys, Morgan and Ryder. She's beautiful, Tiana grimaced. I think we might need makeovers if we're going to snatch up some rich guys. I can't afford a makeover, Kelly sighed. You can't not afford one, Tiana eyed her friend. Think of it as an investment. 
Really, Tiana? Kelly lifted an eyebrow. Do you think anyone is going to be able to turn this from 14-year-old look-alike to suave and sexy? The dimples conspire against you. Tiana was a little disappointed. And the fact that I'm barely over five feet. Kelly ate another scoop of ice cream. I should be concentrating on getting a new job. How did the employment agencies go? Tiana asked. Terrible. It sounds like no one is hiring nurses right now. Kelly shrugged. Unless I want to move, which I can't afford to do. It looks like I need to find a job in another field until something opens up. Something will come up, Tiana tried to be positive. You're still camping with us on Thanksgiving, right? Always, Kelly agreed. It's tradition. Besides, Christopher's parents are looking forward to having Bentley for the weekend. Tiana rolled her eyes. I'm not sure you should let them spend so much time with Bentley. They take advantage of it. It's nice that they want to spend time with their grandkid, Kelly automatically said. Truth be told, she was starting to get a feeling that the Islingtons wanted more than just time with Bentley. Margaret and Terence had been not so subtly hinting that Bentley would benefit from living with them. It also helps that they are free for babysitting. I just have a bad feeling about it, Tiana shrugged. Enough, Kelly said firmly. Let's stop focusing on the things we can't change and work on what I originally came here for. I need to borrow your internet so I can put out my resume on job sites. Is that why I'm your friend? Tiana said in mock hurt. Only because I have internet service? Absolutely, Kelly deadpanned. They both grinned and turned to Tiana's computer. Mrs. Islington, good morning. Kelly looked up to see Dylan handing Avery his backpack. Good morning, she replied, ignoring the funny little bounce in her abdomen. You can call me Kelly if you'd like. Thank you, Dylan. He gave her the same courtesy. I know that the invitation to Avery's birthday is a little short on notice, considering it's this weekend. However, Avery wanted to ensure that all the boys in his class were invited. That was very sweet of him, Kelly said. He's a good kid, Dylan acknowledged. However, I've begun to think that there might be an issue for parents without access to transport. Hiring a cab might be an imposition for some. It might be, Kelly allowed. She wondered if he was always this stuffy, or if he ever had any fun. He had two boys. Surely he played with his kids. I have talked to some of the other parents, and we have decided to put together a carpool directly after school on Friday. He frowned as he presented the solution. I also thought perhaps some of the new parents might feel a little uncomfortable allowing their children to go on an event like this, since they aren't familiar with Avery over myself. I have extended the invitation to parents as well. That way, there will be more chaperones and everyone can feel comfortable. That's a good idea. Kelly thought it was really nice that he had put so much thought into the matter. I hope that you and Bentley will come. He gave a small smile. Avery said that Bentley was in his reading group yesterday and they enjoy the same type of books. A dad who listened to his kids, Kelly thought that was a point in Dylan's favor. Not only was he cute, he was a good dad. He was also thoughtful of others. If he could loosen up a bit, he might even be more attractive. Kelly shoved the thought away. She wasn't here to score a rich husband. She smiled. Bentley said he was looking forward to going. There you are, Susan Hyth smiled the dentist's fortune in veneers and threaded her arm through Dylan's. I was hoping to talk to you about the upcoming Christmas fundraiser. Susan, have you met Kelly? Dylan asked politely. Kelly smiled even as inwardly she acknowledged Susan's blunt attempt to ignore her and snag Dylan away. She wondered how long Susan had been pursuing him. Mrs. Hythe and I have met. Oh, Susan tittered. She looks so young. I quite forgot you aren't a student. Kelly wondered if she should say something catty about Susan's age, but decided against it. Instead, she kept her smile firmly in place. Kelly's son Bentley is in Avery's class, Dylan added. That's nice, Susan smiled. If you'll excuse us, I'm just going to borrow Dylan. It's for the Christmas fundraiser that the school puts on each year, Dylan said. If you'd like to join our meetings, I'm sure we could use more help. I don't think that's necessary. Susan jumped in. After all, she's new, and she doesn't know how things are done here yet. Plus, we have almost wrapped up all the details. It would be silly to add Kelly into the group and to have to catch her up on everything when we are almost finished. That's okay, Kelly forced a smile. 
it was obvious that Susan was trying to stake a claim on Dylan. Maybe next time. If you're sure, Dylan said. Absolutely. Kelly watched Susan drag him down the hall, chattering in his ear. She tried to ignore the sinking feeling in her stomach. Just because she thought he was cute didn't mean she had any sort of monopoly on him. However, he seemed such a nice guy, and it would be wasted on a cougar like Susan Hythe. Kelly hoped he knew what he was getting into, because Susan was trying to sink her claws in. Tiana, you would not believe it, Kelly said into her phone as she looked into the spa and bathroom mirror. It's huge! A mansion! There has to be at least six bedrooms. The garage has five doors, and it's enormous! Five doors! He's one man! Who needs five cars for one man? Maybe there's one for each day of the week, Tiana suggested. Have you seen any pics of the dead wife? No, Kelly frowned. Is that weird? Maybe not. Maybe it means he's gotten over her. Does he wear his ring? she asked. No. Kelly looked into the mirror. Was that a wrinkle? With these high-definition light bulbs, she was seeing things that her low-watt bulbs were missing. Susan Hythe. One of the moms at the school has been attached to him like glue and glitter. She's ready to change the no-ring status any time he gets a clue. This mirror was so clean. Kelly wondered how much he paid his housekeeper. Then you need to bounce her out of his way, Tiana advised. Get out to him first. He's yours. Kelly laughed. He's not mine. You just think he's cute and he gives you tingles. Tiana was exasperated. You will lose out on him unless you can get him to like you. I don't need him to like me. I need his kid to be good to Bentley so that he has a good time in that new school. She could just imagine Tiana rolling her eyes. How much? What? How much do you think he spent on this party? I don't know, Kelly said. There's a bounce house in the backyard. A clown was hired. All sorts of rides and games. It's like a mini kid's carnival. He has a mansion and five cars. He dropped at least a hundred grand on all the first elementary kids for lunches, uniforms, and a shuttle. Tiana sighed heavily. Yet you want to not even be in the competition for him. Get that sugar daddy! He's a nice guy. Kelly felt a spotless white towel. It had to be the softest she'd ever laid her fingers on. Who happens to be rich? Tiana crunched down on something. Kelly could hear her chewing through the phone. Go get him! I have to go back to the party, Kelly rolled her eyes. That's my girl! Chase him down! Tiana cheered. Okay, hanging up now. Kelly ended the call. She gave herself one last look in the mirror. She had gone with jeans, sneakers, and a sweater. Her hair was in a simple ponytail. She looked fourteen if she was lucky. Not exactly worthy of competing for the guy. Kelly shook her head ruefully and exited the bathroom. She was surprised to find Susan in the living room all alone holding a backpack. Can I help you? Kelly asked sharply. She recognized Bentley's bag in Susan's hands. Oh, Susan jumped, startled. I wasn't expecting anyone to be here. Why aren't you out in the yard with everyone else? Why are you holding my son's knapsack? Kelly cut straight to the point. Susan had a nervous laugh. I saw something glittering in the zipper. Really? Kelly conveyed her disbelief. Care to share? Oh, Susan fake gasped. Look at this. She pulled out a silver chain with a ring on the end. It glittered in the light. Wow, Kelly said flatly. I wonder what an eight-year-old boy wants with an engagement ring necklace. I especially would like to know where he got it, and when he managed to put it in his backpack since he's been in the backyard the entire time we have been here. Really? Susan blinked. How do you know that? Cut the bull, Susan. Kelly marched over and took the necklace. I don't know why you're trying to plant this on my son, but he didn't steal it. I don't know what you're talking about, Susan said. All I did was accidentally find it. Right. Kelly said sarcastically. I'm going to assume that it belongs to Mr. Ramsley. If you'll excuse me, I will give it back. Thank you. I'll take that right now. Dylan came forward into the room, extending his hand. Kelly handed over the necklace. He glanced at it before pocketing the jewelry. 
You do understand that there are security cameras all over my house? Dylan asked casually. They came with the house, and I have never bothered to learn how to shut them off. Susan paled. Kelly wondered if there were cameras in the washrooms. She hoped not. She hoped there weren't any audio recordings of her conversation to Tiana. That would be embarrassing. What if someone had chili or a burrito? Who would want it to have their after-effects of that recorded? Kelly shook away those thoughts. Rich people were weird. She wouldn't want any cameras in her house. You could tell me how my wife's engagement ring came to be here when it's supposed to be my daughter Shannon's room, or I could just rewind and play the recording. Dylan's voice was flat as he looked at them. You know, I just remembered that Philip has a dentist appointment, Susan smiled. We should probably go. Kelly, I'll let you explain about how you found the necklace in your son's backpack. Wow, Susan, Kelly laughed. Did you not hear about the cameras? Just confess and be done with it. He's going to watch it all later anyhow. I don't know what you're talking about, Susan said coldly. Susan, Dylan spoke calmly. Your son, Philip, will always be welcome here as Avery's friend. However, I think it would be best if you didn't come over again. She blinked. I'm hurt, Dylan, that you would think such things about me. I'm going to collect my son and we'll be out of your way. They watched her leave. Kelly frowned. You don't happen to have cameras in the bathroom. That would be a little gross. There are no cameras, Dylan replied dryly. Then that whole conversation? Kelly looked at him in confusion. It was helpful to let me know to never trust Susan Hythe. Dylan took out the engagement ring. I wondered what she was going to do with it. Either she doesn't like me or she wants to get rid of the first elementary kids. Kelly shrugged. I did overhear her not being exactly thrilled that our punk kids were commingling with the nation's future. It seems a bit extreme, Dylan said. Maybe, Kelly allowed. Yet if she wanted to have the kids from first kicked out of Livingston Academy, then getting Bentley suspended or a record with the police would be a good start. Then it's a good thing she didn't succeed, he remarked. Shall we rejoin the others? Kelly nodded and preceded him through the house. I didn't know that you had a daughter. Dylan took a moment to gather the right words. Her name was Shannon. Kelly stopped, walking to have a look at Dylan. He had such sadness in his life. She knew that he was a widower from the Google search. She hadn't known that he'd lost a daughter as well. I'm sorry. Dylan gave a short nod. Today is Avery's birthday. I'd like to try to keep it a happy day. Okay. Kelly reached out and put a hand on Dylan's arm, wanting to comfort him. It was easy to see that he still struggled with grief. I think you have done a really good job with all those games in the yard. Those kids are going to sleep really well after tonight, after all the exercise. He gave a half-smile at her change of subject. Caden and Avery had a lot of input into what to get. I'm glad Avery and Bentley have become friends, Kelly said. Caden is amazing, by the way. I really appreciate how he handled Bentley's gift. He's a really thoughtful boy. Bentley had carefully chosen out a book that he knew Avery would like from their talks during reading time. However, one of the other boys had gotten him the book as well, and Avery had opened the other boy's gift first. Bentley had felt bad about getting a duplicate gift until Caden had piped up, saying it was cool because now his brother could read one book, and any friends he had over could read the other book at the same time for simultaneous fun. All the boys had agreed that it was a great idea, and Bentley had been happy to see that his gift was just as good as everyone else's at the party. He is eleven years old going on adult, Dylan agreed. I'm really proud of him. Do you know what that means? Kelly questioned with a smile. What? he asked curiously. That you're a good dad. She let go of his arm and went out the patio doors to join the party. Dylan watched her mingle with the kids, smiling and chatting to them. Most of the other parents were huddled in groups amongst themselves, talking or watching the kids. Kelly instead jumped right in, asking if they needed more cake or juice, serving and asking questions. It was obvious that she adored the kids. She had an easy way with them. He savored the rare compliment she had given him for a moment before rejoining the party. Dylan called Rhonda Coventry to meet him at Mercy Hospital Monday morning. He planned on giving her the case file for the hospital's previous insurance claims, 
the data for the new machinery and doctor changes, the compilation of statistics for plausible patient care in the aging demographic of the city, and see what she came up with for a quote. He had already run the figures through the company software, but it was still a good exercise. Dylan found that he could predict quotes. Then, if the quote given by the software happened to be out by a certain percentage, he knew that either he had made a mistake or he needed to look a little closer into the case. They toured the hospital with the board director. Insurance personnel were often given the royal treatment in an effort to lower premiums. It never worked. Also, it didn't hurt that he was a Ramsley. His uncle James owned a number of medical clinics and hospitals, including Mercy. Dylan kept an eye out for Kelly Islington. He wondered if she enjoyed her work at Mercy Hospital. He didn't happen to see her, and supposed she must be busy like all the other nurses that he happened to see. If anything, the hospital looked a little understaffed to him. Rhonda made notes, and Dylan pointed out various procedures that would impact the hospital's insurance rating. There were policies for liability, employee work injury, theft, billing concerns such as fire or flood, and more. They had to be thorough and complete with their report. By the time they finished, it was nearing the supper hour. Earlier, Dylan had his housekeeper, Maria, pick up Avery and Caden from school. He didn't often do that, but knew that the boys would love to spend some time with her. Rhonda suggested they catch supper while she tallied her quote and he could explain some items to her. Dylan would normally have waited to work on it tomorrow, but decided that since they were both hungry and professional, it wouldn't hurt. It would be so much simpler. We should go back to caveman times where you can just pick up a big branch, knock the guy over the head, drag him to your cave, and have your wicked way with him. Kelly stared into her drink. Of course, I'd have to tie him up. She was out with her friends for their annual tradition. It all started with a trip to the bar Lush and ended with camping over the Thanksgiving weekend. No kids, no parents, no work, just fun with the six of them. Kinky or you're just feeling some self-depreciation, Tiana asked for clarification. Both, I think, laughed Kelly. Hey, aren't you a little too young to be in here? A voice asked behind Kelly. Did they card you? Maybe I should call your parents. Very funny, like that joke hasn't gotten old. Kelly gave Derek a dark look as he sat down at their table. Why are you so late? Derek rolled his eyes. The dragon wouldn't let me leave work on time. She actually thought I was going to work the entire weekend through. I had to remind her that this is the only weekend out of the entire year that I leave, turn off my phone, and I don't come back until the last moment. Bo picked up his beer. To freedom. Freedom, the group chimed, celebrating the toast. Catch me up, Derek requested. Tiana leaned forward. Bo got here first. Refuses to speak about the girlfriend. She's history, okay? Bo rolled his eyes. What was it this time? Derek asked. Knobby knees? Disproportionate teeth? Leave it. It wasn't a request as Bo downed his beer and poured another out of the pitcher. Bo was known to be picky about looks in his dates. Next? Derek asked. Bex got a raise and a promotion. Tiana continued as the group toasted her again and Bex thanked them. Kelly's crush is sitting over there with some other girl. What? Where? Derek looked around at the crowd. Stop it! Kelly hissed. The cute guy, blondish brown hair, glasses near the door. She's the brunette with the red blouse on, Tiana supplied. She's hot, Derek observed before he turned back to the group. That's your crush? I don't see the deal. Kelly sighed. He's really nice. His son Avery and Bentley are friends at the new school. He looks like a 50s throwback. Derek raised an eyebrow and sipped his beer. Company man. Says the man who works at a law firm and dresses like a company man each day? Kelly said dryly. He's in insurance. I think he's supposed to look like that. Doesn't exactly make your heart go pitter-patter, Tiana agreed. Sorry, Kelly. That's because you haven't seen his eyes or heard him speak, Kelly replied softly. There's something there that just makes me think, wow. Enough with the gooey feelings, Derek cut in. Where's Tomlin? Right here. Tomlin put down a pitcher of beer and some change on the table. He grabbed his seat. "'What have you been up to this year?' Derek asked. "'Classified as always,' Tomlin smiled as he held up his glass. "'To the weekend!' "'To the weekend,' the group replied. Dylan felt old. It had been a long time since he'd done the bar scene, and he just wasn't that person anymore. 
he had spied Kelly amongst her friends and thought they all looked young and carefree. He tried to pay attention to what Rhonda was saying, but all he really wanted to do was go home. They had talked over the hospital insurance deals, and he felt like there was nothing else to say on the subject. He hoped Rhonda didn't get any ideas about their having dinner together. He wasn't interested in mixing work with pleasure. As he paid the bill, Dylan took another quick look in Kelly's direction. They seemed like they were having a lot of fun. Good. Kelly deserves some fun. He escorted Rhonda to the parking lot where she met her cab for her ride home. She had hinted that he could drive her to her apartment for a nightcap. Dylan declined. Now she was angling for a good night kiss. Dylan firmly shook her hand and stated that he looked forward to her report. It was obvious Rhonda was disappointed, but Dylan wasn't going to worry over that. Their relationship was professional only. He watched her drive away and phoned to check in on the boys. The housekeeper assured him Avery and Caden were fine. Both were asleep. He was about to thank Maria and tell her that he would be home shortly when the phone was ripped out of his hand. "'Hi, Maria,' a tall blonde said into the phone, while an almond-skinned woman with fuzzy black hair stood in front of him, allowing the blonde to walk away, talking to his housekeeper. "'That's my phone,' Dylan frowned at the woman in front of him. He recalled seeing her from sitting beside Kelly at the table inside the bar. "'It is?' she blinked up at him innocently. "'Bex has it now. I think Kelly is right. There really is something about your voice and eyes.' "'Pardon me?' Dylan narrowed his eyes and used a tone of voice that worked often on his sons. I would like my phone back now. The woman blinked. Change of subject. Do you like Kelly? Excuse me, Dylan said flatly. He walked past her to the blonde and held out his hand. Give me my phone. Bex ended the call and stuffed the phone into her bra. Oops. Dylan closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose for a moment. What is all of this about, ladies? We want to know if you like Kelly. Bex stared up at him with huge, doe-like eyes. She's an amazing person, and we all feel very protective of her, especially after everything she went through with Christopher. She has a crush on you, so we'd like to know how you feel about her. Kelly had a crush on him? Dylan shook away the thought. Ladies, I think you have both had a little too much to drink. Mrs. Islington is a wonderful person, and I am glad she has such good friends. Now, could I have my phone, please? No, Bex replied sweetly. The other woman came to lean on Bex's shoulder. I don't think you were supposed to tell him Kelly has a crush on him. Bex frowned. Tiana, we agreed on this. Caveman style. Okay. Don't forced a tight smile and pulled out his keys. I'm just going to report the phone stolen. Have a good night, and don't drive. No, cried Tiana, and grabbed him by the arm before he could leave. You can't go. He palmed his keys. There was no way he was going to lose them to these two. I have to go home to my boys. Please let go of my arm. I told Maria you wouldn't be home for the weekend, Bex piped up. I think she was a little surprised, but glad that you are getting out. You what? Dylan looked incredulously at Bex. He saw her eyes shift behind him and the bottom dropped out of his stomach. A memory surfaced, and in a flash he realized this was a lot like that setup in Honduras. Max and he had almost been robbed, or worse, when exploring the countryside than when they were a lot younger. Dylan ducked and pivoted to the left, dragging Tiana, who refused to let go of his arm, trying to put a zip tie over his hand. His shoulder banged into the rock-hard abdomen of a hulk of a guy that he barely got a glimpse of before a sack descended over his head. Dylan struggled. He managed to hook his leg around and stomped hard on the back of the guy's knee, causing him to fall to the pavement. Dylan pulled the sack off his head as he ran, realizing that his hands had been zip-tied together during the commotion. He looked back, which was a mistake, because he tripped over something and fell, his face hitting the bumper of a car as he fell. Dylan lay stunned on the pavement. His jaw hurt. One of the lenses of his glasses had cracked, creating a spider web across his vision. There was ringing in his ear. The guy hauled him up. With the girl's help, they stuffed him in the trunk of a car amidst giggles. Once the lid of the trunk closed, Dylan hit the panic button on his keys. It didn't seem to matter, because he could feel the engine of the car he was in start and drive away from the blaring horn of his own coupe. Dylan tried to move, but there was so much stuff crammed around him, there was no room. 
you could hear the radio turned up, blaring tunes as they drove. Just what kind of friends did Kelly have? Dylan gingerly felt along his jaw, and the goose egg that was starting to form. His hands were tied, but at least he didn't have the sack over his head. He thought hard about his situation. He wasn't expected at work until Tuesday. His housekeeper had probably been conned by Bex to think the same. It was Friday night. He had no idea where they were taking him, or what they were going to do. He didn't expect them to seriously hurt him, since he had seen exactly who they were. However, Dylan wasn't going to sit in the trunk calmly waiting. He felt along in the darkness until he knew exactly what way he was facing. Taking his keys, he worked on prying off the plastic cover near his head. It should be the panel that covered the back lights on the driver's side of the vehicle. It took some persistence, yet Dylan managed to crack the cover open. He reached in and yanked on the wiring as hard as he could. That took doing, but eventually the wires gave. He really wished that he had a flashlight to see the wires. He could only guess. Dylan felt around, then pressed the wire against the appropriate area in short, then long bursts of three. Classic S.O.S. He only hoped someone would recognize it from the brake light as they drove behind his car and called in to the cops. Eventually, he must have dozed. He wondered if he had a concussion. They were at a gas station getting fuel. He started yelling and hitting the top of the trunk with his fists, but the girl started caterwauling loudly, turning up the radio. Dylan tried the wire again, tapping out his message of distress, but he heard a sharp male laugh. I'm getting to like this guy better all the time. The voice had to belong to the tank of a guy who had stuffed Dylan in the trunk. Dylan listened as the light cover was removed and then the bulbs themselves were taken out. He could see a tiny bit of light through the holes. Dylan sighed as the light cover was replaced. They would be driving with only one tail light. Dylan hoped that they would get pulled over by the police for the violation. Otherwise, he was out of options until the trunk opened. They drove again for a long time. Dylan had no way to judge time. Finally, he slept. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please click the bell for notifications so that you don't miss any videos, including upcoming chapters of this audiobook. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 4 Kelly stretched and yawned. She was careful not to wake anyone else in the cramped tent. They had gotten to the campground very late, or early depending on whose opinion was asked. It was dark and they had agreed to just set up one tent and pile on in. Set up of everything else could wait until later in the morning. She crawled over Bo and stumbled out into the crisp morning. Curse her internal clock, it was just after sunrise, and the ground was covered in frost. She stretched again and decided coffee was the solution to the pounding in her head. She was getting too old for the yearly pre-camping celebration. Kelly pawed through Bo's unlocked trunk before realizing the cooking gear must be in Tomlin's car. Luckily, the driver's door was unlocked, so she popped the trunk using the button on the door. Tiredly, she walked over to find Dylan blinking up at her. Kelly screamed. Dylan tried to shush her. He struggled to sit up, but his legs weren't cooperating after being stuck in the same position for so long. Kelly quickly helped him, and soon he was sitting on the edge of the trunk, the blood starting to flow back to his aching legs. What happened? She questioned with wide eyes as she touched at his jaw, and he flinched. How did he get here? A sleepy Derek asked. Kelly turned to see her friends emerging from the tent. Happy birthday, Kelly, Tiana said weakly as she put a hand to her hurting head. Do you like our present? Bex grinned. Caveman style, just for you. Welcome to the Dirty Thirties, Tomlin rumbled. If you want to unwrap your present, please do so in private. Kelly's jaw dropped. She turned an interesting shade of red before glancing at Dylan, then staring at the ground self-consciously. I am so sorry. I had no idea. He held up his hands. Could someone cut these zip ties off? Tomlin came forward with a pocket knife. Dylan noticed with some satisfaction that the big brute limped a little. He cut off the zip ties and extended his hand. Respect. Dylan hesitated for a moment. Then he stood and shook the guy's hand firmly. 
Dylan Ramsley. Tomlin Newley. Tomlin made introductions. You met Tiana and Bex last night. Bo is my brother over there. Then there's Derek, whom we can never seem to leave behind. Of course, you already know Kelly. Can I have my phone back? Dylan asked Bex. Sure. She grabbed the phone out of the pocket of her cargo pants and tossed it to him. There's no signal. He looked to see no bars. Bex was right. He wouldn't be calling anyone anytime soon. Welcome to the annual camping trip, Tiana said brightly, where there are no phones for distractions, just a group of friends having fun for the weekend. Plus, there's Kelly, and it's her birthday, so we decided to get her a present she could really enjoy. Kelly pushed past him and walked into the woods. It was obvious she was upset. Dylan took an involuntary step after her before a hand clamped down on his shoulder. Let the ladies see to her. He watched Tiana and Bex rush after Kelly before turning to look at Tomlin, who just thumped him on the back. Let's get this new brother some gear, the giant smiled. Kelly was mortified beyond belief. She wished the earth would swallow her whole. They had kidnapped Dylan Ramsley. Her friends had no idea what they had done. He could file charges. He could destroy her life further than it was unraveling right now. He could realize she thought he was the handsomest, hunkiest thing around. She found a log and sat down, putting her head in her hands. She was so tired of being the perky, happy one. So tired of trying to make life work, of pretending that everything was okay even as it all crumbled to pieces again and again. Kelly had been looking forward to this camping trip and ignoring the world before she went back to her everyday life where so many problems were creeping up on her. Now the trip and her birthday were a total mess. She didn't think she would ever be able to look Dylan Ramsley in the eyes again after what her friends had done. Hey, you okay? Tiana sat down beside Kelly and Bex took the other side. I think it went really well this morning, Bex said as she rubbed Kelly's back. Dylan seems like a great guy. Tomlin likes him. What were you thinking? Kelly cried, exasperated at them. You tied him up and put him in the trunk of a car. Then you left him overnight. Well, we thought he was the perfect gift, Bex said enthusiastically. Who doesn't want the guy of their dreams handed to them for an entire weekend? He doesn't know how I feel, Kelly hissed. I think he probably does now. Tiana studied her nails. You told him. Kelly groaned and buried her face in her hands again. We had a lot to drink last night. Our judgment may not have been entirely sound, Tiana said ruefully. Look, he's here now, and you have got his attention for the entire weekend. We are going to make him sleep in your tent, just the two of you. Now's your chance. My chance to talk him out of pressing charges or suing us, Kelly said sarcastically. Do you even know who he is? One of the parents at our kid's fancy new school? Tiana shrugged. Whatever. He's a Ramsley, Kelly shrieked. Like that explains anything, Bex said. Think big pharma, big insurance, hospitals, and hotel chains. Kelly threw her hands in the air. She got up and paced. His family owns the hospital I work at. They're the type of people who have mansions and fancy cars. They can go yachting or on trips to Europe at the blink of an eye. We are screwed. Then you'd better make his weekend really good, Beck said flippantly. If you need a box of little friends, let me know. Kelly moaned. Are you listening to anything I say? He's rich, blah, 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 whatever. Bex came over and hugged Kelly. He can't get blood from a stone. All of us are so poor, it's laughable. Derek wasn't involved, so he won't lose his job. You were involved, so you won't have any issues with Bentley. Bo doesn't have anything to lose. Neither do Tiana or I. Oh, what about Tomlin? I'm assuming he was in on it since the whole respect thing, Kelly asked. No one knows what Tomlin does. He's going to disappear as he always does, and we won't see him till next year, Bex said. I don't think you need to worry. What is with this whole worrying side of you, Tiana asked. Usually you just roll with it. Kelly didn't want to talk about it. 
She sighed. Let's go back to camp and see what the damage is. Don't worry. Once Mr. Stuffy learns to have some fun with us, he'll be fine, Beck stated confidently. Kelly rolled her eyes. Don't call him that. What, Mr. Stuffy? How about Kelly's crush? Or Mr. Uptight? Tiana suggested. Stop it. Kelly led the way back to the cars. Her previously growling stomach had bottomed out in nervousness, and she knew she wasn't going to be able to eat breakfast, but coffee was a necessity at this point. There was no way she was going to make it through the day without some. She wondered how she was going to be able to avoid Dylan, and still have him not contact a lawyer or police officer. She had no desire to go to jail. They trailed her and kept lobbing around names. Mr. Makes Kelly Tingle. Mr. Axe and dresses twice his age. We don't know that, Tiana said to Bex. We don't know his age. Should have grabbed his wallet, Bex said, slapping her forehead. Then we could have seen if their signs were compatible. Mr. makes Kelly blush. Mr. needs to let his hair down. Kelly sighed as they walked past the cars. Thankfully, she could smell coffee. Would you two quit it? Mr. needs to get laid. Beck snickered. Maybe you can help him out, Kelly. Very funny, Dylan said dryly as he shut the door on the truck and walked to join the guys making breakfast. He had changed from his formal suit into forest-friendly camping attire, loaned to him by the group. I am just going to bury myself in a sand pit, Kelly announced. Can this day get worse? No, you didn't, Bex wailed. Shh, Tiana clapped a hand over Kelly's mouth. Too late, Derek said. We all heard the words. Bo shook his head. Kelly girl, what were you thinking? What? Dylan looked at the members of the group. Obviously, this was an inside joke. He had the feeling he was going to find a lot of those over the weekend. Tomlin explained. It's our rule to never invite worse luck. We've all come out of a junk life, and we know the only way out is by crawling up, not indulging in self-pity. Define junk life, Dylan asked. Two unadoptable foster kids, Tomlin pointed to Bo and Bex. I had anger issues, Bo affectionately put an arm around Bex. She had health issues with her heart as a kid. No one wanted us. Want to see my scar? Bex asked innocently. No, cried Kelly. The last thing they needed was for Bex to flash the group. Babe, Tomlin smiled wolfishly. I'm the only one who gets to see your scar. Bex winked at Tomlin. I was one of too many kids to a woman who cried, Where's my food stamps? every chance she could, Tiana said dryly. She abuses the system to this day. I don't know who my dad is. I also stupidly got pregnant at 17 because I thought it would last forever and I wouldn't be my mom. You're not your mom, Kelly said quietly. We all did better than where we came from. Tiana rolled her eyes and wrapped an arm around Kelly. I know I'm not her. I actually have a job and pay my rent. Kelly had a single mom who's an alcoholic and druggie, Tomlin said. I actually ran her some of those drugs, something which I'm not proud of. I spent a lot of time in and out of juvie. They all said the words so matter-of-fact, like the pain of the past didn't matter. Dylan knew it did. What about Derek? Derek had a bitter laugh. My childhood is not PG. Therefore, it is not discussed. What about you, rich boy? Bo asked. There was no malice in the nickname, just curiosity in the question. I had an excellent childhood, Dylan said calmly. At least he doesn't lie, Derek said, passing around cups of coffee. No one owns the market on pain, Dylan remarked. Life is full of it. It's also full of love, hurt, joy, and everything in between. Everyone has their moment of rock bottom. Really? Derek challenged. What was yours? A slip in the stock market? Derek, Tomlin warned him. We shared our stories. Derek shrugged belligerently. Dylan, you don't have to, Kelly said, even as she was curious herself. Next month is the four-year anniversary of my daughter Shannon's death. Dylan looked directly at Derek. As for my rock bottom, that was the death of my wife. 
Eric looked at Dylan a moment, measuring him. He saw something, perhaps the sadness that could not be banished, and he nodded, the moment passing. "'Who wants breakfast?' Bo asked. "'I'm starved. Plus, we've got a wicked hike up.' "'Are you staying?' Kelly asked Dylan. "'Might as well.' He gave her a tight smile. Maria would expect him to be gone the entire weekend after that phone call from Bex, although he had no wish to explain things to her when he returned. Also, it would be unfair of him to strand the group with one vehicle, neither of which could legally hold the six remaining in the group, which meant that if he did take the truck, he would need someone to come with him. It didn't seem very fair, even if they had kidnapped him. He tried to ignore the suggestion from his brain that spending time with Kelly might also factor in his decision to stay. They had kidnapped him. Dylan was still having trouble processing that. He accepted a napkin with toast and eggs from Bo. "'Where did you learn those moves?' Tomlin asked, chewing his toast. "'The foot to the knee was brilliant.' "'Honduras. Two women for distraction and the mugger behind,' Dylan shrugged. "'Back then I had a friend with me, so we managed to get away.' "'What were you doing there?' Bo asked. "'Exploring the countryside,' Dylan said. "'Max and I used to visit all sorts of countries and go scuba diving for shipwrecks.' An adult life caught up with me, and I haven't been out since. Max Ramsley? Who married Paget? Kelly asked. My cousin, Dylan confirmed. How do you know them? Kelly had a laugh. His brother Michael was my patient when he had surgery. I taught him about Snapchat so he could keep showing me pictures of Amy. You're the one to blame, then, Dylan remarked mildly. He's become a Snapchat fiend. Considering he barely speaks, I don't think anyone is going to begrudge him a little Snapchat. Kelly rolled her eyes. Plus, I liked seeing what's going on in his life with Anne. They are such a nice couple. They are, he agreed. It didn't take very long for the group to enjoy breakfast and break camp. Everyone got something to carry along, and they walked along a well-worn trail. It had been ages since Dylan had done anything approaching camping. Definitely pre-marriage. Wren hadn't been the type to go camping. He firmly shoved thoughts of his deceased wife away and enjoyed the sunshine through the trees. It was easy, walking through the woods and listening to them chatter happily. It was obvious that they'd been a group of misfits who had bonded tightly and made the commitment to see each other each year. They included him naturally, asking if rich people camped and if he'd been to this particular park before. Dylan could feel himself relax. He should take Avery and Caden camping. He wondered why he had never thought to do so before now. Dylan thought that they would like the experience. He hadn't realized just how much he had missed it until now. They hiked for most of the day, pausing for breaks and looking at various landmarks. Once, they accidentally surprised a small group of deer. The group enjoyed the moment before they were spotted, and the deer bounced away. An hour before dusk, they came upon the ruins of an old mill near the flat river. The water was shallow and clean. The group made camp for the night and broke out fixings for pancakes and s'mores. Dylan watched them with some amusement as after the impromptu supper, a deck of cards made an appearance. Old maid, Beck suggested. Hi, low, Tom encountered with another card game name. You need even players for that, Derek objective. Crazy eights. Rummy. Bo recommended. Not enough cards for all of us, Kelly pointed out as she toasted a marshmallow for a s'more. Gin, Tiana said. Didn't bring any, Beck smiled at her own joke. Very funny, Tiana replied. They agreed on gin. Three hours later, Dylan found out that they were a very competitive bunch of card players. They had disintegrated into playing rounds of spoons, and more than once, his knuckles had been wrapped in good fun. Dylan also learned that Bo was a firefighter. No one knew what Tomlin did. Tiana worked as an aide in a nursing home. Bex was employed at a fertility clinic. And Derek was a paralegal who worked for a strict workaholic. He also learned that Kelly had lost her nursing job. Being a single parent, he could sympathize. How many times had he been late to work or had to leave early because of issues with his kids? How many weeks hadn't he worked partial hours in the office when Shannon was ill? If he weren't the owner's son and hadn't been a manager, 
Would he have been reprimanded and possibly let go? Dylan knew there were a lot of perks to being in the position that he was. He wondered if he should interfere and talk to one of his cousins to see if he could get Kelly her job back, or at least something similar. He watched as she smiled and joked about losing her job, but he could see the strain in her smile. Soon enough, the group elected Bo to put out the fire since it was in his job description. They were assigned to the three tents. Dylan found himself paired off with Kelly. When she protested, the group firmly stated that sleeping arrangements were non-negotiable. While he didn't appreciate the matchmaking, Dylan could admire their attempts to help their friend out. He assured Kelly it was fine since they were just sleeping anyways. Kelly tried not to be too embarrassed as they got ready to go to sleep. She focused on her nightly routine. Dylan was gentlemanly enough to let her choose her side of the tent. She crawled onto her side and realized the tent was just too small. It was tiny. There was going to be barely enough room for both of them and their packs. Kelly pushed her stuff into a corner as far as she could. It really wasn't enough room. She briefly thought about putting the packs, shoes, and other items between them both as a barrier, but couldn't see herself trapped in the edge of the tent. It just wouldn't be comfortable. Instead, she pulled herself as far away as Dylan as she could, tensely allowing perhaps a couple of inches between them. She tried to relax, but it was hard. Other than sleeping with Tiana on the camping trips, she hadn't shared a bed since Bentley was a toddler. Before that, it had been her husband for a few months, until he became so ill that sharing a bed was painful for him. Kelly had never shared a bed before her husband. She had learned Tiana's painful lesson of being abandoned by her baby daddy and didn't want to repeat it. Keeping her back to Dylan, she tried to relax, but admitted to herself it was probably going to be a long night. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 5 Kelly was soft. Wren had been all angles, always far too thin, wave-like. Kelly was short, but she was also soft against him, and Dylan found himself liking it. She was pressed up against him, one leg threaded through his, her nose buried in his throat. He could feel little puffs of air as she slept. One of her hands had crept underneath his shirt and was on his bare back. He knew she was going to be embarrassed when she woke to find that she'd been feeling him up in her sleep. Kelly was a cuddler. He found that he liked that, too. Dylan forced himself to just stay still and hold her. In the years since his wife's death, he hadn't been with anyone, hadn't wanted to be with anyone. He had been focused on just surviving, surviving the aftermath of Wren, surviving through Shannon's illness, surviving to take care of his boys after Shannon's death. He didn't want to just survive anymore. Dylan wanted to live, like this group was enjoying life this weekend. He wanted Kelly, which was silly because he barely knew her. Kelly stirred. She yawned and stretched, arching her body. Her hand caught in his shirt as she pressed herself firmly and accidentally against him. Kelly paused as she comprehended she wasn't alone and cracked open an eye. Morning, Dylan said, his voice gravelly from sleep, or so he told himself. Kelly flushed a deep red, jerking herself and her hand away from him. It was caught in his tee and she pulled. In the process, she lifted her leg reflexively, the one that was threaded between his. Her knee connected hard. Dylan stiffened, closed his eyes, and drew in a sharp breath. He prayed not to throw up from the pain. Oh my, did I just... Kelly's voice came out in a squeak. Fortunately, she had stopped moving. He realized he had her upper arms clenched in his hands. Dylan slowly loosened his hold, hoping he hadn't bruised her. I'm sorry, she apologized, her hands moving, and he grabbed her arms again. Stop moving, he hissed. Please. Sorry, Kelly whispered as she went absolutely still. Dylan concentrated on breathing. This certainly got rid of any romantic thoughts, his mind laughed at itself. 
He waited a few moments, then slowly took a deeper breath, realizing the pain had lessened. He opened his eyes to see a concerned and mortified Kelly watching him. "'I am so sorry,' she repeated. "'I didn't mean to.' "'I know.' He cleared his throat and slowly let go of her arms. "'I'm going to be a few minutes. Why don't you go out for breakfast?' "'Okay?' Kelly bit her lip. "'Are you sure you want me to move? Maybe you should move first. He was sort of sprawled on her. Dylan closed his eyes and leaned his forehead against hers. He wasn't looking forward to moving for two distinct and separate reasons. First was pain, which would surely happen. Second was the sensation of having her under him, soft and welcoming. He needed to move before his body cut up to what his mind was thinking. Dylan tensed and rolled onto his back, pulling up his legs for comfort and putting his hands over his face as he exhaled. What a morning! I am going to get us some breakfast. Kelly scrambled to her knees and grabbed her shoes. Coffee, he managed to croak. Just coffee. Okay, she stumbled out of the tent, and he was mercifully alone. Kelly stumbled out of the tent and slipped on her shoes. She pushed her hair out of her face and practically raced into the woods. She couldn't believe that she had need him. Kelly did her morning business, then found the stream for a quick wash of her face and hands. "'Don't go that way,' Bo warned her as he grabbed some water in the coffee pot. Bex and Tomlin. Kelly didn't even need to ask. It happened every camping trip. The only surprise was who would accidentally walk up on the couple. "'I don't know how they do this,' Bo said thoughtfully as the two of them walked back toward the camp, giving the couple a wide berth. "'He's gone the rest of the year.' Not even Bex knows where he goes or what he does. Yet every year she just welcomes him back, and they start up again for all of three or four days. Kelly shrugged. They have a unique relationship. I know I couldn't do it. How are things going between you and Mr. Needs to get laid? Bo asked. Kelly had an involuntary snorting laugh. I don't think he's going to be wanting to get laid any time soon. I accidentally groined him this morning in the tent. Ouch, Bo winced. Poor guy. Yup, Kelly said glumly. Hey, are you okay? Bo wrapped an arm around her. You seem a little off. Things are a little tough right now, Kelly shrugged. I'm probably worried over nothing. That's right. Don't worry over what you don't know. Bo said. Rule five. Rule six, leprechauns and unicorns are real. Kelly smiled at their silly childhood rules that the group had made years ago. Rule seven, no one is alone as long as they have a friend, Bo chimed happily. Rule eight, smiles are a warrior's weapon. They confuse the enemy. Kelly grinned. She loved her friends. Rule nine, Tomlin can get rid of the monsters under the bed, Bo said confidently. He has the magic touch, Kelly concurred. Thanks, Bo. No problem, he gave her a pat on the back. Shall we make breakfast for the slug beds and the two lovers? Please. Kelly was suddenly ravenous. Coffee first, though. Absolutely. Bo nodded. We can all use a caffeine boost before we hit the wall. It didn't take long for everyone to gather near the fire after the first smells of breakfast wafted from camp. Even Dylan came out, but waved away food sticking to coffee only. Bo raised an eyebrow and Kelly winced. Camp was disassembled, and three hours later they were looking at what was affectionately known as the Wall. The Wall was exactly what it sounded like, a steep cliff area that rose forty or so feet from the end of the trail. The trail picked up again at the top of the Wall. To get there, there used to be an anchored rope hanging down the cliff used for tying off and climbing. "'The rope is gone,' Bo said unnecessarily. They all stared at the Wall and the drop-off on the other side of the path. There were only three routes, up, down, or back along the trail. Someone took it off. Maybe it was in response to the liability, Dylan said dryly as he looked at the wall. It was a near vertical climb. If anyone got hurt here and the park knowingly left out climbing equipment, they could be held responsible in a lawsuit. Hey, don't be a downer, Mr. Insurance. Tomlin pulled the nylon rope out of his backpack. We just need to figure out a way for one of us to get up there and secure this rope. Then we're back in business. 
Dylan supposed Mr. Insurance was better than Mr. Needs to get laid. He eyed the wall. Give me the rope. Excuse me? Kelly looked at him in surprise. Bro, that is a straight climb without proper equipment, Bo said. I wouldn't do it. Listen to the firefighter, Tomlin scoffed. Can't be that hard. Listen to the firefighter, Derek stated more seriously. He mightn't just know what he's talking about. Ever free climbed? Dylan asked Tomlin. There's always a first time for everything, Tomlin said with a grin. Not at this height, Dylan cautioned. You should start smaller. What should we do? Just give up and go back down the trail? We've never not done the wall, Tiana said. Even pregnant Kelly and I did the wall. With safety harnesses, Bo shook his head. Never without. Is this part of the tradition? Dylan asked. Absolutely, Tomlin nodded. We go up here, follow the trail, and by the afternoon we raft down the river to the next camp. Dylan knelt and unlaced his boots. Pass me the rope. Are you sure about this? Tomlin asked. I got this. Dylan pulled the laces out of the boots through a belt loop and tied them. He stuffed the rope in one of the boots. I used to do this until a friend fell off a cliff. How bad was it? Bo asked. Eight broken bones? Dylan studied the wall and chose a starting point. You don't need to, Dylan. We can go back down the way we came. Kelly looked at the height and felt a fission of fear for Dylan. It's not a big deal. It's tradition, Kelly, Beck said. It is a big deal. I'm not going home till I've scaled the wall. Dylan ignored the remarks they made as they discussed the pros and cons of turning back. Beginning the ascend, he felt for hand and toe holds. Most climbers had special shoes on, but he found he did better without. It had been a long time, since before his marriage, that he'd gone climbing. As he began the familiar pattern, Dylan realized that he missed it. He had stopped because he had decided to be responsible and take less risks. Even now, if he fell and died, who would take care of Caden and Avery? One of his brothers would step in, but did he really want workaholics Jake and Everett taking care of his sons? Dylan grimaced, like he was any better. While he did pick up the boys from school every day and made certain to have supper with them, he had a tendency to bring home work with him. His home office saw as many hours as his work office at the company. It wasn't something he was proud of. Work had been an escape from the sorrows of his life. Dylan's foot slipped. For a moment, he just held on desperately with the other three points of contact. Then Dylan took a deep breath and continued the climb. Perhaps he was showing off a little to Kelly's friends. He wasn't young anymore. He was also out of practice and could feel the ache starting in his shoulders and neck. Free climbing forty feet was probably a stupid move. Fortunately, it wasn't all that much further to the top. Dylan stopped a moment to study his next moves. It was easier to the left, but going over the edge would present a problem. To the right was more difficult, but there was a tree that looked like it would easily hold his weight for getting to the top. It would also be a good tie-off for the rope that would help the rest of them ascend the wall. Dylan chose to go right. Carefully choosing his handholds and placing his feet in the nooks of the rock, he continued a steady climb. Making it to the tree, Dylan grabbed a root and tugged hard. It didn't even budge. Dylan used it to pull himself up over the edge of the wall and rolled onto the grass at the top. His hands and feet were burning from the exertion. He was a little sweaty despite the crisp fall air. Dylan hadn't felt this alive in years. The ground was solid beneath him. The sky was beautiful blue above him. The air was clear with the rustling of the leaves in the trees. He breathed it all in and felt good. Hey, you alive up there? Tomlin shouted. Give him a minute. He probably needs to recover, Bo said. It's not like he's young anymore. Ouch, Dylan winced. He wasn't that much older than the group. Dylan sat up and pulled the rope out of his boot. He tied it off around the tree, then threw the rest down. Tomlin grinned up at him. Dylan felt a sense of satisfaction at his accomplishment. Yes, he had been stupidly showing off old skills, but he felt good at having achieved the wall. He rolled his shoulders to get out the eggs, cleaned off his socks as best as he could, and put the hiking boots back on. He watched as they hooked Kelly up in a harness and attached her ratchet system to the rope. It was obvious that they had done it many times before, and Dylan was glad to see them go through the standard safety checks to ensure Kelly would be okay. 
Soon she was making her way to the top of the wall. Dylan helped her for the last piece, pulling her over the edge and close to him. Kelly ignored the butterflies in her stomach as Dylan helped unhook her from the harness. She blamed her breathlessness on the scent. There was a glint in Dylan's eyes, and she thought he looked self-satisfied and very male. There was a new confidence about him, as though he'd forgotten that he could make such climbs. Suddenly, Kelly thought this trip might be good for him in a way that he didn't expect. Dylan lowered the harness, and they watched Bex as she got harnessed next. "'You've climbed before,' Kelly stated unnecessarily. "'Have you gone rafting?' Dylan gave her a smile, and the butterfly swarmed in her abdomen. She realized he was looking forward to the rafting down the river. It's been a while. Kelly smiled happily in return. She liked that he was enjoying himself. It's not a fast or big river, but we thought it was when we started camping. It must be nice to have this tradition each year, he remarked. Kelly shrugged as she grinned. We're like a dysfunctional family. I love them to pieces. They helped Bex over the edge. Bex wrapped them both in a hug. Hello, lovebirds. What a rush. Kelly rolled her eyes and avoided looking at Dylan. She knew she was blushing. Let's get you out of the harness so the next person can come up, Dylan said practically. Bex giggled and helped. Soon enough, everyone had made it up, and the group good-naturedly argued about whether to leave the rope or to take it with them. Finally, they conceded to Dylan's calm statement that they would feel guilty if some kid got hurt by trying to climb it and remove the rope. Two hours later, they were taking turns pumping up the inflatable raft and stuffing their gear into waterproof bags. They loaded up the raft and pulled it into the river, everyone piling in. Kelly always loved this part of the journey. The girls held on, enjoying the ride, while the guys got to steer as best as they could with the oars. There were only a few rapids on this river, none of them even remotely dangerous. When they had been teenagers and just learning how to raft down the river, the rapids had seemed like a huge obstacle to surmount. Now it was easy, even if it was only an annual event. Bex, Tiana, and Kelly sat in the middle of the raft. With a quick series of hand signals, they decided who was going to get dunked this year. Kelly vetoed Dylan as a choice, so they decided to gang up on Bo since he hadn't been dunked in a couple of years. Don't even think about it, Derek said dryly. I'm not getting wet two years in a row. What? Bex blinked innocently. It's tradition. Tiana shrugged. We weren't going to get you anyways. However, now that you've mentioned it, if I go in, your boy Dylan goes in with me. Derek grabbed Dylan's collar. Dylan stiffened in surprise. What is going on here? Maybe all of them should get wet this year. Kelly looked at the girls. They made quick signals of agreement. Nah, that would be too mean. Besides, girls aren't allowed to row the raft. Bo keeps telling us that it's a manly job. I never said any such thing. Bo was interrupted as the girls split, each going for their preselected guy. Bex grabbed Tomlin's leg, shoving him up and over into the water. Tiana overcompensated and accidentally went over with Bo into the river the oar flailing in the air. Kelly used her shoulder to check Derek hockey-style. He was already leaning out too far, trying to avoid her. It didn't take a moment for him to slip slowly from the inflated boat, still holding on to Dylan's collar, dragging him backward. She laughed as Dylan grabbed at anything to keep himself upright. Kelly stopped laughing when he tossed his oar into the boat and grabbed her. Kelly squealed as he pulled her into the icy waters with them. Dylan's voice was in her ear as they surfaced. Are you okay? I'm fine, Kelly's teeth chattered. It was cold. Hey, guys, Bex called to them as she slowly floated away. How do you steer this thing with only one person? She is kidding, right? Dylan asked. With Bex, one never really knows, Derek replied, slogging his way through the water after the raft. How is it that someone as tiny as you was able to get Derek out of the raft? Dylan questioned. Low center of gravity, Kelly said. Also, he wasn't sitting very securely. Bex, swing it towards the shore, Tomlin shouted as he floated on the surface of the water past them. I vote we go to land. Dylan had his hands on her shoulders. Standing up, the water rushed around Kelly's waist. He stood behind her to make sure that the current wasn't buffeting her too hard. Kelly tried to ignore the fact that he was standing so close. 
or that Tiana winked as she and Bo waded through the water, or that he smelled amazing even after hiking and getting dunked in the river. Are you sure we shouldn't be helping Bex and Tomlin? I think he's got it. Bo put a hand over his eyes to shade them from the sun as he watched Bex and Tomlin deal with the raft. We can get out here and walk over. There's a game trail beside the river. They all made their way to the rocks near the river bank. Dylan offered Kelly a hand to help her up. Kelly ignored Tiana's suggestive look as she accepted Dylan's hand. He was just being a gentleman, she was certain. Kelly ignored the little thrill that coursed through her at the simple contact. She let go of his hand as soon as it was polite to do so. Kelly was trying to ignore a lot of things about Dylan Ramsley. Like how handsome he was without his glasses. He really ought to think about getting contacts. On second thought, maybe not. The last thing Kelly wanted was for other single moms like Susan Heiths to start flocking around him. The group got together at the raft where Tomlin was tying it off to prevent it from escaping. They all grabbed dry clothes and headed off in two groups to get changed. I change my mind, Tiana said. I can see why you think he's hot. Kelly looked up to the sky. Help me. Bex laughed. He is in shape. He looks fine in regular clothes, although the suit was nice, I guess. Didn't she say he had something about the eyes and voice? That I don't get. Oh, those aren't bad, Tiana said. It helps the glasses are gone. He can't read without them, Kelly said. He should get the laser eye surgery, Tiana recommended. He's rich enough to afford it. Back to what I was driving at. You like that he's a total gentleman. He's the type to treat a lady right. Bex frowned. That's nice, but what about sexy time? No one wants a gentleman in bed all the time. Can we just get changed? Kelly asked. I think Kelly can get him all hot and bothered, Tiana was confident. He gravitates to her every time she's near. I think he thinks she's cute. La, la, la. Kelly plugged her ears. I'm not listening. How are you going to get dressed while you're plugging your ears? Tiana asked. Kelly rolled her eyes and grabbed a dry pair of jeans. Mister needs to get laid, likes Kelly, Bex sang loudly. Stop it, Kelly hissed. The guys aren't that far away. Able to pee straight yet? Bo asked Dylan. Dylan paused in surprise as he put on a shirt. She told you. Nothing much is kept secret here. Bo grinned. She was pretty embarrassed. I think we both were, Dylan replied dryly. Be glad she only told me this is the extent of my ribbing. Bo laughed. The others would tease you mercilessly all day. How long has everyone known each other? Dylan questioned curiously. Tiana and Kelly have known each other since first grade. Tomlin and I knew each other in high school. The rest of us met up at this camp for disadvantaged kids which was held in this park, Bo explained. It's where us city kids got a love for the woods. And you've all stayed friends. Dylan was surprised. Most of his friends from school and afterward had slowly gone their separate ways. He supposed he hadn't helped matters by withdrawing after Ren's death and during Shannon's illness. That's pretty amazing. Do they still have the camp? They closed it for lack of funding. Bo shrugged. It's a shame. That is. Dylan wondered how long it had been shut down. The guys bagged their wet clothes and made their way to the raft. They didn't have to wait too long before the girls rejoined them. This time, everyone promised to behave in the raft, so the ride down the river was fairly uneventful. They reached their destination and set up camp in a little clearing near the trees. Everyone hung up their clothes on branches in the late afternoon sun in the hopes of letting them dry out a little before the next day's journey. After a quick supper, the cards were brought out again. Dylan had to admit that he hadn't expected to enjoy the weekend so much. He also liked Kelly's friends more than he thought he would. They seemed determined to embrace and love life no matter what their circumstances. Dylan admired them for that, since it certainly wasn't his strength. He had been wallowing in guilt and gloom for such a long time that this trip was like a breath of fresh air. Dylan would have to thank the group for kidnapping him earlier. That was something he never once thought that he would do. 
the night began much the same as last night although a little less tense kelly stayed on her side of the tent but sometime during the night she crept back over and snuggled up to him dylan found that he didn't mind so he went back to sleep the light of dawn was coming through the tent again and dylan tried to do his best to stay dozing in the warm comfort of the tent kelly woke up and stretched she paused immediately as she came into contact with the warm body wait she had been in contact with the warm body the entire time she was sleeping now she was pressed quite firmly against it embarrassed she slowly tried to extricate herself from dylan please don't a sleepy rumble filled her ear his morning stubble was against her cheek i was just thinking how nice it was to wake up with another person after so many years of being alone kelly stilled she knew dylan was sad but she'd never really thought of him as lonely since he had two boys how long has it been since wren died almost nine years dylan's voice was quiet wren was such a beautiful name kelly thought she furrowed her brow avery's only eight she was pregnant when she passed he explained the doctors kept her on life support until avery was viable that must have been very hard kelly couldn't imagine it she could hear his heart strong and steady under her ear how long has it been since your husband passed he asked kelly traced a line on dylan's shirt almost nine years i had just found out i was pregnant christopher was ill and we both knew our time together was going to be brief i'm sorry dylan said i'm not kelly smiled at the memory it was hard i won't deny that however we both wanted to squeeze out every bit of joy out of christopher's remaining time and i think we did dylan found himself envying christopher a little bit what would it be like trying to squeeze joy out of life what about you was yours a happy marriage kelly asked no dylan said honestly and without thinking he mentally kicked himself he wasn't in the habit of disparaging wren's memory we had our moments of joy but overall it was kelly waited while he searched for a word difficult he finally said dylan swallowed hard at the memories that crowded in he felt the need to explain which wasn't what he usually did in regards to his wife wren struggled with depression sometimes she could be brilliant and beautiful sometimes the medications had her in a fog sometimes sometimes the monster inside her the depression won kelly instinctively hugged him for a moment he tensed but allowed her to embrace him she wondered if he had truly grieved over his wife kelly could understand dylan was probably just as busy as she was trying to parent his two boys being a solo mom or dad didn't always leave a lot of time for taking care of oneself after a moment he relaxed dylan lifted his head to look at her he had such nice gray eyes she mused he smoothed her hair away from her face and kelly wondered if he was going to kiss her her stomach clenched in anticipation then the tent shook get up lazy bones time to get it together dylan had an involuntary smile and leaned his forehead against hers your friends are interesting that's one way of putting it kelly groused still i suppose i'll keep them dylan gently withdrew from the sleeping bag and grabbed his borrowed hiking shoes kelly watched him for a moment before getting up he was taking everything really well considering he might have had other plans for the weekend kelly liked him even more for being kind to her friends even if they didn't deserve it after kidnapping him kelly wondered what he thought of her they all had dry clothes but their boots were still damp from the dunking everyone except bax had taken yesterday we can't wear these shoes like this dylan stated we'll all get blisters there's a solution for that bex smiled and threw a couple of plastic baggies at him she handed them out around the camp bread bags just like the good old days excuse me dylan asked in confusion holding on to two bags advertising the merits of enriched vitamins rich boy doesn't know Bo shook his head sorrowfully he probably never had cold wet feet as a kid bread bags are the poor person's solution to wet winter feet kelly explained 
We wore our shoes or old boots to school in the winter. Just because something had a hole in it didn't mean it got replaced, so to make sure feet stayed dry, you wrap the bread bags around your socks before inserting your foot into your shoe. Seriously? Dylan wondered if they were trying to pull one over on him. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without, Derek quoted. Where is that from? asked Dylan. It was actually a slogan from the War Advertising Council during World War II, but it's pretty much standard amongst those who have to do with less. Derek shrugged. Can't afford new shoes? Suck it up and put baggies in so your feet stay dry. That's crazy, Dylan remarked. That is how the other half live, brother, Tomlin said, stuffing his bagged feet into his hiking boots and tying up the laces. Dylan had been to some poor countries during his travels. He had met people who hadn't even owned shoes. However, it never occurred to him that people might be so poor in America that they couldn't afford shoes that didn't leak, or boots for winter, especially for their children. They broke camp and began the long walk up the trail. Every year they walked the same trail like a tradition. Kelly breathed in the fresh air and wished she could do this with Bentley. If she had more time and the money, she'd love to go camping more often. She would like to do a lot of things more often. Unfortunately, Kelly had been working sixty hours a week to just almost pay the bills, which meant that she didn't have time. Now she needed a job more than ever, and she worried that she was going to end up working eighty or more hours a week. Kelly would never see her son. Her stomach cramped up at the thought. Then there was the fact that in ten short years Bentley would be looking at colleges. Kelly couldn't even afford to pay for the basics on her own. How was she supposed to save for her son's education? Resolutely, Kelly shoved the thoughts out of her head. This weekend was not about worries. It was about enjoying the company of her friends in the great outdoors. They had one last night on this trip, and then they would pack up and go home. Kelly would deal with all her woes then. She breathed in the air determinedly. It was so nice to be out of the city. They couldn't even hear a single car out here. Kelly had lived in the city all her life, since she simply didn't have the financial option to move. She wondered what it would be like to be able to choose. Hey, birds! Bex pointed to a group of ducks on a pond. Do we have any leftover bread to feed them? Honey, we are feeding an extra mouth. Tomlin wrapped an arm around her. There is no extra. Oh, she sighed. That's okay. I can feed ducks at the city park later. Here. Tomlin took a pack of crackers out of the pocket of his pants. It's not much, but maybe you can feed a duck. Or the fish, if they get it first. Bex beamed up at him. Bo rolled his eyes and kept on hiking, while Bex tossed bits of crackers as far as she could get into the water. Dylan and Kelly continued after Bo. Is this normal for Bex? Dylan asked. She seems a little off. She is off, Kelly laughed. She is also a mastermind when she wants to be, so don't be fooled by the helpless damsel in distress attitude. Dylan had to ruefully admit that Kelly might be right. He had forgotten Bex's part in his kidnapping too fast. Any special events today? We go through Fat Man's Cave. I hope you aren't claustrophobic, Kelly asked. No, he assured her. Good, she grinned. Then we camp on a nice little sandy beach. Tomorrow it will only be an hour or so hike before we make it back to the cars. Then it's back to the normal world, Dylan remarked. Yep, Kelly forced a smile. I am avoiding that for the next day at least. Ever thought of doing anything in insurance? he asked. No, Kelly laughed. I'm good at nursing and menial jobs. I have no experience with insurance. Just a suggestion, Dylan shrugged. Maybe you would make a good astronaut. Astronaut? Like going into space. She laughed some more. Are you crazy? Soon the group were tossing out all sorts of inappropriate and unlikely new careers for Kelly to try, from professional wrestler to a robot builder. Underwater candle lighter was voted the best, and Kelly promised to sign up for a course as soon as she could find one in the field. They came upon Fat Man's Cave, which was a bit of a misnomer as the cave was a really skinny chasm in the rock face. Each walked single file through the chasm, sometimes even having to turn sideways to get through, dragging their packs along. Dylan wasn't claustrophobic, however he was glad when they got to the other side. The walls had been uncomfortably close for a while. A couple of hours later and they made camp at the little beach. 
The cards were broken out after threats to go swimming in the water were quelled. Kelly cited parasites, typhoid, polio, all as reasons not to. They all confirmed they were vaccinated for polio, but Tiana won out when she said she wasn't sharing a tent nor a car with swampy-smelling people. When bedtime came, they all crawled into their tents. Kelly huffed and said that since she was just going to end up hogging the tent after she fell asleep, she might as well get comfortable beforehand. Dylan just smiled and let her snuggle in, close enough to touch, but not exactly cozied up to him. They both knew it would change in a matter of time. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 6 Dylan opened his eyes in the morning light to find Kelly sitting cross-legged in the tiny tent. She was holding an envelope. Slowly, she straightened out the crumpled paper, pressing it flat. He didn't make a move or a sound, but she looked at him, noticing that he was awake. Dylan remained silent, waiting. Kelly tried to smile, but it was more of a sad grimace. It's a letter from the lawyer. Dylan watched as she played with the paper. I think I know what it says, but I keep putting off opening it. I wanted this weekend to be normal before everything goes to pieces. A tear spilled over her cheek and she wiped it away quickly. Silly. It doesn't change anything. When did you get the letter? Dylan asked gently. Friday. She took a deep breath. I can't win. I don't have money like they do to hire good lawyers. Dylan carefully sat up. He made sure his voice was very gentle. Why don't we just open the letter and then decide what needs to be done based on what it says? We? Kelly looked up at him. Dylan hated to see the vulnerability in her eyes. We. Do you want me to open it? Kelly handed him the letter. Please. He hesitated, but opened it and began to read. He paraphrased the lawyer's speech. Margaret and Terence Islington are suing you for full custody of Bentley Christopher Islington. What? Kelly stared at him in shock. I thought they wanted partial custody. They want full custody. Dylan watched her, worried. Bentley's grandparents. She began gulping in great breaths of air. Kelly held a hand to her mouth and another to her abdomen, tears coming in earnest now. They're going to take him from me. No one is going to take your son. Dylan gathered her in his arms and held her. Kelly shook her head. You don't understand. He's your son. You love him and are doing a good job raising him, Dylan said logically. No judge is going to take Bentley away from you. Kelly had a heartbreaking sob. I work sixty hours a week just to pay rent, and I'm behind. I'm being evicted. I just lost my job for being late to work too many times. The only place we can go to is my mom's, and she's a drug addict and alcoholic. Kelly. Dylan tried to search for the right words to say. We will fight this. I'm going to lose my son, Kelly keened. She cried unconsolably. There was a scuffle of feet and voices outside the tent. She's crying. If he hurt her. Get real, guys. The zipper opened and Tiana crawled in. What is going on? Dylan glanced meaningfully at the paper under Tiana's knee. He smoothed back the hair on Kelly's face as she continued to pour her heart out on him. Tiana murmured to herself as she read the letter. What does it say? The entire group was kneeling at the entrance of the tent. I don't understand. It's all lawyer talk. Tiana looked at Derek. Derek snatched the paper out of her hand and scanned it. He muttered curses. Christopher's parents are suing for full custody and guardianship of Bentley. They cite that they can prove Kelly is an unfit mother. That's just not true, Bex cried. Kelly's a great mom. Can you get the dragon to do pro bono work? Tomlin asked Derek. Derek snorted. Not likely. She's a shark. Your boss is a family lawyer? Dylan asked. The best. She deals with custody battles all the time, Derek said. However, her clientele tends to be rich and able to afford her. 
Then I will hire her and whoever else we need to, Dylan stated firmly. Kelly is not going to lose Bentley. They decided to pack up camp and go back early. That way, Derek and Dylan could hire lawyers and figure out the best way to defend Kelly against the Islingtons. Kelly sniffed and wiped her eyes. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be crying on you like that. Hey, Dylan turned her face and waited until she looked at him. You are not going to lose Bentley, I promise. You can't promise that, Kelly said sadly. No one can. I'm going to do everything that I can to ensure that Bentley stays with you, he assured her. I can start by talking to someone at the hospital to get your job back. Please don't, Kelly hugged herself. It's not that I'm not grateful for the offer, but you can't just use your wealth and influence to make them hire me back. Why not? Dylan frowned as he recalled some of the details that she had shared around the campfire. You were doing your job looking after that guy. It's not okay that they fired you. I knowingly disobeyed hospital policy. I was consistently late to work. Kelly sighed. I'm going to have an even worse track record with my attendance at any new job now that I have to attend court dates. Yes, I don't agree with the hospital's policy that got me fired. Yet as much as I need the job, I don't think it's right to just have you go in and get it back for me. I feel like I would be taking advantage of you. You wouldn't be. I offered to do this for you, Dylan said. I know. Kelly rubbed her face and gathered up her things in the tent. And I would dearly like to accept your offers. However, I might start to depend on you, and then what? What happens when you decide to be over the novelty of hanging out with the poor girl? Or if you decide to further your relationship with Susan Hythe? She definitely won't want you associating with the likes of me. I just can't let myself learn to depend on you, Dylan, because eventually you will leave. Then what happens the next time? I need to figure out how to do this on my own. Dylan watched with some confusion as she grabbed her bag and crawled out of the tent. He had never had anyone turn down his offer of help before, and Kelly desperately needed his help. Derek waited for Cynthia Stone to pick up. He paced the small path around the camp as the rest of the crew packed up tents and made breakfast. Thankfully, he had a cell phone booster. After Tiana had gotten hurt one year, it was policy that at least one of them would be able to call for an emergency help if anything happened. Hello? a sleepy voice asked. Derek looked at his watch. It's 7.30. Since when are you asleep? Since I worked until two in the morning because my assistant went camping, came the sharp reply. I am bogged down in cases. Are you coming back early? Yes, I have a new case for you. Derek could feel the tension of his working life coming straight back at him. He would be popping antacids in no time. Kelly Islington is being sued for custody by the grandparents. No. He could hear Cynthia turning on a coffee machine in the background. Conflict of interest. I was just hired by Margaret and Terence Islington on Thursday while you were processing the Gardner files. Then drop them, Derek said. Kelly needs the best to represent her. I am flattered that you think I'm the best. However, even the best isn't going to get Kelly Islington custody. They have all sorts of dirt on this, Mom. She has just been fired. She's being evicted. She has no money, so it's laughable that you think she could hire me. Derek, she's toast. There's no way she's keeping the kid. Cynthia yawned. She is my friend, he said simply. Then you need new friends, she stated wryly. We have somebody willing to pay the fees for Kelly. Derek tried to persuade her. Drop the Islingtons and take her on. Please? I can't. Cynthia was turning on a shower. He could hear the spray of water over the phone. The contract is already signed. I'm obligated to the Islingtons. Break the contract, Derek suggested. Derek, that's not going to happen. Get yourself back here so we can get some work done. Derek hung up the phone. He really wanted to quit his job right now. Then again, he wanted to quit his job nearly every other day. He grabbed out his wallet and looked at the photo in it to remind himself of why he was putting up with Cynthia Stone. Is she going to take the case? Tiana asked. Derek shook his head and put his wallet away. She has been hired by the Islingtons. What? Tiana was outraged. Yep. 
Derek grimaced. I am so mad right now. Did you tell her they were the scum of the earth and she needed to work for Kelly instead? Tiana questioned. Derek snorted. Like I said, she's a cold-hearted woman. Cynthia thinks she's going to win. How often does she lose? Tomlin asked. Derek met Tomlin's eyes reluctantly. Never? There's always a first time, right? Kelly dredged up a wobbly smile as she approached. I'm sure I will find a really great legal aid lawyer. Judges usually side with the moms, so that's in my favor. Kelly, they know that you've lost your job, Derek warned. And when were you going to tell us that you were getting evicted? I don't know, Derek. Kelly closed her eyes and rubbed her forehead. Maybe I was a little focused on the fact that I just learned I might lose custody of my son. You're getting evicted? Bex echoed. I'm behind on the rent, Kelly said. You work all the time. How can you be behind on the rent? Tomlin wondered. Because every cent I make gets taken by child care, or dentistry, or health insurance, Kelly's voice rose. Or the utilities, because it's nice to have heat in the winter. Don't forget the rent goes up every year while my pay stays the same. Plus, Josh needs things that Mom isn't buying for him, like clothes, school supplies, and groceries. Hey, Tiana wrapped an arm around her. We all know the struggle. I work all the time, Kelly hiccuped pathetically. I just can't get it done. I have no savings, no retirement, no college fund for Bentley. I'm behind on my student loans from nursing, plus my bills from the hospitals for when Bentley was born and when Christopher died. I don't drink or party. I go out with you guys once a year. That's it. I don't spend money on anything but the necessities. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Tiana hugged her as she burst into tears again. Who is Josh? Dylan asked quietly to Tomlin. Her half-brother. He's fifteen, he replied. She takes care of him as well? Dylan questioned. Tomlin put a hand on his shoulder and steered Dylan away from the group. Kelly's mom, Meredith, isn't exactly the best functioning adult. She's an addict. Sometimes she manages to get clean. Her husband, Moose, comes and goes as he gets work. They barely get by. Josh still lives with them, but he hangs out at Kelly's a lot. She still has the bills from Bentley's dad, Christopher. He had cancer. They weren't even married for a year before he died. Kelly was originally hired right out of nursing school to take care of Christopher. When they fell in love and decided to get married, the Islingtons cut Christopher off. They said Kelly was just a hussy and a gold digger. Kelly had to take care of him by herself because the Islingtons wouldn't pay out for any care during the marriage. Anything that wasn't covered by his insurance, she's still paying off. Meanwhile, his folks are rolling in cash, Tomlin said in disgust. They haven't helped with any of Bentley's stuff. They just expect to be able to have him over whenever they want. She turned down my offer to hire a lawyer. Dylan looked back at Kelly, who was still crying on Tiana. She said she didn't want to learn to depend on me. Who has she had in her life that she could depend on? Tomlin grimaced. We are her friends, and she's always hiding behind smiles and a positive attitude trying to make us feel better. She's never been able to accept help because no one has been there to help her. Well, we're all here to help her now. Dylan looked at Tomlin as he made the commitment. The fact that anyone would want to take a kid from a mom who obviously loved him did not sit well with Dylan. He was glad that Ren's parents had no desire to fight him for custody of Caden and Avery. It was enough that they saw the boys on special occasions. If Dylan had his boys taken away, he wasn't sure what he would do. He couldn't imagine it. Is there any way to hire a lawyer and tell Kelly he comes from legal aid but to buy her a good lawyer? Dylan asked Derek as he and Bo came to join them. Kelly would notice a professional lawyer. Derek grimaced. Legal aid is like drawing from the lottery. There are some really good lawyers there. There are also some poor ones and very inexperienced ones. That's not good enough, Dylan stated flatly. Preaching to the choir, Derek agreed. However, Kelly is stubborn and doesn't want you to pay out for a fancy lawyer if she feels that she can never pay you back. That's not going to help her case, Dylan said tersely. It gets worse. I don't know if you heard, but my boss is working for the Islingtons. Cynthia Stone doesn't pull any punches. Derek scowled. She's going to hone in on the fact that Kelly has no job, no apartment, no prospects. 
Cynthia's going to make Kelly sound unfit to raise Bentley. Which we know isn't true. Kelly loves Bentley and is a good mom, Dylan defended her. She just needs some financial help. Which she won't accept unless she feels like she's giving something in return. Derek gave a hollow laugh. Kelly is going to lose. How do you figure? Aren't judges partial to siding with moms? Dylan asked. Usually, if the kid isn't in any danger, they do side with the mom and get her the tools she needs to succeed. Derek shook his head. This court date has come up very quickly, which makes me suspect a couple of things. Like what? Dylan questioned. That the Islingtons have made it seem worse than what it is? What sort of evidence have they brought forward to the judge to make this case go so fast? Do we even have a chance of winning when I have all the cash in the world against a destitute mother? Derek shrugged. We can bring forward character witnesses for Kelly, but that's not helpful when she doesn't have an appropriate place to live or the means to buy her kid lunch. Dylan exchanged phone numbers with Derek. He assured Kelly's friend that if she needed anything, Derek was to let him know. The mood of the group was somber as they hiked back to the cars. They had dropped Dylan off first at the bar and grill where they had kidnapped him from. It had been a few days and Dylan hadn't heard from them since. He was concerned because he also felt that Kelly was avoiding him. While he had seen Bentley at the school when picking up and dropping off Avery at class, there was no sign of Kelly. Dylan had wanted to touch base with her to see how she was doing, to know if she had found an acceptable lawyer, to offer to pay for one yet again. Dylan felt bad about her situation. He was also a little disappointed. Dylan felt like they'd become friends over the camping weekend, and now he was left out. It was disconcerting. Since he didn't have Kelly's phone number, and he knew better than to start gossip at the school by asking the secretary for it, Dylan settled for calling Derek. Hopefully, he could get some answers as to what was going on. However, he found that talking to Derek wasn't all that satisfying either. For some reason, Kelly didn't want him to know the exact court date or time. Derek gave him the information, but advised him to show up a little late. He didn't want to get caught out for going behind Kelly's back. Dylan again offered to help financially. Derek promised to try to convince Kelly. They both only wanted to help Kelly. However, it didn't sound like she was going to allow them the opportunity. Derek promised to keep in touch with any further developments. Dylan, for all his wealth, felt a little useless. He wondered when he would next see Kelly. Kelly hurried into the office of the school. She had been in the middle of an interview when her phone had rung. The school was having a problem with Bentley and required her to come in to discuss it. She had blown her chance at the job. It was one of the few interviews that she had been granted in her field. No one seemed to like the fact that she had been terminated from her last job, so Kelly wasn't getting any callbacks. Kelly told herself that she wasn't desperate enough to scrub toilets just yet. She was getting close, though. She pasted on a smile for the benefit of the secretary. Excuse me, I was called in? Please take a seat. Principal Wright will be with you shortly. The secretary gave her a dismissive look and continued clicking away on her keyboard. Kelly took the seat and waited. The custody hearing was only two days away. She had an appointment in an hour to see the lawyer that had been assigned to her for the first time. Mr. Ailes had sounded nice on the phone. She hoped he was a good lawyer. At least he was free. She had five days to get another apartment, move her in Bentley's things, get a job, win a custody court case, and figure out her life. No sweat. Mrs. Islington? Principal Wright stood in the doorway of his office. Kelly put on a smile and followed him into the room. Her smile immediately left when she spotted Susan Hythe. Susan, to what do I owe the pleasure? Susan sniffed. I think Principal Wright should answer. Mrs. Islington, please be seated. He motioned to the chair next to Susan. Kelly pulled the chair a little away from the offending woman and sat. I have had some disturbing news. Apparently, Bentley was swearing at Philip today and threatened to pants him. Bentley doesn't swear. Pants? Philip? Kelly asked in some confusion. What does that even mean? 
pantsing someone is when you pull their pants down in public, Principal Wright said. We take bullying very seriously at this school, Mrs. Islington. I understand that, and I'm glad you do take it seriously, Kelly responded. I have a question, though. Did anyone else hear Bentley say these things? Excuse me? Susan jumped in the conversation. My Philip was threatened. He told me so. I'm just asking if there were any witnesses, Kelly said reasonably. Otherwise, it's just Philip's word against Bentley's. Did Bentley admit to threatening Philip or swearing? No, he was adamant that he didn't threaten Philip or say those things, Principal Wright said. We will be investigating further into the matter, including asking if any other students heard the threats. So you didn't do that already? Kelly asked. Seems a bit premature to be asking me to come in. I was in the middle of a job interview. Mrs. Islington, we felt it necessary to inform you of events, the principal began, but Kelly interrupted. You haven't done a complete investigation. You haven't asked the other kids what really happened. You took Philip's word over Bentley's. Why? Because my kid is poor and doesn't fit in at Livingston Academy? Kelly rolled her eyes. Oh, wait, did Philip even say anything, or was it just his mommy complaining? Susan gasped. How dare you? Really, Susan? Kelly looked at her in disbelief. This after what you did at the Ramsleys during Avery's birthday party? Should I let Principal Wright know what Dylan Ramsley caught you doing? That has nothing to do with this, Susan exclaimed, even as she paled in complexion. I think it does. I think you have it in either for me and my kid, or for the kids of First Elementary in general, Kelly stated. I think you want to get rid of us and are stooping to any low method your fertile imagination can come up with. Ladies, Principal Wright said loudly, that is enough. Susan waved her hand dismissively. How absurd. Just admit it, Kelly insisted. You don't think that our kids are as good as yours. Why would they be? Susan laughed. The fact that we are allowing future drug dealers and low-life criminals to mingle with future presidents and lawmakers is crazy. I have no idea why Livingston Academy would ever allow such creatures with barely an education to grace its doors. You are asking for head lice, bullying, vandalism? They blew up the toilets, the former school, for pity's sake. Mrs. Hythe, that is enough. Principal Wright looked at her in disgust. I think it's time I talked with Philip myself. You can't, Susan said suddenly. I need to take him to the doctor's. Why, so you can coach him on what to say to Principal Wright? Kelly asked dryly. I promise that I won't take up too much of Philip's time. The principal stood. You two ladies can stay here. They watched him exit the room. It's disgraceful, that's what it is, Susan growled. You should all go back to the sewers where you came from. Kelly decided not to say anything. She was angry enough that she might really get into it, and then she'd end up being charged or having Bentley expelled for something she did. Kelly ignored Susan and stared out the window, waiting for Principal Wright to come back. Principal Wright closed the door behind himself and sat down at his desk. He folded his hands. After careful questioning, I was able to determine that while Philip understood the term pantsing, he wasn't familiar, nor could he repeat the swear words that Bentley had said to him. After a few more questions, he admitted that he had been put up to accusing Bentley of this misconduct by his own mother. Mrs. Hythe, do you have anything to say for your behavior? This school needs to purge the first elementary students from Livingston Academy, Susan stated firmly. My Philip had head lice. These children bring disease with them. We need to protect our kids. Mrs. Hythe, the principal sighed. I'm going to suspend Philip for a week for falsely accusing another student. I hope he will come to understand the gravity of the situation you have put him in. I am also revoking your special privileges with this school. Due to your dishonesty, I will not have you on or leading any of our special committees. That's it? Kelly snorted. She gets out of PTA meetings? Mrs. Islington, it is an appropriate punishment, Principal Wright said. No, it's not, Kelly protested his decision. If my son had been found guilty, I guarantee the police would be involved for threatening another student. 
he would be lucky to get a week's suspension. This kid gets to threaten my son's education by falsely accusing him on the advice of his mother, and all he gets is a week's suspension, and she gets kicked out of parents' clubs? That's ridiculous. Mrs. Islington, please calm down, Principal Wright implored. I don't think so. Kelly grabbed her cell phone as it beeped an alarm. You are lucky. I need to go right now to visit my lawyer for a custody hearing. If I were rich, with a real lawyer, I would sue the both of you right now, so count your blessings that I'm poor and basically powerless. Kelly grabbed her bag and stormed out of the office. She took the shuttle to the bus stop and the bus to the legal aid office. Even though she was right on time for her appointment, she ended up waiting for an hour before Mr. Ailes, her new lawyer, was able to see her. It was probably a good thing, she reflected ruefully, because it had taken all that time to stop simmering in fury over the episode at Livingston Academy. Now her anger was replaced by nerves. She had never had to deal with court cases or lawyers before. Mr. Ailes was tall and thin with a long tie. Kelly wondered if he bought them from a special store. She shook his hand gratefully and took a seat at his small office. The office barely contained a tiny desk, two chairs, a laptop, and piles of files. "'Mrs. Islington, I've looked over your file, and I have to say I'm very optimistic,' Mr. Ailes began. "'It seems like this is a routine custody battle where the grandparents feel that your son would be better served to live with them. However, I have found the courts tend to rule in the mother's favor, and you have several things going for you. You're not an addict. You did have a steady job for a number of years before you were fired. I assume you're looking for a new one? Yes, Kelly answered anxiously. I have left my resume with numerous employment agencies. Good. Mr. Ailes smiled and smoothed down his tie. How is your living situation? Your accommodations? I am being evicted by the end of the month. Kelly was truthful. I'm hoping to find a new place but I will likely need to stay with my mother until I save up enough money. Okay, so you have the support from your mother. Mr. Ailes wrote something in the file. What is her reputation like? Kelly grimaced. She's not the best. She is an addict. Has she tried treatment before? Yes, Kelly nodded. She hasn't found it very successful. Even if she would go into rehab again, it would show that she is making an effort, Mr. Ailes said. I would strongly suggest signing her up again and making sure she gets to the clinic. The judge will appreciate that she is trying. Kelly nodded. She didn't have faith that it would make any difference in Meredith's life any more, but if it meant that the judge would look more favorably on Kelly, keeping Bentley, she would do whatever it took. I think we have a good chance, Mrs. Islington. You have raised Bentley for eight years. He has no history of abuse. You have no history of substance abuse. You have been a stable parental figure during all that time. Yes, you're going through a rough patch right now, he allowed. However, you have a plan. Many times judges will allow women who live in shelters to keep custody, so I think this shouldn't be a problem at all. Kelly sighed in relief. You have no idea how much I needed to hear that. Mr. Ailes gave her a kind smile. Dress neatly for the court date. You will have to bring Bentley. He will sit with a court-appointed child care professional during the hearing. Make sure you are early. Thank you, Mr. Ailes. Kelly shook his hand. She was very glad that she had been assigned this kind man to appear to have her best interests at heart. I am sure everything will be fine, he reassured her. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look forward to the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 7 It was not fine. In fact, the court case was going horribly. Kelly felt like she was being vilified. She had felt confident over the past week from her chat with Mr. Ailes. She told her friends that it was going to be fine. Derek had disagreed, but Kelly had told them it was all under control. She was glad she hadn't allowed Dylan to hire any fancy lawyers. There was no way she could ever pay him back. Kelly had asked Derek not to tell Dylan when the court case was. They were barely friends. Mr. Ailes seemed competent. Her confidence had faded the minute the stern judge had focused his gaze on her. She didn't know why, but it seemed like Judge Bolin 
had made up his mind already, and wasn't in her favor. "'Mrs. Islington, I understand you recently lost your job.' The judge peered down at her over his glasses. "'Yes, I was a nurse at Mercy Hospital. I'm sure I'll get another position very soon,' Kelly assured him nervously. "'On average, how many hours a week did you work at the hospital?' he asked. Sixty. Kelly clasped her hands in front of her. She tried not to fidget. "'Correct me if I'm wrong, but the hospital is probably the highest-paying employer for nurses. If you were to take on another position at, say, a private nursing home, would you have to work more hours to maintain the same amount of pay?' Judge Bolin wrote something down. "'Yes, you're right. I would have to work more hours to make up the pay.' Kelly's confidence fell. "'Yet you are behind on your rent so much that you've been served an eviction notice.' he grimaced. "'Your Honor,' Mr. Ale shot to his feet. "'Mrs. Islington has talked to a debt consolidation service and is working hard to get her finances in order. "'Mr. Ale, sit down. I already told you that I prefer to simply talk to the individuals involved in the proceedings and skip the lawyer chat.' The judge looked down his nose at Kelly's lawyer. "'If you interrupt again, I will throw you out of my courtroom.' "'Mrs. Islington, do you have a response?' Kelly swallowed and tried to keep her breathing even. She felt like she was losing this case, that she was losing her son. "'It's an expensive city.' "'I understand that you share the bedroom with your son. How old is he again?' Judge Bolin was sifting through pages. "'I hung a blanket down the middle in the room for privacy,' Kelly tried to explain. "'Bentley has just turned eight. A delicate age where he should have his own room. He wrote something else down. Do you tend to spend a lot of money on non-necessities? No, absolutely not. Kelly had no money left over from the necessities. Anyone who looked at her finances could see that. Yet I have photos of you at the bar running up an expensive tab. The judge motioned for the bailiff to give Kelly an enlarged photo. Is that you? Kelly looked at it. It is. This was taken during my annual camping trip. It only happens once a year. We go to the bar and then we camp for the rest of the holiday weekend. You expect me to believe that a young thing like you only goes out to the bar once a year? Judge Bolin asked in disbelief. Yes. Kelly bit the inside of her cheek to distract herself from becoming overtly emotional. Bursting into tears wouldn't solve anything right now. It's the truth. The doors at the back of the courtroom opened a moment as Dylan entered. He quietly took a seat behind Kelly and her legal counsel. Kelly hadn't told him when the hearing was scheduled. She wondered how he had gotten the information. Mrs. Islington, the judge drew her attention back to the front of the courtroom. You have no income, no place suitable to live, and you expect to retain custody of your son. Your Honor... Mrs. Islington is the mother of this child. Mr. Ale stood and risked the judge's wrath once more. She loves her son and is trying to get her life back on track. She can stay with her own mother for the moment. The maternal grandmother who is a drug addict and an alcoholic? Miss Stone said dryly from across the aisle where she sat with the Islingtons. She's just been through rehab, Mr. Ale said. How many times has she been through rehab during her life? Judge Bolin inquired. Mr. Ailes looked at Kelly. Eight times, Your Honor. Kelly closed her eyes in defeat. She curled her fingers into her palms and pressed her nails hard into her skin in another attempt to distract herself from giving in to tears. She swallowed hard with the effort. I'll restate myself. You have no appropriate place to raise your son nor any income to do so, the judge said. The paternal grandparents are financially secure and have a safe environment to raise the boy. He could continue to attend his current school. Do I have this right, Mrs. Islington? Excuse me, Your Honor. Dylan stood. Are your main objections to Mrs. Islington retaining custody of her son, her residence, and income? That would be correct. There's also the fact she is a very young single parent. The judge eyed him. Who are you? Dylan Ramsley. He introduced himself and saw a flicker of recognition from the judge. May I approach the bench? 
Please do, the judge said. Christopher's parents gave him dark looks. Kelly looked like her world was going to fall apart, and Dylan paused to touch her arm. He wasn't going to let that happen. Even if she had turned down his offers of help, he had given his word that she would not lose custody of her son. Dylan lowered his voice so only he and the judge could hear. What's it going to take for her to keep her son? You've already heard my issues. Residence, finances, and single status, the judge said. The Islingtons aren't going to let up on this. The only way that she's going to retain full custody is for her to be married, financially secure, and have an appropriate residence where her son has his own private bedroom. Otherwise, they're going to continue to press for custody. As it stands right now, she has no shot of keeping that kid. Why is married an issue? Dylan persisted. Plenty of single women raise children. Kelly might look young, but she just turned thirty. The judge snorted. The Islingtons are going to dog her every step to prove she's an unfit parent. Dating? Drinking? He pulled up a picture of the group at the bar as proof. Dylan also saw other pictures on the judge's desk, including one of Kelly and him going into their tent. He could imagine the Islingtons intended to use the pictures to cast doubt about Kelly's moral integrity. It wouldn't matter that he and Kelly had been clothed the entire time. Aren't there laws against spying on people? Dylan questioned. Only if they aren't in a public place, the judge looked at Dylan shrewdly. You look like the one that got kidnapped by her friends. How am I supposed to give custody to a woman who associates with criminals, Mr. Ramsley? Dylan scowled as the judge tapped his finger against a series of pictures. He could see himself getting tossed in the trunk. It was a prank. If I had actually been kidnapped, I would be pressing charges. Funny prank. The judge didn't look amused. It still shows a lacking amount of judgment in the selection of her friends. Your Honor, Kelly works so many hours she barely has time for her friends, Dylan said. That's another point against her. The judge warmed to the subject. Her finances are a complete mess. With the income that she has versus the debts, it was always a losing battle. Look, Mr. Ramsley, my verdict isn't set in stone just yet, but I'm leaning toward awarding custody to the paternal grandparents. Dylan knew he couldn't let that happen. He mulled over the options. What if she was engaged or in a committed relationship with someone who could provide for her? The judge gave him a knowing look and pointed to the picture with both Kelly and Dylan coming out of the tent. You might promise me that you're engaged. You could promise me fairy sprites and unicorns, Mr. Ramsley, and I might believe you. If you paid me enough, I might even tell others there were such things. However, the Islingtons are not going to budge. They won't settle for a fiancé. Unless you've got a husband somewhere for the girl who is more powerful and has more money than them, she's just going to go through court again and again until they win. Why prolong the custody battle? Thank you for your bluntness, Dylan said dryly. Mr. Ramsley, I'm having a fundraiser for a very special cause. I would really appreciate it if you would consider donating to it, the judge raised an eyebrow. As a separate fact, I can lean towards Kelly Islington at this time, with joint custody going to the grandparents until she can rectify her situation. A bribe. He wants a bribe, Dylan thought angrily. He wondered how much the Islingtons had paid. Dylan also knew that he couldn't accuse the judge of asking for money since it would be his word against Dylan's. He also knew that if the Islingtons were granted partial custody, soon enough they would have full custody. The judge was right about them not letting this rest until they had won. Even if he did pay the bribe, it was only going to work this one time. The Islingtons weren't going to let this rest. There really was only one way that Kelly was going to win this thing. The Islingtons were fairly wealthy. Dylan had seen them at various hospital fundraisers and knew that Kelly simply didn't have the funds nor the connections to fight them, especially when they didn't play fair by using innocent photos made to look bad and a judge who took bribes. Kelly was going to lose her son, unless he stepped in and did exactly what the judge wanted. "'What if I were engaged to Kelly?' Dylan asked. "'What if you were?' the judge shrugged. "'Tomorrow you might not be. 
I'm looking for something much more permanent for Bentley. Marriage might not last, but divorce isn't cheap. I'm very sorry, Your Honor. I won't be contributing to your fundraiser, Dylan said flatly. He had promised Kelly that she wouldn't lose custody of Bentley, and he meant to see it through, even if it wasn't something that he wanted. That's a shame, the judge shrugged. It's unfortunate, but in these sorts of cases, money usually wins. It is, Dylan agreed grimly. He turned his back to the judge and went to Kelly's attorney, Mr. Ailes. Yes, Mr. Ailes nodded and smoothed down his tie. Did you get him to listen to reason? I've never had a case where the judge has been so reluctant to grant the mother custody. If we lose, what are the chances of an appeal working? Dylan ignored Kelly's horrified gasp. It depends on what judge we get and how long the process takes to bring it back into court. With Bentley being in a reasonable situation, it could be considered a lower priority. Mr. Ailes frowned. The courts are backed up. It could be anywhere from six months to two years for an appeal to be heard. By then, Bentley would be used to the situation with his grandparents. At age ten, he might even be allowed to testify where he wants to live. Two years is a long time for a child to stay loyal to a parent. Unless Kelly's situation substantially changed, it's likely the court would just grant her visitation. Are you two done talking so I can give my verdict? The judge drawled. Dylan ignored him a moment. His stomach dropped as he looked at Kelly and made a decision that was going to impact both of them for the rest of their lives. However, he had been brought up to keep his word, and he wasn't going to stop doing that now. Kelly, I promised you wouldn't lose Bentley. She nodded, tears in her eyes. Kelly took a deep breath and tried to be realistic. I know you did, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. It's okay, Dylan. Dylan knew it wasn't okay. He grabbed Kelly's hand in his and turned back to the judge. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Kelly and I will require your services today, Your Honor. Excuse me, Mr. Ramsley, I don't quite follow. The judge glanced over his glasses. Mrs. Islington and I would like to get married. Dylan dropped the bombshell calmly. It solves all of the issues of custody, and we have decided not to wait, after all, since Bentley's future is at stake. You're saying that you and Mrs. Islington are engaged? Bolin raised an eyebrow at the irony. Yes. Dylan didn't hesitate with the lie. He looked squarely at the judge. This is preposterous, sputtered Miss Stone for the Islingtons. Who is this man? We don't know anything about him. Mr. Islington jumped to his feet. What kind of man is he? Is he safe with children? Dylan Ramsley, son of Robert Ramsley. Dylan introduced himself. I manage the eastern half of Ramsley Insurance, a large company that insures hospitals, insurance businesses, pharmaceuticals, and more. I have two sons. I meet all of judges' requirements for Kelly retaining custody of her son. I'm financially secure and have a home where Bentley may have his own room. Bentley will also be able to continue to attend Livingston Academy. How convenient, said the judge. Come on up to the front, then, and we'll do this up properly. Barbara, find the necessary paperwork. Kelly had a death grip on his hand. She was shaking. He didn't feel too steady himself, but was determined to see this through. This whole thing was a farce, and it was the only way to beat the Islingtons without resorting to an illegal bribe. This is a fake marriage, a sham! Mrs. Islington said scathingly. She'll do anything to keep our grandson from us. Dylan disregarded her and brought Kelly up before the judge. Rings? the judge asked. We weren't expecting to be married today, Your Honor, Dylan said wryly. Barbara, get that box of rings, the judge grumbled. It'll cost you extra, but I've some spares. They sorted through the plain gold bands to find two that would fit. Kelly's hands shook so much that Dylan had to do it for her. He wondered what she was thinking right now. Barbara, where's that piece of paper you wrote up? There it is. The judge held up a piece of paper and settled his glasses so that he could read through them. He began to read the form in a bored voice. Marriage is the honorable estate in which a man and woman pledge to be true to one another and in the process choose to become one. 
This is a lifetime commitment to one another and which promises a bond for life. Marriage is one of the most important obligations that two people will ever swear to uphold. Marriage is a challenge, but it is love. It is a promise that should last a lifetime and a commitment to be there one for the other, no matter what happens, no matter who fails, for better or for worse. Marriage is sustained by love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not dishonor others. It is not selfish. It is not easily angered, nor does it keep a record of loss. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Dylan, do you take Kelly to be your wife, to live together in the state of marriage, love her, not hurt her, honor and keep her, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep only to Kelly for so long as you both shall live? Dylan looked down at Kelly, seeing her vulnerability and strengthened his resolve. I do. Dylan, please place this ring on Kelly's finger, and this ring will serve as a symbol of your lasting commitment to her. The judge waited for Dylan to place the ring on Kelly's finger. Kelly, do you take Dylan to be your husband, to live together in the state of marriage, love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keeping only to Dylan for as long as you both shall live? I do, Kelly whispered. Kelly, place this ring on Dylan's finger, and this ring will serve as an lasting symbol of your love and commitment to him. The judge waited for Kelly, who needed two tries to put the ring on Dylan's finger. It's my honor and privilege to introduce to everyone here Mr. and Mrs. Dylan James Ramsley. Mr. Ramsley, you may kiss your bride. Dylan leaned down and gave Kelly a gentle kiss. He could hear Kelly's group of friends clapping and catcalling. Kelly blushed. Order. The judge banged his gavel. Sign the paperwork, please. They signed where necessary, and Dylan paid the fees involved. Afterward, the judge came down and shook their hands. I hope I'll be invited to the celebration you have with your families and friends. Dylan didn't promise anything. Your Honor, Miss Stone interrupted. What about the custody of Bentley? The judge looked at her in surprise. Mrs. Ramsley has a support system, is financially sound, and has an appropriate place for her son to live. She retains full custody. The Islingtons protested, and Miss Stone assured them that they would put in an appeal. While Kelly and Dylan were receiving congratulations, Derek walked over to Cynthia. How does it feel to lose? You could have told me, Cynthia glared at him. I should have known about Dylan Ramsley. Derek shrugged. Conflict of interest. She's my friend. It's your job to keep me informed, Cynthia growled. Don't ever do that again. Next time, if I tell you to drop a case, maybe you ought to, Derek replied before turning his back on her to go congratulate Dylan and Kelly. He had the feeling the whole thing between the couple was a show for the court, but he wasn't about to complain. Dylan had done with money and status what none of them were capable of doing. Derek shook Dylan's hand. We need to talk about the appeal process Miss Stone is likely to bring forward. Somewhere private, where we won't be bothered. Agreed, Dylan nodded. He was willing to listen to any suggestions Derek might have. He also wondered just how far the Islingtons were willing to go to gain custody of Bentley. They had already sent a private investigator to take photos of the camping trip, dig up Kelly's finances, and knew about her employment situation. If they were that thorough, then they probably would be watching Dylan and Kelly. This meant Kelly and Bentley would have to move in with Dylan. Suddenly, the simple gold ring felt heavy on his finger. He had made a lot of promises in the last few minutes. Once again, Dylan had shackled himself to a woman in need without truly thinking the whole thing through. Although, to be fair, with Wren he had been naive, thinking he could handle her issues. What were Caden and Avery going to think? He had just changed all of their lives irrevocably within the last twenty minutes. He looked at his new bride and wondered if he was strong enough to survive a second marriage. After the first, he hadn't been inclined to ever enter the state again. It was too late now. All he could do was hope that he wouldn't come to regret the impetuous decision that he had made to commit himself again. 
They made promises to invite her friends to a celebration in honor of the wedding and watched as the Islingtons left in a huff. Kelly indicated that she wanted to collect Bentley from the child service worker he was waiting with in an adjacent room to the courthouse, and Dylan agreed. Derek lingered as the friends left. He showed them to a side room. I'm sorry to keep you a moment from Bentley, but we should talk, he began. It's important that both of you be on the same page and keep up appearances until a verdict on the appeal is in. As you know, it could be as little as six months or up to two years, depending on where you fall in the court system. That long? Kelly asked, feeling uncertain. She wondered if Dylan would want a divorce after custody was finally settled. She hugged herself, insecurity creeping in on her. It's a possibility, Derek allowed. What do we need to do? Dylan wanted to know. You need to live together. You need to sleep in the same bedroom. Derek was very serious. What? Kelly tried not to blush. Derek! I know Stone. She's already talking appeal with the Islingtons. Derek was insistent and logical. They're going to investigate your life. You have to think that everything you do right now, and for the next part of the foreseeable future, is going to be spied upon. They will bribe the housekeeper, the cleaning staff, the school teacher, whoever they need to, so that they can get any dirt on you and sway a judge's opinion. You might think the people around you are rock solid, but they will be investigated too. The last thing you want is for them to be able to prove this is a sham marriage in any way. I agree. Dylan was grim. He knew they were already capable of spying from the pictures he had seen on the judge's bench. They have already proven they aren't trustworthy. You should also allow them to see Bentley on occasion, Derek cautioned. One afternoon every two weeks is practical. After they tried to take him away? Kelly protested. I don't think so. Kelly, it would help to make you and Dylan look more reasonable to the next judge that hears your case, Eric stated. After the appeal, you can cut them off if that's what you decide. However, remember that Bentley is a good and honest kid. If you aren't sleeping in the same bed or you argue at all, he's probably going to tell the grandparents. They are going to be asking him questions to try to get information. Kelly closed her eyes. This is a nightmare. Dylan exchanged looks with Derek as he put a hand to his new wife's back. It's going to be okay, Kelly. How? she asked plaintively. They are using my son as a pawn in this custody battle. I don't even think they want him. It's more about keeping up appearances to their friends. Once we win, the appeal will be over, Dylan said firmly. You will never have to deal with them again if that's what you want. If either of you have anything in your past that might reflect badly on you, get it dealt with, Derek advised. Don't think that anything might be left unturned. The Islingtons will hire a private investigator. Should we be hiring one in return? Dylan inquired. Probably not a bad idea. Derek responded with a sigh. Most times these things come down to money, unfortunately. We all know the Islingtons are loaded. Dylan smiled in grim satisfaction. In that case, we will win hands down. How does it come down to money? Kelly questioned. Shouldn't it be based on who would be the better caregiver? We would like to think of it that way, Derek confessed. But there are some corrupt judges out here. Only a few, yet if you know who they are and you can get the case seen by them, then a bribe can make all the difference. Bribing judges? Kelly was horrified. It happens. Not often, but it happens, Derek said. Look, Stone has never lost a case before. She thought she had this one in the bag. She is going to come out rabid for a win during the appeal process, so I imagine she's going to do everything she can to make sure she gets the right judge. Is there any way we can stop her? Dylan asked. If you can prove there was a bribe, then we can get the appeal thrown out. Derek shrugged. I doubt that's going to happen. So if you have any sway whatsoever, I would use it to make sure you get an honest judge. I can't see anyone not granting you custody since you are the birth mother and stepfather, are financially secure, and have a good home for Bentley. I will see who I can contact about that. Dylan would have to talk to his father and find out who he knew that might be helpful. The word stepfather hit him hard. Another person to be responsible for. One more thing. Derek hesitated. 
Try not to let Bentley do too many physical activities until after the appeal. Why? Kelly was confused. The last thing you want is for him to get injured, and they try to claim abuse. Derek scowled. It's rare, but it happens. What? Kelly was incensed. That's crazy. Who would do that? Angry and desperate people, Derek supplied. And they are both of that. Any other advice you can think of? Dylan inquired. He appreciated that Derek was helping them. Get married, he advised. I know technically you already are. However, having a planned celebration with your family and friends will help cement the relationship in the eyes of the court. They want to see you guys making success of the marriage. So throw a good wedding. Do the honeymoon. You have to seem like any other couple. Go to events together. Do family things together. Get a dog. Get a dog? That's advice? Dylan had to smile at that. The judge might talk to the kids to see how things are going. The kids are going to have to get along. Derek smiled ruefully. I always tell blended families to get a dog or two. That way the kids have something to concentrate on rather than becoming jealous about the stepkids spending time with mommy or daddy. It saves a lot of marriages. Good advice, Dylan conceded. He looked at Kelly. Shall we get a dog? Why not? Kelly felt overwhelmed. She hugged herself and tried not to lean on Dylan. The fact that he had his hand on her back was a comfort, but what she really wanted to do was just hold on to him and hide from everything that was happening. Bentley's always wanted one, but I worked too much and the apartment was so small. Would Caden and Avery like a dog? I'm sure they would be thrilled, Dylan admitted. Can we go see Bentley now? Kelly asked. What was she going to tell her son? It wasn't every day a person got married. She supposed they were going to move in with Dylan. Derek had said they should share a room. How was she going to sleep in the same bed with the man beside her all night long? Planning a wedding and a honeymoon? It was happening too fast. Let's go. Dylan thanked Derek again, then steered her to the room where Bentley was waiting so they could collect her son. Bentley looked up from coloring and immediately ran to give Kelly a hug. Mom! She hugged him fiercely. She had only had the two supervised visits since Thanksgiving. Kelly missed her son. She tried, unsuccessfully, not to cry on him. Am I coming home? Grandma and Grandpa want me to live with them, but I don't want to, Bentley rushed to say. I want to stay with you. I'm glad you want to stay with me. Kelly wiped her eyes and smiled. That's a good thing, because I'm keeping you. Promise? Bentley asked. Totally pinky swear, Kelly responded as she hugged him harder. Okay, okay, he squirmed in her arms. When can we go? Hi, Mr. Ramsley. Hi, Bentley, Dylan answered. I'd like it if you would call me Dylan, please. Mom said I wasn't supposed to, Bentley frowned. It's not polite. Things have changed, Dylan explained. I think it would be okay if you used my first name. Kelly nodded as Bentley looked to her for confirmation. It's okay. We have some news, Dylan said. Bentley looked at them expectantly. The judge was a little concerned about where we were living, Kelly started. He also didn't like that I didn't have a job currently. I like that you don't have a job, Bentley said. You've been able to spend more time with me. It's nice. Kelly sniffed. Her voice was choked up as she replied, I love spending time with you too, Bent. And your mom is going to be able to spend even more time with you because she won't have to get a job, Dylan inserted quietly. Really? Brentley frowned. That'd be great, but how are we going to pay the bills? I am going to pay them, Dylan said. I've asked your mom if she and you would like to come live with me. The judge married us today, so now we're part of a family. Kelly waited tensely for Bentley's reaction. Does that mean Avery and I are brothers? Bentley asked. Stepbrothers, Dylan supplied. You will have your own bedroom. You can still go to school at Livingston Academy. And Mom will be there, too, Bentley questioned. Absolutely, Kelly smiled. It'll be fun. I can spend more time with you, and you like Avery, right? Bentley nodded. This is cool. Kelly breathed a sigh of relief. She had hoped Avery and Caden would be on board with this unexpected marriage as well. It would make it so much easier if all the kids got along. They decided to drop by Kelly's apartment to pick up some necessities before going to Dylan's house. 
That way, Bentley could see his room, whilst they could tell Caden and Avery the news. Kelly felt nervous about how Dylan's sons might react, but pushed the thought out of her mind. She resolved to focus on one thing at a time until she felt more comfortable with the situation. As they were leaving the courthouse, a crowd of people met them on the steps. A couple of flashes went off, and someone pushed a recording device in Kelly's face. "'What is your name?' "'Kelly?' Kelly trailed off. She looked in confusion at Dylan, whose face was impassive as he tried to steer them through the crowd. "'Is it true? Are you now married to Dylan Ramsley?' Another person was holding a cell phone, videotaping and asking Dylan, "'Were you really kidnapped, Mr. Ramsley? What did they demand for your freedom?' No comment, Dylan repeated again and again in response to their questions. Mom, who are these people? Bentley asked. Kelly could barely hear him over the crowd, all pressing in around them. She grabbed Bentley's hand tightly, fearing of losing him in the throng of people. I think they're reporters, honey. Dylan managed to get them to the street and opened the door of a waiting cab. They quickly got in. "'Excuse me, sir,' the cabbie responded. "'I'm waiting for another fare. A lady called.' "'You will have to miss it.' Dylan plucked some money out of his wallet and put it onto the tray. "'That's your tip if you take us to where we wish to go.' The cabbie's eyes widened as he counted the amount. "'Where to?' Kelly set the last of her clothes in the drawer in the master bedroom. Dylan had more than sufficient room in the large walk-in closet. As it was, she had less clothes than her new husband, as most of her wardrobe consisted of nursing scrubs. She had boxed them and put them in a corner of the closet because she really didn't know if she would need them again. The apartment that she had rented had come partially furnished. All the big items had been her landlord's. There were a few smaller items, linens and such, but compared to what Dylan already had, they seemed shabby. Kelly had ended up donating them after asking Tiana what she wanted. The only thing she took besides clothes, photo books, necessities, and an old baby blanket of Bentley's was a cup she had gotten from the group of nurses at Mercy. The cup had a saying on it, Nurses make all the difference. It was cheesy, but Kelly put it in the master washroom along with her meager supply of toiletries. She had a feeling cohabitating with Dylan was going to be a lot like sharing the tent. Only the bed was a lot bigger. Maybe she would manage to stay on her own side. Kelly opened her banking app on her phone. She needed to change her address. What she saw inside stunned her. It couldn't be right. Kelly checked the figures again and decided she knew exactly who the culprit was. She marched out of the bedroom. Dylan! Kelly came to the office with her phone. She was upset. What am I supposed to do? Excuse me? He looked up from his spreadsheets with a frown. Do about what? You paid my loans, Kelly stated. Everything. The student debt, the medical debts, everything I was behind in, you paid off. Now there's money in my account which wasn't there before. I thought you might want something for expenses. Dylan was a little confused. Is there a problem with that? It's too much. Kelly waved the phone around. What am I supposed to do? He shrugged. Whatever you like. My mother always said that a woman should have money of her own to do with as she wanted. If you would like to do a little redecorating or purchase something, you shouldn't have to ask for the cash. Now it's right there in your accounts. Plus, I set up an education fund for Bentley. You don't understand, she exclaimed. I was supposed to pay off those debts. Kelly. Dylan sighed. Even if you earn top rate as a nurse and work crazy hours without paying any housing costs, it would take you until retirement to pay off those bills. Plus, you would never have spent any time with Bentley. I have enough money to easily erase them. It wasn't an imposition. It's too much, she repeated. A tear trailed down her face. How am I ever going to repay you for this, for Bentley's custody, for everything? Dylan stood and carefully wiped away the tear. He didn't like to see her upset. Just be yourself. You are great with Caden and Avery. You make the house a little happier. That's not enough, Dylan, Kelly stated firmly. You just fixed my entire financial life. I don't know what I can do in return. You don't have to do anything in return, Dylan frowned. 
You gave me a savings account, she shrugged, overwhelmed and uncertain. I have never had one. Did you say you set up a college fund for Bentley? I did, he confirmed, a little worried that she might start crying for real. She looked like she was on the edge of doing so. I also put you on my gold card. Yours should be coming by special courier. Gold card? Kelly frowned and sniffed. I have awful credit. Not any more. It's fixed, Dylan replied. By blending their accounts, he had taken a bit of a hit in his, but he didn't think he should tell her that. Over a couple years, their credit score could return to pristine. I don't want you to have to worry about money ever again. A couple more tears made an appearance as Kelly stared at the screen of her phone. Bentley can go to college? Anyone he wants to, provided he gets good marks, Dylan promised. He reached out to wipe away her tears, but suddenly she was hugging him. Dylan paused, surprised. He gently embraced her, letting her cry on him. Other women would take the money as their due for marrying him, he reflected. Kelly was worried about paying him back or finding a way to thank him on equal measure. It was refreshing that it had never occurred to her to ask him to retire her debts. He also had a feeling that he was going to be pushing her to spend any of the money that he had given her. Dylan leaned down and pulled her a little closer. She might not think so, but right now this was thanks enough. Dylan breathed in the scent of her and rubbed her back. She gave a watery laugh as she let him go, wiping her eyes. I'm sorry. Kelly, don't, Dylan said. You don't need to apologize. I'm a mess, Kelly hiccuped. I will get better after I get some sort of routine. You are doing just fine, he reassured her. What's this? Kelly spotted a paper on his desk. It had pictures of them at the courthouse and a few others. She frowned as she looked at them. Is that a picture of Tomlin throwing you in the trunk of a car? It's a mock-up of tomorrow's tabloids. A friend sent it along. Dylan sighed. It doesn't look too good. Ramsley drama continues with kidnapping, marriage, and custody battle, Kelly read in horror. This time, it looks like Dylan Ramsley, son of Robert Ramsley of Ramsley Insurance Corp., has entered the fray of family drama? They can't print this, can they? I expect it will be worse by the time morning comes, Dylan said dryly. It sells more copies. Kelly remembered when she had read the tabloid drama about Michael and Anne, how excited she had been to know someone who was in the papers. Now she was in the papers herself and wished desperately that she wasn't. I am so sorry, Dylan. Why? he shrugged. You didn't personally send the pictures to them. Someone from the courtroom did, though. He pointed to one of them at the front of the courtroom, him putting a ring on her finger. Kelly looked at the angle of it. Could it have been the Islingtons? I don't think any of my friends would have done this. I'm wondering if it wasn't their lawyer. By stirring up the tabloids, she can make us look bad in court, Dylan surmised. That's despicable, Kelly frowned. Miss Stone seems to be the type who only wants to win. Dylan took the paper out of Kelly's hands and tossed it in the garbage. We will make sure that doesn't happen. How can you be so sure? she asked. Kelly wished she had his confidence. Remember when you told me I was doing a good job being a dad at Avery's birthday party? He waited for her to nod. You are a great mom. The judge will recognize that. Kelly smiled lopsidedly. Thank you. Now I'm going to brave the bedtime routine and make sure the kids have brushed their teeth. Care to come? He asked her. Absolutely, Kelly responded. I like these new odds, Dylan said as they came out of his office. It used to be two to one against me. Now I get to share, so it's more like one and a half to one. Doesn't that make my odds worse since I was even with Bentley? Kelly frowned in mock seriousness. I guess it does, Dylan shrugged. Too bad for you. Hey, Kelly laughed. That's not very nice. Who said I was nice? Dylan grinned, pleased that he had distracted her from the tabloid fiasco. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please subscribe to this channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 8 Kelly had been getting into a routine. 
It didn't make sense for her to see the boys to school since Dylan could drop them off and pick them up on way to and from work, so she waved goodbye to them at the home and happily chatted with them when they returned. Maria was the one who grocery shopped and cleaned. Kelly put down her foot at cooking. She needed something to do and so expanded the weekly grocery list and took over the cooking. She filled her evening hours with the kids, doing homework, playing games, being a general nuisance to them as she learned more about Caden and Avery. Yet, during the school day itself, she was bored. Two weeks into her marriage, and she had cabin fever. Anne, Michael's wife, called Kelly. She wanted Kelly's professional opinion about something, and Kelly jumped at the chance to get out of the house. Kelly reflected that she was probably the only nurse Anne knew. However, Kelly was glad to help Anne out. She had enjoyed being Michael's nurse at the hospital after he had surgery years before. She also envied the couple a little for the love that they had. Thank you for coming, Anne let Kelly in. I'm sorry for making you come out all this way. It's fine, I'm happy to help. Kelly looked at the house. Your home is beautiful. Thank you. Anne gave a half-hearted smile. Michael is picking Amy up from daycare, so we will have a little time alone. Kelly looked more closely at Anne. She seemed exhausted. There were dark circles under her eyes. Want to tell me what's going on? Anne motioned her to the kitchen. Tea? Coffee? Coffee. Kelly removed her winter wear and followed Anne as she set up the coffee maker. Kelly hopped on one of the breakfast bar stools, waiting patiently. I don't know why I called you, really. Anne had a little laugh. I just thought, since you're a nurse, you could give me your opinion on whether this was important enough to see the doctor about. Actually, Michael suggested it. Okay. Kelly prompted with a friendly smile. I'm all ears. For the past year, we have been trying IVF. Anne leaned against the counter. We were hoping to give Amy a sibling, but it hasn't been working out. The first one didn't take. We had a heartbeat with the second treatment, but it disappeared. Kelly watched Anne struggle for composure. She waited rather than offer sympathy. Anne wanted to talk, not cry right now, so she would respect that. Anne took a deep breath. The third treatment didn't seem to take either. I had my monthly afterwards, so I know it didn't work. I didn't bother to go back to the doctor's office. We just phoned it in. Michael and I agreed that this was the last treatment since I found it so difficult after the second time. Only now I'm feeling horrible. Really horrible physically, and I don't know why. What are your symptoms? Kelly asked gently. I'm tired all the time. My lower back hurts. I feel like I have a brick in my stomach. I'm bloated up like a balloon, so nothing fits, Anne complained. I want to cry at everything. Yesterday I was making casserole and burst into tears. It's ridiculous, and I'm scaring Michael. At first I thought it has to be a type of withdrawal from all the hormones I was on, but it just keeps getting worse. Have you had your monthly since? Kelly questioned. No, Anne flushed. She sighed. I think I'm having the change. You mean menopause? Kelly looked at her. How old are you? Forty-five, she replied. She grabbed mugs and poured out coffee, handing one to Kelly. It's possible, Kelly allowed as she stirred sugar into her coffee. She frowned as she watched Anne heap in sugar and cream. Did you always take that much sugar and cream? Huh? Anne looked down at her coffee in surprise. No, I just really crave sweet things lately. I've gained weight, too, which I don't understand because I'm throwing up all the time. I can't keep anything heavy down. Anne, how did you feel when you were pregnant with Amy? Kelly asked. She had a small suspicion. Great. Anne smiled at the memory. It was wonderful. I knew right away before the tests came back. I had all this energy. It was the best pregnancy ever. How long have you been feeling this way? Kelly inquired. A little over two months now? Anne wiped away a tear. I don't want it to be the change. I don't want to be that old yet. I know it's useless to fight against it, and it will come whenever it does. I just feel embarrassed. That's why I haven't gone to the doctor. Kelly nodded in sympathy. A lot of women felt that way. It could be the change. It could be a couple of other things which would require you to go to the doctor to find out. However, I think it's probably something else. What? Should I be worried? 
Anne questioned nervously. Kelly shook her head. I think you should get a pregnancy kit. I still have one in the washroom for when we were trying. Anne was confused. I can't be pregnant. Why not? Kelly tilted her head. You've just described a number of pregnancy symptoms. But we can't. That's why we were doing IVF. After Amy, nothing was happening, Anne explained. Plus, I feel awful. Not every pregnancy is the same, Kelly advised. Some women feel awful the entire time. Some just for the first trimester. Some feel wonderful like you did with Amy. Were you doing IVF to conceive Amy? No, she was our miracle baby. A girl when the Ramsleys tend to have boys. Anne shook her head. But I had my period after the last IVF. Kelly smiled. The hormones were still in your system. I'm guessing you may have conceived directly after that period. You could be about six weeks along. And many women experience stronger symptoms of pregnancy if they are carrying multiples, which is a possibility since you are taking fertility treatments. Twins? Anne blinked and wiped away another set of tears. Really? It's only a possibility, Kelly cautioned. You need to pee on that stick and then we'll be able to rule it out or confirm it. You will need to go to the doctor either way. If you are not pregnant, it could be a cyst or that you are starting menopause. If it is the change, there are ways to alleviate those symptoms and make you feel more comfortable. However, pregnancy is my guess. Don't I have to wait until morning? Anne touched her abdomen gently. Nope. You're probably far enough along that it should be able to detect the right hormones, Kelly said. What if I'm not? Anne asked softly. You won't know until you take the test, Kelly reasoned. If it's negative, we will eat all the ice cream in the freezer and watch whatever movie you'd like to cry over. I have all afternoon since Dylan's picking up the boys. Boys? I thought you just had Bentley. Anne frowned. Who is Dylan? Oh, Kelly flushed guiltily. I guess I haven't said anything yet. Don't worry, I promise your invitation is coming. Invitation? Anne raised an eyebrow. Have you met someone? It's sort of complicated. Kelly raised her left hand. We are going to have a celebration, though, so everyone can come and celebrate? Anne gasped and grabbed her hand, looking at the gold band. You got married? Yup. Kelly tried to smile. Where's the engagement ring? Anne frowned. Who is he? You said boys. Does he have kids? He has two boys. It was pretty much a non-existent engagement, since it was a sudden marriage, and he's really wonderful, Kelly answered. He was really wonderful. He just didn't want her. Who is he? Anne asked. You said his name was Dylan? Dylan Ramsley, Kelly whispered and tried to judge Anne's reaction. She looked a little shocked. Dylan Ramsley? Michael's cousin? Kelly nodded. The one they said would never get married again, Anne said. Ouch, Kelly winced. I'm sorry. Anne immediately apologized. I shouldn't have said that. I am so sorry. It's just... He's been so caught up about his wife and daughter's death that no one thought he would. Surprise! Kelly gave a half-smile, half-grimace. Dylan doesn't do things without thinking them through, Anne stated firmly. Michael and I didn't even know that you two were dating. We didn't, Kelly said honestly. You didn't date? You just got married? Anne was more confused than ever. Kelly sighed and then told Anne everything meeting Dylan at Livingston Academy, the camping trip, the custody battle, and how they had ended up married for Bentley's sake. By the time she was finished, she felt miserable. Now we're married. We haven't talked about what we're going to do after the custody hearings are over. I'm hoping he won't want a divorce. I don't want to divorce him. It's silly because I don't really know him, but I like him so much. Anne reached out and took Kelly's hand in sympathy. What are you going to do? Kelly wiped away a stray tear. I don't know. Hopefully I can make him happy enough in the meanwhile that he will see the advantages of staying married to me. I will help however I can, Anne said firmly. We are friends, and now you are family. Thanks, but I'll be fine, Kelly put on a brave smile. Now, enough about me. Go pee on a stick and put us out of our suspense. While you do that, I'm going to explore this beautiful home you have. Anne nodded and headed to the washroom. Kelly finished her coffee and began exploring the house. It really was exquisite. 
right on the beach and very large. She smiled over Amy's room, decorated so girly. Kelly enjoyed looking at the beach and the surf for a moment. She wandered into a study. It was impressive with all the books lining the shelves. A piece of paper caught her eye. It was wedged between two of the shelves near the base. It looked like it might have fallen out of a stack of papers when somebody was moving them, and it accidentally ended up there without anyone noticing. Kelly bent down and gently worked it out. It took a bit because the paper clip kept getting stuck. Finally, she had it. There were three papers and a picture attached via the paper clip. The photo was of a boy, perhaps the same age as Caden. He looked so very much like Michael. Kelly looked at the papers. Dear Michael, I would like to thank you for the monthly payments you make for Daniel's support. He was able to go on that ski trip with his friends. Danny's doing excellent in school with all A's, as you can see by the attached report card. He's been doing classes ahead of his year with wonderful results. Kelly dropped the papers as Anne came into the room. I can't look. Anne swallowed and pressed a hand to her abdomen. I left it in the bathroom. Please, can you tell me what it says? Sure. Kelly scooped up the papers. She tried to go past Anne, however, she held out a hand and stopped her. What is that? Anne asked curiously. Nothing. Kelly knew she was an awful liar. Guilt was written all over her face. Kelly? She closed her eyes and sighed. Kelly knew Anne would have to be told. There was no way that Kelly could hide this from her. She just wished she hadn't been the one to let Anne know. I just found them. It looks like they had been accidentally dropped between two of the shelves. Anne gently pried the paper from Kelly's fingertips. She opened them up and began to scan the letter. Maybe it was cowardly, but Kelly went to check on the pregnancy kit. The stick showed the results and Kelly felt some trepidation. This might not be a good time for such news especially when it looked like Michael had a son from an affair a while ago. She wondered if Anne knew. Kelly doubted it from the way Anne had been reading the letter. Reluctantly, Kelly exited the washroom and approached Anne, who was still reading the letter. Anne seemed remarkably calm as she looked up from the papers to Kelly. What does it say? Congratulations? Kelly pasted on a sickly smile. You're pregnant. Anne burst into tears and crumpled to the floor, holding the letter. Oh, boy. Kelly quickly sat down and hugged Anne, who cried on her. He never told me, she wailed, all this time, and I never knew he had a son. No wonder he wasn't worried about continuing IVF. Here I am, stupid me, wanting to give him a son, a boy for his own, and he had one already. Maybe there's some mistake. Kelly suggested hopefully, even as she thought it was unlikely. No, Anne grabbed Kelly harder. He's been supporting this kid for years. I didn't realize it because the money goes to some small-town furniture store. I handle our finances since Michael is no longer able to. I always thought he was paying off a piece of custom furniture, but it's right there on the letterhead. Danny's mother owns or works at the store, and the money is for his son. Anne sobbed uncontrolled on Kelly. Wondering if she should, Kelly grabbed her phone and quickly snapchatted a picture of them to Michael. He needed to come home and explain, to fix things with Anne. Kelly rubbed Anne's back. It was obvious that the affair had taken place before Anne's marriage to Michael, but still he should have told her. It didn't take long for Michael and Amy to come home. He looked worried and confused by Anne's reaction until Kelly handed him the papers that she had found. He grimaced at the photo of Danny and went to his safe, putting in the numbers by memory. Michael grabbed out a large envelope, sat down on the floor with them, and searched the contents before pulling out a sheaf of papers and thrusting them at Kelly. What are all these? Kelly had copies from at least a dozen birth certificates in her hands. She sorted through them. What am I looking for? Anne lifted her head and wiped her eyes, staring at the papers. David Michael Ramsley, Jana Colburn Ramsley, Andrew Colburn Ramsley. Hey, that was the guy from the hospital, Kelly interrupted. He looked just like Max. Michael pointed lower on the birth certificate. Date of birth? Anne questioned. Michael shook his head in the negative and made some gestures with his hands. Daddy, 
Amy piped up, interpreting her father's gestures as she watched the adults. He means Daddy. Kelly looked at the father's name written on the sheets of paper. They all say David Michael Ramsley. What? Anne grabbed some of the sheets, looking for herself. Daniel David Wells Ramsley, Father David Michael Ramsley, Mother Sarah Donna Wells. Who is David Michael Ramsley? Kelly asked. Michael's father. Anne looked at her husband for the first time since his arrival. She shook her head in amazement. Michael, these are all your half-siblings? He nodded grimly. He wasn't particularly proud of the fact. Wow, Kelly said in surprise. Your dad really got around. Michael scowled and nodded again. So he's not... Danny isn't yours, Anne asked in a guilty yet hopeful manner. Michael shook his head vehemently no. He motioned in their sort of sign language that he would have told her. Anne burst into happy tears and hugged him. Michael rolled his eyes, but he kissed Anne's temple and held on to her. "'I have a question,' Amy returned. Kelly was surprised that none of them had noticed the four-year-old leave the room and return. "'What's your question, honey?' Kelly asked. She thought how their daughter was absolutely adorable and felt a yearning for one of her own. Maybe, in a couple of years from now, if she and Dylan were still together, she could convince him to expand their small family. Kelly really hoped that might happen. "'What's this?' Amy held up the pregnancy stick in her little hand. "'That is to tell if your mommy is going to have a baby,' Kelly grinned. "'She has to get it confirmed by the doctor, but it looks like you're going to have a baby brother or sister.' "'When? Will Santa put him under the tree at Christmas?' Amy excitedly asked in her high little voice. Kelly laughed, not exactly. She looked at Anne and Michael, who were totally ignoring them as the pair happily soaked in the news. Michael gave Anne a questioning look. She nodded with a smile, and he held her even closer. Kelly rolled her eyes. Why don't you show me your room, Amy? I'll explain a little about what you have to look forward to. Okay. Amy grabbed Kelly's hand, pulling her along. She wrinkled her nose. They're weird sometimes. Kelly laughed again. Yes, they are. However, they both love you very much. I know, Amy said confidently. I love them, too. Want to see my horsey collection? Wow, how did you know I love horsies? Kelly asked. She kept up the chatter with Amy so that Michael and Anne could have some much-needed time together. How did it go with Anne? Dylan asked as he sorted through some mail. Really well, Kelly set the table. Part of her plan to get Dylan to want her to stay was to give home-cooked meals every night. She knew Maria used to make from frozen meals that Dylan had just had to heat up, but Kelly hoped that he would enjoy her cooking more. I was thinking that maybe the way to go would be to freelance on my nursing skills. There are lots of women who might want to talk to a nurse privately. Go into business for yourself? Dylan said absently, frowning over a paper. Yes, Kelly nodded. I could charge decently and work less hours, which means I would see Bentley more. You know you don't have to work, right? Dylan asked. There's no reason for you to have a job unless you want one. I have just never not worked. Kelly shrugged as she put down utensils. I'm not sure what to do with my time. I'm just saying you don't have to do it for the money, Dylan stated. If you want to start a business or go back to school or just sit around in your pajamas, it's okay. Kelly laughed. I am not going to sit in my pajamas all day. What would your housekeeper say? I'm not sure, Dylan smiled. Whatever you want to do, I will support you. If you need any help, just let me know. I think I will do some research now to see if it's even possible, Kelly said. Otherwise, I will start baking again and end up gaining pounds. Baking? Dylan looked at her hopefully. Maria isn't a great baker. I used to bake a lot until I was working all the time. Kelly smiled. Didn't everyone say that the way to a man's heart was food? Maybe she'd found her secret weapon to making Dylan decide he couldn't live without her. She decided baking was plan A in her campaign to win Dylan over. However, I do find that when I bake, I gain weight. That's fine. The boys and I will gain weight with you, Dylan assured her. Caden's too thin anyways. Kelly shook her head. She was about to start putting the hot food on the table when the doorbell rang. I wonder who that is. Dylan frowned as he went to the door. She could hear him greeting someone. Kelly used oven mitts to take the roasting pan out of the oven. 
Here, let me close the oven door for you, a woman said. Thank you. Kelly set the pan on the top of the stove. She was a little surprised that this stranger had come directly into the kitchen. Kelly took off her oven mitts and offered a hand in greeting. Hi, I'm Kelly. Beverly. She shook Kelly's hand. Robert is just talking to Dylan in the foyer. This smells very good. Did you make it yourself? Yes. Kelly smiled a bit uncertainly at Beverly. I got the recipe from Good Housekeeping a few years ago. You can never go wrong with recipes from that magazine. Beverly began helping to transfer the cooked food to serving bowls. Now, if I understand correctly, you have a son. Bentley, Kelly supplied. Excuse me, but exactly how do you know Dylan? Oh, Beverly gave a guilty little laugh. I'm Dylan's mother. How nice to meet you. Kelly felt a little overwhelmed. She hadn't dressed up, done her makeup, or prepared Bentley for a visit from Dylan's parents. However, she did the only thing she could, asking, Would you like to stay for dinner? That would be lovely, Beverly smiled. Thankfully, she had some dinner rolls, the makings for a quick salad, and dessert hadn't been cut yet, so Kelly could stretch the food for her two unexpected guests. Beverly was helpful, but needed instruction as she admitted to having a chef do everything for her. I admire a woman who is able to use her own kitchen, she laughed as she set the table with two new place settings. Personally, the closest I get is discussing the week's menu with Pierre. Kelly smiled uneasily. She didn't really know what to say to that. Fortunately, the boys all showed up like magic since they could smell the food and were hungry as always. Caden and Avery greeted their grandparents with enthusiasm. Bentley was a little more cautious, but polite which Kelly was very proud and grateful for. She really wanted to make a good first impression. Robert, when Kelly met him, was a dark replica of Dylan. Kelly could see where her husband got his good looks from and his dark blonde coloring from his mother. Dylan made the introductions, and Kelly was treated to a firm handshake. After everyone sat down, they passed the food around. Kelly made it herself, Beverly told her husband. It tastes wonderful. Robert said dutifully. Thank you, Kelly smiled at the compliment. What I would like to know is how my son acquired a wife, and we had to find out the news from the morning tabloids. Robert took a bite of pot roast and raised an eyebrow. Dad, maybe we should wait until after dinner to discuss this, Dylan said evenly. Robert ignored the remark. Felt a little foolish this morning when my secretary congratulated me on my son's marriage. I assured her it that was all an error. After all, I would have thought that we would have been invited to the wedding. There was nothing like a parent to make a person feel guilty like a naughty child, Kelly thought. It was my fault. Kelly, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but it takes two people to get married, Dylan responded wryly. What he said, Robert pointed a fork at Dylan. Dylan, care to explain? It might be best if we waited until after dinner, Robert, Beverly cautioned. The boys are here. All three were listening avidly, Kelly reflected. It was our decision, Dylan said simply. We will have a celebration later where everyone will be invited. Did you at least get a prenup? Robert asked. Dylan didn't answer. Robert looked pointedly at Kelly. I don't think so, Kelly shrugged. It had all happened so fast. She had never had a prenup with Christopher, so she didn't even know what one looked like. Robert put down his utensils and looked at Dylan in disgust. He gad, boy. I knew you were a little different, but I never thought you were stupid. Dylan stood abruptly. My office. Robert watched Dylan walk away. He wiped his lips with his napkin and followed. Beverly smiled. Dessert? Your husband just called your son stupid, and you're asking about dessert? Kelly said in disbelief. I thought it would distract the little ones, Beverly said. Grandma, I don't think any of us are little anymore, Caden gave her a look of reproach. Kelly took a deep breath. Okay, I am going to make this into a learning point. Boys, don't ever call anyone stupid. It's not nice. You wouldn't like it if someone called you stupid. You especially wouldn't like it if your dad or I called you stupid, right? They nodded. I might say that I think you could do better, Kelly continued, or that what you did wasn't a good idea. 
However, I will never call you stupid, and I expect all of you to never do that either. I expect each of you to be a proper gentleman, okay? They nodded again. Does this mean Grandpa isn't a gentleman? Avery asked. It means he wasn't nice, Kelly stated firmly. She didn't look at Beverly as she began collecting plates. I'm sure all of you know it, but I'm going to say it anyways. Your father is not stupid. He's very smart to do the job that he does. He's also a good dad. Mom, I have a question, Bentley said. Sure, Bent, ask away, Kelly responded. I already have a grandpa and grandma. What am I to call these grandparents, he wondered. That's a really good question, Kelly paused. Why don't you call his grandpa and grandma Ramsley, Beverly said softly. Bentley nodded. Okay. Your mother's right, Beverly agreed. It wasn't nice of grandpa to call your father stupid. Nor was it right. Thank you, Kelly was grateful. I made apple pie for dessert. I think we may even have some ice cream. That sounds lovely. Beverly smiled at the peace offering. We'll have to save a piece for Robert and Dylan. They enjoyed the dessert. The boys helped bring their plates to the dishwasher, then ran off to play. Beverly helped with the rest of the cleanup. Do you know, when I first got here, I didn't know how to run a dishwasher? Kelly asked. I had never had one before. I have to confess, I still don't know how to run one, Beverly smiled. Well, I put too much soap in it. Kelly shut the appliance door and set it to run. I had soap suds flowing out of the machine halfway across the kitchen. My goodness! Beverly pressed a hand to her mouth. What did you do? Kelly grinned. I had to mop the floor six times before it stopped being sticky. Then I washed the dishes by hand. Since then, I've had Maria teach me how the fine art of dishwashers. Beverly smiled. I'm sorry we dropped in uninvited. I'm not, Kelly shrugged. I needed to get to know you at some point. You know, you are nothing like they said you would be. Beverly looked a little puzzled. Excuse me? Kelly was feeling a little confused herself. Margaret and Terence Islington. Robert contacted them when we learned about your marrying Dylan, Beverly explained. They said you were a gold-digging hussy and that we had better pry you away from Dylan as quickly as possible. Kelly sighed. They aren't exactly paragons themselves. Beverly? Would you like to talk some sense into our son? Robert stood in the kitchen doorway. Excuse me. Beverly gave Kelly a smile before leaving. Kelly watched Robert as he studied her in return. A hundred grand. Pardon? Kelly questioned Robert's abrupt remark. If you will sign a post-nuptial agreement that you will only take a hundred grand upon the dissolution of this marriage, I'll give you a hundred grand right now, Robert stated. No, Kelly said firmly. Three hundred. No. Fine. I will give you half a million, but not a cent more. It's more than fair, Robert said. Most of Dylan's assets are tied up and could take some time to liquidate in a divorce. This would be money in hand if you sign a contract. No, Kelly crossed her arms. I don't want a single cent from you, nor will I take a penny if I divorce your son. Can I get that in writing? Robert asked. Do whatever you want. Kelly brushed past him. I intend to make this marriage work. Seeing Dylan in the foyer with Beverly, she walked up to them and took Dylan's arm. Is everything okay? Dylan asked her. Sure. Kelly smiled sweetly. Your father was reminding me how much he loves you and asked me to look after you. Isn't that right, Robert? Dylan looked a little surprised, and Robert had the grace to look a little ashamed. They all said their goodbyes. That's not what he said, was it? Dylan asked after they had seen his parents off. No, but it was what he meant, Kelly replied. Robert had just been trying to protect Dylan. Maybe he'd gone about it the wrong way, but the sentiment was there. Do you know what Mom said about you? he asked. What? Kelly tilted her head to look at him. She likes you, Dylan smiled. I like her too. Do you know what else? Kelly grinned. What? Robert didn't get any pie, so you get two slices this evening. She led Dylan back to the kitchen. What kind of pie? Dylan asked with definite interest. Apple? Kelly responded. I'm starting to think I might be getting the better deal in this marriage. Dylan smiled. 
Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 9 Mom, it snowed! Bentley tore open their bedroom door and raced to the window to look at the white snow covering everything outside. Do you know where the sleds are? Bentley, I thought we talked about you just barging in here. Kelly moaned and put a hand over her eyes as she tried to wake up. You need to knock and get permission. There's snow outside. The first snow of the season. Bentley hopped on her side of the bed. Caden says the school is canceled because it's still coming down. They expect lots more. That's nice. Dylan popped a pillow over his head. We all get to sleep in. No. Bentley rolled his eyes. It's tradition that we get to go tobogganing. It is. Kelly sighed. Okay, I'm up. Get the others and meet me in the kitchen. Tobogganing? Dylan asked as Bentley raced out of the room. He lifted the pillow to look at her. I thought we weren't supposed to do anything strenuous with Bentley until after the custody hearing. We don't even know when the hearing is supposed to be, Kelly reasoned as she got up. Plus, it's tradition. How dangerous can tobogganing be? The snow is like one big pillow. Need reinforcements? He raised an eyebrow. Absolutely. Kelly smiled as she headed out of the bedroom to start breakfast. Remember to dress warm. An hour later, it was confirmed that the school really was cancelled. Everyone was fed, sleds and crazy carpets were found, and Dylan delegated his work to one of his employees. Kelly felt really good about this outing as a family. There was a hill right on the property, so they didn't even need to drive anywhere. It was a bit bigger than the public sledding hill in the park near Kelly's previous apartment, but Bentley was getting older, so she reasoned it had to be okay if Avery had done it last year. They had races down the hill. They ganged up on Dylan for a snowball fight. They made huge snowmen. Kelly broke out the thermos of hot chocolate that she had brought, and they enjoyed the beverages with a couple of cookies each. Kelly loved how it seemed like they were all gelling as a group. Even Dylan was having fun, she could tell. Maybe afterward they could drag out the Christmas tree and do some decorating. Then they decided to have one last run at the hill before going back to the house. It was going really well until Kelly's crazy carpet went out of control. She wasn't sure what she had done, but suddenly she was traveling down the hill backward. Kelly shrieked in laughter as she watched the guys get smaller as she picked up speed in the snow. Dylan was waving his arms and shouting something. What? Kelly yelled back, then suddenly her whole world changed. There must have been a rock under the snow, or a drift, because for a moment she was airborne before her back hit the trunk of a tree. The air left her body with a whoosh as she fell to the snow gasping. Kelly laid there, looking at the branches of a pine in the sky, trying to remain calm as her lungs worked to bring in air. Please be okay. Dylan stumbled and fell to his knees beside her. His hands shook as he tore off his gloves and gently touched her face. Caden, get my cell phone. It's on my dresser in the bedroom. She pulled in another shallow breath. It took a lot of effort. Kelly knew that she just knocked the wind out of herself. Nothing else seemed to hurt just yet but she couldn't speak because she wasn't getting enough air. Kelly tried to assure Dylan that she was okay. Even though her lips moved, there wasn't enough air to create the words. Dylan lost what little color he had. He looked so frightened. Kelly, please don't die. She wasn't going to. Kelly rolled her eyes at the silliness of what he had said. She moved her hand to touch his cheek. Dylan grabbed her hand to prevent her. Don't move, he cautioned. You could have a spinal injury. I'm fine, she managed to wheeze. She was starting to breathe a little easier now. Mom, Bentley called. Are you okay? Stay right there, Dylan said sternly. I want you and Avery to stay together where I can see you. Kelly turned her head to look at her son, yet Dylan stopped her again. Please, Kelly, stop moving. I'm okay. She smiled reassuringly, despite her faint voice. Just knock the air out of me. We will let the paramedics check you out as soon as Caden returns with my phone. Dylan brushed her hair out of her face. He seemed to have calmed down a little, but Kelly noticed that his hand was still shaking. I'm a nurse, Kelly stated calmly. I'm okay. You could have a concussion. Maybe whiplash or back injury. Dylan swallowed hard. 
Or you could be in shock and not know that you have a broken bone. Kelly laughed. I'm not in shock. I just needed a minute to breathe. Caden rushed to a stop beside them, holding out the phone. Here, are you okay? I'm great, Kelly smiled at the out-of-breath boy. If your dad would just let me up. You are getting checked. Dylan grabbed the phone. He was about to dial the number when Kelly grabbed it out of his hand. No, Kelly sat up. I am okay. I don't need you to call 911 for nothing. Kelly, you hit a tree, Dylan protested. You should have seen it, Kelly interrupted. You got air right before you hit the trunk. It was awesome. No, it wasn't, Dylan stated firmly. Go stand with your brothers. Caden rolled his eyes. So you two can argue? We aren't going to argue, Kelly said. Her back was a little sore. However, it was the last thing she was going to admit to Dylan. I don't need an ambulance. Let's just go up to the house so we can enjoy the rest of the day. Do you guys have a Christmas tree we can put up? In the storage room somewhere, Caden said. Can we have one this year, Dad? Kelly, Dylan sighed. She grabbed his face in her mitts and looked him in the eyes. I am perfectly fine. Take your brothers and go drag out the boxes of Christmas stuff. Dylan grimaced. Kelly and I will be along shortly. Grab the sleds. Don't forget to put all your wet stuff in the mudroom and change your clothes if they're wet. Kelly quickly said as Caden scooted off to collect Bentley and Avery. She grinned as they ran up the hill, pulling the sleds after them. You called them brothers. Well, they are. Dylan remarked dryly. We didn't even need the dog yet. Christmas, she smiled up at him. I was thinking we could rescue one from the pound at Christmas. Something already potty trained? Are you sure you want something without a pedigree? He frowned. Are you sure you want a perfectly good dog to get put down because we were snobs when we could have adopted it? She countered. Okay, you and I go to the pound. I'm not going to have three boys picking out three different dogs or something that is inappropriate, Dylan said. Agreed. Kelly found that an easy compromise. Now let's go up to the house. I'm starting to get cold sitting here in the snow. Dylan grabbed the cell phone out of her hand and put it in a pocket. You are not walking. I'll carry you. You don't need to, Kelly protested. I'm fine. If you feel the slightest twinge of pain, we are calling it in and getting you checked. Dylan ignored her protests and lifted her in his arms. He began the long slog through the snow back to the house. Kelly was short, but she wasn't exactly thin. She knew that she had put on a couple of pounds since she lost her job because she wasn't getting as much exercise a day. She wondered how long Dylan could manage under her weight. While he had proved he was fairly fit during the camping trip, she wasn't sure that he went to the gym very often. It seemed like he was more in the desk job now. Dylan gritted his teeth and ignored the remonstrations his mind was sending him for not keeping in shape. Sure, he ate okay and played with the boys, but he had neglected going to the gym or doing much activity. Spreadsheets didn't require a lot of physical effort. Neither did meetings or memos. He needed to get out more. Like today, which had been fun until that heart-stopping moment where Kelly had hit the tree. He felt scared just thinking about how close he had come to losing her. Possibly losing Bentley, too, since if Kelly died, it would be up in the air whether a court would award custody to the paternal grandparents or a stepdad. Kelly and he would have to discuss making a joint will. That was if he didn't have a heart attack before he got her to the house. Dylan tried to breathe evenly. He wasn't going to let Kelly know how much this was costing him. He could easily carry her for short distances. That wasn't the problem. It was more that there was snow he had to plow through, and it was uphill to the house, which wasn't exactly next door to the hill they had been using. Dylan vowed to get a gym membership, or buy some equipment and put it in the basement. There was tons of room in the house, like the storage room that was full of things, including the Christmas decorations. Decorations that hadn't been used since Shannon's death. He should have done Christmas properly for the boys, but he'd been selfish and wallowing in grief. He had been wrong to deny them that joy. I'm okay, Kelly said in his ear. You can put me down and we can both walk to the house. He had the feeling she was laughing a little at him. Dylan found he didn't mind because it meant that she was feeling better. Humor me. You are talking about my back, but yours is going to hurt if you keep carrying me.
Kelly advised softly. You're going to take the afternoon easy, sitting down all times, he puffed, to make the kids cater to you. What about you? Are you going to cater to me? She asked playfully. I'm carrying you, he reminded her. My back won't let me cater afterward. Ouch, Kelly laughed. Dylan couldn't stop his answering smile at their teasing banter. He had her push the doorbell until Avery came to let them in. They peeled off their outer layers in the mudroom. I really ought to clean up a bit in here, Kelly remarked at the coats and boots strewn across the floor with the snow. Tomorrow, Dylan said firmly. He picked her up and deposited her in an armchair in the living room where the boys had been dragging boxes of Christmas items to. He would do it later when she wasn't looking. Do you need anything? How are you feeling? Her back was sore, but okay, considering she had hit a tree at full speed, Kelly reasoned. There was no way she was going to let an overprotective Dylan know that. I'm good. You can get me some water if you would like. Dylan got her the water and watched as she exclaimed over the items the boys found in the boxes. They set up the Christmas tree and Kelly happily gave directions as the decorations began to find places to be during the holiday season. The boys were getting along wonderfully and included the box of meager Christmas items Kelly and Bentley had brought with them. Dylan managed to get the mudroom set to rights and make dinner for them all. They agreed to watch a movie before bedtime since everyone was pretty tired from tobogganing and decorating. All five of them piled onto the couch. Before the end of the movie, Dylan was carrying sleeping boys Bentley and Avery to their rooms. Caden just yawned and waved goodnight as he made his way to his own room. Kelly shut off the movie and started the dishwasher. Her back was still a little sore, but overall she felt fine. She stretched and went to their bedroom to get ready for bed. She yawned as she pulled on one of Dylan's oversized tees. It had been a really busy day. Kelly? In here, she called to Dylan as she brushed her hair. You shouldn't be up, he protested as he shut the bedroom door. How many times do I have to tell you that I am okay? Kelly put down the brush and gave him a hug for reassurance. She didn't know why he was treating her like she was fragile and close to breaking, but she was made of stronger stuff. You could have died today. His words were muffled in her hair. I didn't. Puzzled, Kelly pulled back a little to look at him. I'm right here. He framed her face in his hands. There was no hesitation as he kissed her urgently. Kelly threaded her hands through his hair, enjoying the feelings his kisses produced. All thoughts fled as he directed her back towards the bed. Don't wake your mom. Dylan shushed the boys and quickly loaded them up into the SUV. They would get breakfast on the way to school at the drive through He had left Kelly asleep in their bed. Part of him wanted to grin goofily at what had happened between him and Kelly last night. The other part wanted to run as fast as possible. When he'd seen her get hurt yesterday, it had knocked his entire world over. He barely knew Kelly, and yet his feelings were invested in her. It was downright scary. Dylan didn't want to feel things for her. He didn't want to like her, to be falling down the slippery slope to loving her. It was hard to protect oneself from hurt, from the uncertainties and cruelties of life when feelings were involved. He could have lost her yesterday. What would his kids do if they got attached to her and Kelly decided to leave after the custody issue with Bentley was sorted out? They had already lost a mother and a sister. Even if they didn't remember Wren, they did Shannon. Dylan wasn't sure he was ready for Kelly and Bentley to fill the holes his wife and daughter had left when they died. He had been a wreck when Wren died. Thank goodness for Max and other family. Dylan had neglected his kids while he had dealt with the grief and recriminations he felt. He had nearly been as bad when Shannon passed, even though they had known it was going to happen for years. Her slow descent hadn't made it any less painful. How would it be if he did lose Kelly? couldn't afford to get so attached. Dylan didn't want to go through all that pain again. He needed to be there for his kids to be a functioning dad. Last night had been a mistake. A wonderful, amazing mistake that he couldn't repeat if he meant to keep his head clear. Dylan sobered at the thought. Kelly was a vibrant person, and it would be hard not to get drawn in by her. He had to keep his distance from her, which would be difficult since Derek had advised them to share a bedroom. Hey, Dad! Caden called from the back seat. Yes? Dylan looked in the rear-view mirror at the kids. You missed the turn to our school, 
Caden pointed back along the road. With a start, Dylan realized Caden was correct. He managed a couple of turns to get them back on track. Dylan apologized for being distracted as he brought the boys into the school. "'It's cool, Dad,' Caden said confidently. "'If we happen to be late, we can truthfully blame you.' Dylan checked his watch. "'You are not late, and you have more than enough time to get to class, Caden.' "'Maybe.' Caden grinned as he raced down the hallway. "'Stop running!' Dylan sighed as he watched Caden join a group of kids. He knocked shoulders with his best friend, Cece, and immediately began chattering to her. Dylan could see by Caden's excited hand movements that his son was describing how Kelly had hit the tree yesterday. "'Dylan, how wonderful to see you today!' Susan Hythe purred as she approached. "'Susan,' Dylan said flatly, "'if you will excuse me, I need to get the boys to class.' She smiled. "'I was meaning to talk to you about the Christmas fundraiser.' "'Some other time,' he said as he grabbed Avery and Bentley's hands. "'It won't take but a few moments. "'Perhaps have you seen Avery to class?' "'Susan patted Avery on the head. "'It's so nice that your dad walks you to class. "'Look, he's taking your little friend along as well.' "'Dylan takes me to class a lot.' "'Bentley looked at Susan in confusion. "'Mr. Ramsley, dear.' Susan leaned down to Bentley's height as she tried to correct him. "'You should be calling him Mr. Ramsley.' "'That's not what my mom said,' Bentley frowned. "'I'm sorry, Susan. I'm not available after taking the boys to class.' Dylan decided to be direct. "'I need to get home to check on my wife. She had a bit of a spill yesterday.' "'Wife?' Susan straightened up briskly. "'Excuse me? When did that happen?' "'Recently?' Dylan smiled. He hoped she would stop trying to chase him now. Pardon me, I would hate for Avery and Bentley to be late for class. He brushed past Susan and dropped the boys off at the second grade. When Dylan returned home, he found Kelly in the kitchen rubbing her back as she grabbed a bowl of cereal for herself. I thought you said you weren't hurt. Dylan glowered as he put his keys away. It's just a twinge. I'm fine. Kelly had a dreamy smile on her face as she rose on her tiptoes to give him a lingering kiss. Dylan allowed it, savored it for a moment, before telling himself it was the last one. He needed to guard himself and his sons. Dylan hardened his heart. I thought I would work at home today, just to make sure you were okay. If you need anything, I will be in my office. What if I need you? Kelly smiled up at him and looped her hands around his neck. Kelly, Dylan gently disentangled himself from her. Last night was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. We barely know each other and shouldn't get involved right now, especially with Bentley's custody appeal coming up. Kelly frowned. He could see the hurt and confusion in her eyes. I don't understand. Did I do something wrong? No, Dylan took a deep breath. I can't do this right now. I can't become involved with you. I have to put Avery and Caden first. We don't know what's going to happen after the custody appeal, and I think it's best if we just go back to cohabitating. Cohabitating, she echoed. Yes, he nodded firmly. I think it's for the best. For the best, Kelly said in disbelief. I'm sorry, but I can't give you any more than that right now, Dylan said. When? When could you give me more? Kelly questioned, frowning. Dylan decided to avoid her question. I need to get to work. Excuse me. Kelly hugged herself. Dylan retreated to his home office. He closed the door, flicked on his laptop, and stared at the login screen. He had done the right thing, he told himself. It had been over two weeks, and he was avoiding her. He dropped off the kids and picked them up. Then he would spend hours out at the office or in his home office, barely surfacing for supper. Sometimes he played a game with the kids or made sure they did their bed routines. Other times he left it to her. Then she went to bed alone. Kelly wasn't sure where he was sleeping, but it wasn't with her. She had tried to talk to him, but he said he was swamped with work. Kelly didn't believe it for a moment. She was also worried because this went against the advice that Derek had given them. If the Islingtons found out, they could use it against them during the appeal. Kelly had baked up a storm, and while he had eaten, Dylan hadn't given any indication that he wanted to be with her because of her cooking. Plan A was failing. 
Plan B, enticing Herman with her sexy wiles, was a complete failure as well. She simply didn't have the confidence that other women had to put on lingerie and seduce her own husband. While other women might make it look amazing, Kelly looked at herself in the mirror, seeing short and rounded. Not exactly the woman of every man's dreams. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe he hadn't enjoyed their night together as much as she had. That was a lowering thought. Kelly needed a plan C pronto. She wanted to make this marriage work. Not because it was nice to have money for the first time in her life. She was actually a little scared of the amount in her bank account and had no wish to know the limit on the gold card. No, she just wanted to stay married to Dylan because she was afraid she might have fallen in love with him. It was all his fault. Dylan had stepped in like a fairy tale prince at the crucial moment to save her from the Islingtons and the mean Judge Bolan. How could a girl not fall in love with that? However, her rescue had been anticlimactic ever since he had decided they wouldn't suit after all. Not that Kelly was a princess, but what did a girl do in this situation? Kelly set her brush down and looked critically at herself in the bathroom mirror. Perhaps she would go and do that makeover that Tiana had suggested. She texted Tiana yet again to see if she wanted to come with her. Kelly frowned. Tiana hadn't responded to her voicemail or texts lately. She wondered what her friend was up to. Maybe they should get together for a girls' night, unless Tiana was too busy working. Sometimes Tiana did pick up extra shifts during the holiday season to make some cash. Kelly looked at the calendar as she brushed her teeth. It was the 15th already. She needed to get things set up for Christmas. She had no idea what to buy for Dylan, and the holiday was only ten days away. Wait a minute. The toothbrush hung in her mouth a moment as she flipped the calendar back, then forward to December. It couldn't be. She couldn't be. Could she? They had only been together that one night. Twice, her brain reminded her. Once with passion and once in exploration on the same night. Then Dylan had basically freaked and been mostly avoiding her in their bed since. He had buried himself in work. She was late. Kelly fought through the disbelief. It had taken months to get pregnant with Bentley. Then again, Christopher had been through radiation. She shouldn't be pregnant just from one night. That was extremely rare. Putting her hand gingerly to her abdomen, Kelly questioned if she felt any different lately. Other than being five days late, when normally she was like clockwork, Kelly felt the same. Maybe it was just all the stress of everything lately. She would have to buy a kit. The question was when Kelly could do it without Dylan noticing. The last thing she wanted with the upcoming appeal so close was him thinking he had to stay with her if she was pregnant. Kelly wanted Dylan to stay with her because he wanted to. What if he did regret their night? What if he didn't want any more kids? What if he wanted to divorce her? Kelly didn't have any of those answers. She popped the toothbrush out of her mouth and patted her stomach. It will be okay. It would have to be. She loved being a mom to Bentley, and she would love to be a mom to Dylan's child, too, if there was one. Kelly just didn't know how she was going to do it alone. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please click the bell for notifications so that you won't miss any videos. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 10 Did you two have a fight or something? Caden asked. What do you mean? Kelly frowned. She was a terrible liar and hoped he wouldn't ask anything that she wasn't prepared to talk about. You two were all googly-eyed at each other and now you are avoiding one another, Caden supplied as he munched on a cookie. We are working through some stuff, Kelly improvised. Is it anything we can help with? Cece asked. Not really. Kelly smiled at them. What are you guys studying in school lately? She changed the subject. Caden shared a look with Cece. Cece nodded. She must think we're not mature enough to handle it. I am right here. Kelly raised an eyebrow. Oh, good! You heard us! Cece cocked her head to the side. Want to unburden yourself and hear the wisdom of eleven-year-olds? Hey, I'm almost twelve. Caden protested. Seriously, though, we give good advice. Kelly sighed. It probably couldn't hurt. 
hit me with it. Okay, what is the underlying problem? If you don't know the problem, you can't fix it, Caden said wisely. I'm not sure what the exact problem is. Your dad won't talk about it, Kelly said truthfully. Then you need to talk to him and find out what it is, Cece licked her spoon. That seems reasonably simple, Kelly allowed. The answers to problems usually are, Caden added his opinion. You should go talk to him. Right now? Kelly was surprised. No use waiting, Cece replied. It only gets harder to do the longer you leave it. When did the two of you get so smart? Kelly shook her head in amazement. Caden shrugged. I think we have always been smart. That was modest, Cece laughed. He smiled sheepishly. That's why I hang out with you, to keep me humble. Go bug him, Cece waved Kelly away with a shooing motion. Wish me luck. Kelly put down her mug and headed to Dylan's home office. She knocked on the door before simply letting herself in. I was wondering if you wanted any hot chocolate. I made some for the kids. Not particularly. Dylan was distracted by a spreadsheet. Thanks for asking. Kelly closed the door behind her. We should talk. There is nothing to talk about, he continued looking at the screen of his computer. I'm busy right now. There's lots to talk about. Kelly took a deep breath. For instance, if we win the custody case, then what happens afterward? I thought it would be fairly obvious, he said disinterestedly. It's not obvious to me, and I would like to know your thoughts about it, she said firmly. Dylan sighed and tore his gaze away from the computer to look at her. Our living arrangement should probably stay the same for six months or so. Then we can quietly separate. After a year or two, we can obtain a divorce. A divorce, Kelly breathed. She felt like she had just hit that tree again. Yes. Dylan cleaned his glasses on the edge of his shirt. As we live in a no-fault state, you will receive half my assets. You will be able to care for Bentley financially, and there won't be any problems with the Islingtons trying for custody again. I don't want your money, Kelly said faintly. Since we didn't sign a prenup, the court is going to award it to you, he stated evenly. I said, I don't want it, Kelly repeated. I'm not going to take it. You don't really have a choice, Dylan said tiredly as he put his glasses back on. Actually, I do, she replied. I will just sign the contract your dad brought out when we met. Although I will ask for some alterations, such as not getting a single dime from you, plus generous repayment terms. Like you said, it's going to take me past retirement to pay back what you paid it off for me. Kelly, you don't need to pay me back, Dylan automatically said. He was angered by what his father had done. He wanted you to sign a contract? He loves you, Dylan. He wanted to protect you from gold-digging women like me. Kelly had a bitter laugh. The Islingtons didn't exactly give your dad a glowing report of their former daughter-in-law. You are not a gold digger. I know that. I don't want your money, Kelly sniffed. She blinked rapidly, trying to hold it together. She didn't want to cry right now. All I wanted was to be a good mom to Bentley, to your kids, to be a good wife, to believe that we might have been speaking the truth when we said those vows in front of the judge. I guess that was too much to ask for. It's unfair to ask that when you're just pushed into it, when you didn't want to be married to me. Kelly. Dylan stood, but he stopped when Kelly held out a hand to ward him off. Please don't. She shook her head and flashed him a brilliant smile. It's fine. I'll figure it out. Thanks for helping as long as you have. She didn't wait to hear what he had to say, but left the office as quickly as she could. Hey, guys. Kelly flashed Caden and Cece a bright smile. Would you mind keeping an eye on Bentley and Avery? Your dad is still in his office if you need him. Okay, Caden agreed. How did it go with Dad? Perfect, Kelly lied as she kept her smile firmly in place. Thanks for your help. Any time. Caden watched her grab her bag and get her coat. He turned to Cece. That went super bad. Do you think we should interfere? Cece asked. Yup. Caden got off his chair. He grabbed two cookies and went to Dylan's office. He didn't bother to knock, but let himself in and plopped down in one of the extra chairs. Caden tossed a cookie onto the desk. What's this about? Dylan looked at Caden. 
He wasn't in the best of moods after the confrontation with Kelly. He had known he was going to hurt her. What he hadn't expected was how much he hurt as well out of the process. That is probably the last homemade gingerbread cookie you will ever get, Caden said. Cece came and sat down in a chair as well, watching curiously. Why do you say that? Dylan shut the laptop to look at his son. Kelly made them. Caden bit into his cookie. I don't know what you said to her, but she is upset. Caden, we are not going to discuss this, Dylan frowned. Sure we are, Caden said easily. This affects us as a family. If you keep upsetting Kelly and make her want to leave, then what is Avery going to do? Avery will be fine, Dylan said firmly. They all would be. Caden snorted. I noticed you didn't protest that she might leave. Caden, this is between Kelly and I. Dylan stood. I have work to do, and you should get your own homework done. I know you have been avoiding your art project. Like you're avoiding the real issue right now? Caden jumped to his feet. Bentley and Avery have bonded, Dad. If Bentley leaves, it's going to hurt Avery badly. Not only that, but we all know Kelly can't afford Livingston Academy. By the end of the school year, she and Bentley would be out of our lives for real if you made her leave. But she's good for us, Dad. They make the house feel like a home. Caden, let the adults handle this. Dylan knew it wasn't really an answer, but he wanted his son to stop. Let the adults? Caden said in disgust. You'll just make a mess out of it like you already have. That's enough, Dylan said sharply. You should apologize to her, Caden insisted. Otherwise, she will leave and we will all just go back to being sad like after Shannon died. Dylan watched Caden stomp out of the office. Was that what he was pushing them towards? Sadness? Dylan had thought he would be protecting them. What if he was doing them more harm instead? Cece picked up the cookie and offered it to him. They really are good cookies. He took it automatically. I will go check on the boys, Cece said. Kelly left for a while. I'm not sure when she'll be back. Kelly left? Dylan focused on Caden's friend and tried to ignore the frisson of panic the thought produced. It was what he wanted, wasn't it? Did she say where she was going? No, nope, Cece shrugged. Bentley is still here, so she will be back. Dylan waited until Cece had left before shutting the office door again. He grabbed his cell phone and called Max. He needed some advice. Kelly knocked on Tiana's door. She desperately wanted someone to talk to. She had managed to keep from crying during the cab ride over, but was perilously close to it now. Kelly knocked again and hoped that Tiana was home and not picking up an extra shift at the nursing home. Patrick opened the door. He took one look at her and yelled over his shoulder, Mom, it's another one. Kelly took off her coat, forcing a smile. Hi, Patrick. Hey. He hung her coat up for her as Tiana came into the entryway. Kelly, Tiana frowned. I wasn't expecting you. Is it a bad time? Kelly kept her smile desperately in place. If it is, I could come back. Well, I'm kind of busy. Bex is having a small crisis. Tiana was throwing a bit of attitude Kelly's way. Kelly frowned. She wondered why the two of them hadn't contacted her. Can I help? I don't know. Do you have time for your old friends? What with your new, rich lifestyle? Tiana said coldly. I don't understand why you're angry with me, Kelly said softly. Maybe because you have barely talked to me since you married Mr. Rich Guy? Tiana posed the rhetorical question. Thanks for dropping us. Some friend you have been. I have been trying to sort out custody stuff for Bentley. Plus, you have been working extra hours, Kelly tried to explain. I have texted you. I know I called a couple of times, but it went to voicemail. Whatever, Tiana said. I think you should go. Be with your rich friends or whatever you are doing lately. Is that Kelly? Bex asked from the living room. Tiana, you were my best friend. Kelly couldn't believe what she was hearing. We were supposed to have each other's backs. Really? I don't think you need me any more. Don't rich people have perfect lives? asked Tiana sarcastically. Kelly! Bex came forward and hugged her before bursting into tears. I'm pregnant. Kelly automatically hugged Bex. Wow, Bex, that's amazing. Really? she sniffed. Well, Tomlin will make a great dad. 
Have you talked to Bo or Derek? Maybe they know a way to get in contact with him and he can come home for you. Privately, Kelly wondered at that possibility. Men didn't have a great track record of doing the right thing lately, in her opinion. That's a good idea. Bex let Kelly go. I knew you would think of something. Kelly pasted on a smile. I need to go, but call me, okay? Bex nodded. Thanks, Kelly. No problem. She looked at Tiana, who was studying her nails. Bye, Tiana. Tiana didn't say anything, so Kelly grabbed her coat and left. She made it to the stairwell, going a floor down before she sat down on the stairs. She buried her head in her hands and started a checklist in her head. Kelly needed to get a job ASAP, any job, so that she could start saving first and last rent. She needed a new bank account to put her new earnings in so she could give Dylan back the money in the bank account he had given her. All of it, including Bentley's education fund and the gold card. Kelly had to call Derek to let him know of this new development so they would be able to help mount an appropriate defense with the lawyer. For now, she would stay with Dylan to keep her son. However, six months after the verdict, she was done. He wanted her gone. She would go. Kelly would need to find some place, some time to break down properly and grieve the brokenness inside of her. Her heart was shattered from more than one breakup. Maybe she had just wished things with Dylan, but it didn't make it any less hurtful that he didn't want her. Tiana's rejection hurt just as bad. It was also time to stop lying about Christopher. It never had been a great love match as he hadn't wanted her either. She had been stupidly in love. He had wanted childish revenge on his parents, a last rebellion against Margaret and Terence. He had smoothed his way into Kelly's heart and used her to make his parents angry. He admitted it during his last days, asking for her forgiveness. Kelly was sick of pretending his memory was unblemished. While she would never say anything to Bentley, she was done of hiding it from everyone else. Pretending never got her anywhere. No one wanted her except her son. It was time to just face the fact. She wasn't good enough for anyone. Look where she came from, an alcoholic, drugged-out mother, and who knew who for a father. Just because she was desperate to fill the holes inside of her with love didn't mean that Dylan, Tiana, or anyone else did love her. In fact, these rejections proved it. She had Bentley. It would be enough until some day he grew up and grew away from her. Kelly had no illusions that if she was pregnant with Dylan's child, that he would let her keep it. It would be another custody battle that she would lose. Maybe she was an unfit mother, Kelly thought with some despair. The judge and everyone seemed to think so. The thought hurt. She had done everything she could to be the best mother she could be, and she had failed. She held back a sob. She didn't have time to break down right now. There was too much to do. Plus, she would look a fright and scare Bentley if she went on a crying jag. Hey, Patrick sat down beside her. Hey, Kelly took a deep breath. She dropped her hands to her knees and straightened up. Sorry about that, Patrick. You shouldn't have had to see your mom argue with me. She's jealous of you, you know. Patrick shrugged. She thinks you've got a perfect life now. Kelly had a hollow laugh. It's not perfect, believe me. I know, he said simply. People have the same issues, insecurities, problems, no matter how poor or rich they are. You are a smart kid, Patrick. Kelly bit her lip, focusing on the pain to stop any tears. If she bit any harder, she was going to draw blood. She's just hurt, he sighed. She will get over it. I'll talk to her. Kelly shrugged. It's okay. I'll be fine. You need to stop lying, Patrick advised. You're really bad at it. I know. She forced a smile and gave him a quick hard hug. I have got to go. Okay. He watched her get up. Hey, Kelly? Yeah? I know that life is mostly unfair, but we all get through it one step at a time, okay? Because she couldn't trust herself to speak, Kelly nodded and gave him the best of a smile that she could. She gave him a quick wave and headed down the stairs. Her first order of business was to go to another employment agency. She would do seasonal. She would serve coffee. She would bag groceries. Whatever they had, Kelly was ready. It wasn't like she had any other choice. She also needed to get a pregnancy kit. Kelly needed to know for certain so she could determine what to do with her future. At the convenience store, she spotted a help-wanted sign and wasted no time in talking to the owner. 
It wasn't what she was trained for, but she had done some retail in the past while she was paying for her living expenses during her college days. The owner promised to give her a chance. Kelly had an internal sigh of relief. One thing done. Next, she grabbed some quick items in the kit. She assured the owner it was for a friend. The last thing she needed was it counting against her that she might be pregnant, and him deciding not to employ her just because he would need to replace her in eight months or less for maternity leave. After hitting the library to post her resume on some job sites, Kelly decided to go home and face the inevitable. She needed to pee on the stick. Even as she took a cab, she vowed to pay Dylan back every cent that she spent of his. It was only right. Back at the house, Kelly tossed the pregnancy kit she had bought into the drawer and shut it. There was no point in taking it. She had started her monthly as soon as she stepped in the door, making the kit useless to her. More money wasted. As much as she adored babies and children, she had to admit she was relieved. This would not have been a good time to bring another life into the world. Kelly started training for her new job tomorrow at noon. It wasn't glamorous. It paid only minimum wage. Hopefully, it would be enough to pay the bills when she found a place. If not, she would be back with her mom and stepdad. As it was, she would keep trying to upgrade. It might be a tough job market, but there had to be something out there that would benefit from her skills. Kelly wondered how long it would be before the Islingtons set another court date after they lost the appeal, or if they were allowed to. She would have to ask Derek if they could just continue to hound her until they won. If Kelly were forced to live with Meredith, the Islingtons probably would win. Was there any point in delaying the inevitable? Would it be better if she just tried to negotiate some visitation hours for herself before giving custody of Bentley over to Margaret and Terrence? Kelly grabbed her phone and waited for Derek to pick up. Kelly, the dragon is angry today, so let's try to keep it brief. Derek's voice was muffled. If the Islingtons lose the appeal, can they still file for custody again? She asked. If the circumstances of Bentley have changed, such as an undesirable living habitat, or if you became an unfit parent, yes, they could. That's not going to happen, though, so why are you asking? He questioned. It will never end unless I give up custody, Kelly said softly and sat down on the bed. Can I get more favorable visitation terms if I settle out of court? Of course, but you are not going to settle. Derek's voice became more pronounced as he shifted the phone. You are going to win. You're Mrs. Ramsley now. You've got this in the bag. Kelly had a hollow laugh. He wants to quietly separate and divorce after the custody appeal is done. So I'm still screwed. Derek growled. Let me talk to him. There's no point. I'm not going to stay where I am not wanted. Kelly swallowed hard. I would like you to draw up an agreement with the best visitation hours you can get me. Kelly, no. Think about this, he protested. There's nothing else I can do. I might keep Bentley for another few months, but ultimately, they are going to take him from me. Kelly wiped away a tear. I should just cooperate now and get visitation. Otherwise, I might get nothing. I can't go through life not seeing my son. Kelly, we can fight this. We'll get you a better lawyer. On whose money? Dylan's? No. I won't be able to pay him back as it is. Kelly's voice wobbled. Just draw up the papers. Kelly hung up on Derek's protests. She curled up into a ball on the bed and cried her heart out. Want to blow something up? Max asked with a grin. We've got it set up for later today. If you stick around, you can press the button. Dylan shook his head. He hadn't come to Max's job site expecting to help with the demolition work. He had come for his cousin's advice. What Dylan needed was a sounding board to tell him where he was going wrong. Now he was wearing a hard hat and touring with Max the grounds of an old derelict building the city wanted gone to make way for new construction. I was hoping to talk to you, Dylan said. Max groaned. Please tell me it's not about our insurance premiums. They're soaring each year, even with our unblemished track record of no accidents. No, he shook his head. It's about Kelly. Kelly? Max questioned. Since when are you seeing someone? Dylan showed his cousin the wedding ring. I married her? Whoa, and you didn't invite me? Max pressed a hand over his heart. I am wounded. 
It was a sudden thing. Dylan ignored Max's antics. Vegas? No, Dylan sighed. Can we go somewhere quieter? Sure thing. Max led the way through the noise and machinery. They were finishing clearing away a small building before the larger one was set to come down with carefully placed explosives. Max brought Dylan to a trailer which contained a bunch of filing cabinets, some chairs, a table with some coffee items on it, and an old beat-up desk. Welcome to my office. Dylan tried not to smile and failed. What a difference from Max's office when he used to work the family business of Ramsley Pharmaceutical. While Max's office at Ramsley had been upscale and professional, this office was messy, used by the crew, and had personal photos of Max's family. Nice. Hey, don't knock the office. I decorated it myself. Max grabbed a coffee. Help yourself and tell me all your woes. Max's therapy is in service. Dylan rolled his eyes and poured himself a coffee. Are these cups even clean? Since when have you become the snob? Remember in Dubai? We drank out of cups made of grass and mud. At least, I hope it was mud. Max sat down and put his feet up on the desk. What's really going on? I got married, Dylan sighed as he sat down. You already mentioned that. Who is she? What's she like? Max sipped his coffee. Her name is Kelly Islington. Her son Bentley and Avery are friends. I barely know her. Dylan frowned into his cup before setting it aside. Kelly Islington. Sounds familiar. Max arched an eyebrow. She was a nurse at Mercy Hospital. She helped when Michael had surgery, Dylan said dryly. Little Nurse Kelly, Max nodded. I remember her now. You married her? She was about to lose custody of her son, Bentley. Dylan explained the whole mess from getting kidnapped, which Max roared in laughter over, to the current state of his marriage, which Max grew sober over. I thought I could protect myself and the boys from the pain of Kelly and Bentley's leaving. I mean, it was just a marriage of convenience to ensure that she got to keep her son. She was going to leave at some point anyways. You have some seriously screwed up logic, Max stated. The longer she stays, then the more we will want them to stay, Dylan tried to explain again. It makes sense to have them leave sooner rather than later, so it won't be as painful. Am I doing the right thing? No. Max answered. You are not very bright. Thanks, Dylan said dryly. First, you came to me for advice, which was a bad idea. What you want is validation for what you have already decided to do. And since I am the guy who is happily married, I'm not about to give you any validation because your plan sucks. My advice for you is to stop doing silly things. You slept with her, so you have feelings for her. Max waited for Dylan to agree. Maybe, he sighed. Okay, fine, I have feelings for her. In my defense, I tried not to. She obviously has feelings for you, or she wouldn't be sleeping with you or be upset by your rejecting her. Max took another sip of coffee. I didn't reject her, Dylan grimaced. Really? Because you told her you wanted to divorce her. I would say that's a pretty big rejection. It was the logical thing to do. We barely know each other. There's no way a marriage like this could work, Dylan insisted. Marriages of convenience happen all over the world. Just because it's not common in North America doesn't it mean that they aren't sometimes successful. Max raised an eyebrow. Seems to me your logic is flawed. You want to protect yourself from losing her, so you are pushing her away, thus doing the very thing you were worried about happening. You are going to lose her if you keep this up. What if she dies? Dylan asked suddenly. Then she does. Max put down the coffee and sat up. No one can protect anyone from that. You know that better than anyone I know. But have you asked yourself what if she lives, and you miss out on living and enjoying life with her? What about the moments of joy and happiness that you could have? Are you going to toss them away because you are afraid? Maybe she will outlive you. Who can say? It's a huge risk, Dylan sighed. Max shrugged. Life is a huge risk. You're in insurance. You know that no one can protect against all the risks. All we can do is decide if the reward is worth it. Max was right, although Dylan hated to admit it. He was about to say as much and ask for advice on how to fix things when his phone began to ring. Hello? What did you do? 
Derek demanded. Excuse me? Dylan frowned. She's going to give up custody of Bentley in return for visitation rights, Derek growled. All because someone said something about divorce? What was that all about? Are you actually going to keep your word and help Kelly keep her son, or are you flaking on us because it's not fun for your rich boy self anymore? What's the deal, Dylan? I didn't know, Dylan replied. She didn't tell me that. Why would she? She thinks you want her out of your life, Derek pointed out. That's not true. Dylan felt anxiety as he said it, but he knew he didn't want to lose Kelly. You had better talk to her, Derek said. She's not answering her phone right now. Dylan felt a fissure of panic at the thought. I will get back to you. He ended the call. For a moment, he felt the same helplessness that had invaded him after Wren had taken her own life. Kelly thought she was losing her son. What if she had done something to herself? Dylan, you okay? Max was looking concerned. I'm fine. I need to go, Dylan stood. I will drive you, Max got to his feet. You look paler than a ghost right now. You don't need to, he protested weakly. The room was slanting a little, and he forced himself to drag in a deep breath. Kelly wouldn't harm herself. She had Bentley to think about. Wren had had Shannon, Caden, and an unborn child to think about, but that hadn't stopped her. I'm driving, Max insisted. He grabbed a set of keys, and they got into a company truck that had seen better days. Max started the ignition. Where to? Home, Dylan swallowed and hoped everything was fine. He knew he was probably being irrational. Kelly was probably fine. The thought didn't make him any less tense or worried. He wondered if he should call the police for a wellness check. Max and he were at least a half hour away from the house. Anything could happen in that time. Dylan, I know this might be a bit sensitive, but did you do any therapy after Ren's death? Max stopped for a red light. Dylan gave a bitter laugh. Therapy didn't seem to help Ren much. Ren wasn't well. Max reminded Dylan gently. And you still have issues regarding her death that maybe a therapist could help you get through? Dylan ignored Max and tried calling Kelly. It went through to voicemail. He left a terse message for her to call him immediately. It was the best he could do right now since his nerves were a little frayed. Dylan, Kelly isn't Wren. She's okay, Max assured him. She's a pretty strong little lady. She's been through a lot lately. Dylan felt some relief when the light turned green and they were traveling again. He knew that a lot of what she was currently going through was his fault. He had made her think that she couldn't win a custody battle without him, that she would lose her son. She had to be devastated to give up. You really are an idiot. Max shook his head with a low whistle. What? Dylan glared at his friend and cousin. He didn't really appreciate Max disparaging him when he was in the middle of worrying for Kelly's safety. You love her, Max stated confidently. You love her and you are trying to push her away. That's the dumbest thing I have ever heard. You should be doing everything in your power to convince her to stay. Max, could you keep your eyes on the road and just drive? Dylan requested through clenched teeth. Nope. I like to give my opinion when I can, Max said calmly as he negotiated the traffic. I recommend flowers, groveling, foot massages, groveling, apologizing profusely. And did I mention groveling? Groveling is a good technique for getting back into a lady's good graces. However, try to avoid the situation that would require groveling in the first place. That's a good tip, too. Dylan ignored Max and tried calling Kelly again. It went straight to voicemail, so he knew that she had shut off her phone. Or her phone was broken. Wren's cell phone had been broken. Dylan closed his eyes and tried to breathe evenly against the images that his brain produced. He didn't want to remember. Max kept up a cheerful banter before pulling up in front of Dylan's house. We are here. I can't go in. Dylan stared down at his hands at the cheap ring from the courthouse. Dread had settled into his chest. Max looked at his friend in sympathy. Okay, I'm going to take my keys from the truck. I'll need your keys to unlock the front door. I'm going to have a look around. Dylan nodded and handed Max his keys. If you find her, you need to look for a pulse. Dill, she's fine. Max tried to assure him. He put a hand on Dylan's shoulder. She might be upset, 
maybe even angry, but she's good. Do you know first aid? Dylan asked as he continued to study his wedding ring. Yeah, I'm certified for the job site. Max gave Dylan's shoulder a squeeze. You will see that all you're worrying is for nothing. Max left Dylan in the truck. He resolved to get Dylan to agree to see a therapist. It was obvious that he was in need of help. He searched the house and found Kelly curled up in a ball, sleeping in the middle of the bed in the master bedroom. Max knocked on the door frame. Kelly blinked and rubbed her face. Good morning, Max drawled, even though it was afternoon. Max? Kelly sat up and frowned. What are you doing here? I'm here to impart invaluable advice. Max sat down in the room's armchair. Dylan was worried about you. Why? she asked Riley. Max sighed. You weren't answering your phone. So? Kelly didn't mean to sound like a belligerent child, but she felt a little like one. She twisted the wedding band on her finger and then pulled it off. I wanted to take a nap without interruptions. Taking off the ring was a bad sign in Max's opinion. What did he tell you about Wren? He said she died before Avery was born. She was on life support until Avery could be okay. Kelly wiped her eyes. They still felt gritty after all the crying she had done. He said she was depressed a lot. Wren jumped out of that window, Max pointed. It's not very far from the ground, but there used to be a big cement planter out there. Her skull was broken and her brain irreparably damaged. It wasn't the first time she tried to harm herself. Dylan found her. He did CPR on her because she had a pulse. He's the one who insisted the paramedic continue life-saving measures. He saved Avery's life, Max said softly. I didn't know, Kelly whispered. He doesn't talk about it, and that's a problem. Honestly, he could use some therapy, Max grimaced. He's out in the truck right now, worried you have hurt yourself because you weren't answering your phone. He thought I would harm myself? She frowned. I would never do that. Dylan doesn't exactly have the best frame of reference for what's normal in a marriage, Max pointed out. He also has some flawed judgment. He thought he was protecting himself and the boys by pushing you away. He is afraid loving again because he was such a mess after Ren and Shannon died. He's scared that if he loves you and you leave or die, he will go through the same process again. How did Shannon die? There were some complications from a drug that she was on for her diabetes. It was a slow process, Max sighed. He says he wants to separate and later divorce. Kelly fiddled with her wedding band. No, he doesn't. He's in love with you. In fact, I bet if you go out to the truck right now, he will recant that divorce talk pretty quick. Max stood and stretched. I'm going to go raid your kitchen. You should go and make sure he knows you're okay. Kelly watched him head out of the bedroom. She fiddled with her ring a moment longer, then put it back on before washing her face. She decided to follow Max's advice. She pulled on a thick sweater and went out to Max's work truck, knocking on the passenger window. Dylan opened the door and pulled her into his arms, holding her tightly. Please don't ever do that again. Do what? Kelly's question was muffled against his shirt. Not answer your phone? It was off because I was sleeping, she explained. Giving up, she wrapped her arms around him and enjoyed the sensation of being held. I'm sorry, Kelly, he said. Why? I shouldn't have said that we should get a divorce like that. I should have talked to you first, discussed what you wanted to do. Dylan pulled away from her. Yes, you should have, Kelly answered, because I would have told you I wanted a chance to make this marriage work. You want to try? he asked, searching her face. Yes, she said firmly. Also, I think we need to go to counseling together. I know I have some issues from my previous marriage. Maybe we could both benefit from talking to someone. Talking didn't help Wren much. He shrugged, not having much faith in the idea. We aren't her. If we don't like the counselor we get, we will switch until we find one who's helping, Callie suggested. Okay. Dylan reluctantly agreed. We still need to get that dog as well. Kelly smiled. Maybe this weekend? He nodded. I'd like that. A lovebird stub away from the truck. Max grinned as he came up to them. Dylan took the house keys that Max returned to him. Thank you, Max, for everything. I'm batting two for two, you know. 
I'm thinking maybe switching my careers to matchmaker, Max said semi-seriously. Kelly groaned. I'm not sure the world is ready for you. You don't think so? Max ruffled up her hair. I know so, she replied, ducking away and holding on to Dylan. Too bad, I might have been good at it. Max smiled as he got into the truck. Stick to blowing stuff up, Dylan advised, keeping his arms wrapped around Kelly. Max gave them a wave as he drove away. The couple ignored him as Dylan kissed Kelly. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the epilogue of Reluctant Husband. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Epilogue Hey, where did the marshmallows go? Bentley asked. There should be bags of them. Kelly looked around. Over there. Cool. Bentley scooped up a bag and raced back to Avery, who had already found the wires to toast them over the small fire from a lit candle on the decorated table. They are going to get sick on s'mores, Kelly murmured. I'll tell them to slow it down a bit, Dylan replied. He left her side to talk to the boys. The last few months had been challenging and wonderful at the same time. Finally, the issue of custody had been put to rest with Kelly retaining full custody of her son. Dylan and she had made progress with the second person they chose for counseling services. Dylan had reduced his working hours and delegated more of his work, which meant that they could enjoy more of his time together as a family. Kelly had started consulting with her nursing skills as a small business. She worked only a few hours a week, and for now, that had suited her just fine. Today, they were celebrating with friends and family. They had decided to have an informal event in the backyard with catering in, decorations, and some entertainment. Kelly and Dylan had retaken their vows, but chosen to keep their original rings from the courthouse. They had even invited Judge Bowman to come and officiate, since he had been integral to their marriage. S'mores were part of the dessert spread as a tribute to the camping trip where they had gotten to know each other better. Dylan smiled at Kelly, making her heart do a little flip as he approached. Did I remember to tell you how much I love you today? He wrapped his arms around her. Hmm, Kelly pretended to think, tapping a finger against her chin. You might have, as long as I remember to tell you how much I love you today. You two are disgustingly sweet, a voice said from nearby. Your turn will come, Dylan told his brother Jake. Kelly and I can't be the only ones giving Dad and Mom grandkids. Jake shuddered as he took a sip of his drink. Don't even mention that. Mom will hear and hound me for the rest of the night. I think I'll go find some safety with the rest of the bachelors. Everett is over there. Dylan nodded at his other brother. Kelly watched as Jake walked away. How come they are single? Don't know, Dylan shrugged, but they sure are missing out on something special. I know that I've been missing out on someone special, Tiana said as she approached the couple. I wanted to apologize, Kelly. I'm sorry for being a horrible friend. I was hoping you would come, Kelly gave Tiana a tentative smile. Forgive me, Tiana asked, please. Only if you'll come over for some ice cream soon, Kelly said. Promise I will, Tiana gave Kelly a hug. I have missed you so much. Hey, Dylan frowned as Cece and Caden raced by, chasing two pugs. I thought the dogs were going to stay inside. The kids laughed as more children joined in the effort to capture the two dogs. So, Kelly gave Tiana a nudge, there's a group of bachelors over there, including Everett and Jake. Really? Hmm, I find I might have to go to the bar nearby. I feel a little thirsty. Tiana grinned at Kelly. Go for it. Kelly smiled back as her friend sashayed past the group of men near the bar. Did you just send your friend man-hunting near my brothers? Dylan asked her. Yep, Kelly smiled. Wouldn't it be funny if she caught one of them? It might be, Dylan grinned. Here to dance? Shouldn't we rescue puddles and piddles? Kelly raised an eyebrow. Dylan shook his head. Caden will get them. Come dance with me. Kelly put her hand in his and let him lead her to the dance floor. The waiter put on a pair of white gloves. He was dressed in black and looked the part as he served coffee to the guests. As he came up on one particular gentleman, he palmed a small razor. While serving him coffee, he nicked the man's ear. Ow! The old man jerked away, scowling. I'm sorry, sir, the waiter explained. I saw a bee. 
I hope you weren't bitten nor stung. The old man muttered as he touched the ear, which came away slightly bloody. Before he could complain, the waiter excused himself. He put down the coffee craft and turned the glove inside out, preserving the blood on it. At the edge of the gathering, a tattooed man waited. The waiter put the glove in a plastic bag the man held out. It went perfectly, the waiter said. You're certain it was him? the tattooed man asked. You know all these old grumpy guys kind of look alike. It was him, the waiter assured him. I heard someone call him by name. Good. The tattoo guy handed over a wad of cash, pocketing the glove. The waiter left, and the tattooed guy was about to leave as well when a small dog ran panting to him. Who are you? he asked, crouching down and letting the dog sniff his hand. A boy and a girl came running up, another leashed pug at their heels. Piddles! The man laughed. Is that what you named him? Piddles? You poor thing. Who are you? the girl asked. No one important? He smiled at them. Why don't you take Piddles inside, where he won't bother anyone none? That way, he won't get lost, neither. Caden clicked a leash onto the pug's collar. I don't think you're invited. You're a smart man, the man said. He petted the pug, then stood. I gotta ask, what's the other pug's name? Puddles, Caden replied. The man laughed as he walked away. If you enjoyed Dylan Kelly's story in Reluctant Husband, Book 4 of the Ramsley Brothers series, then continue the magic with Drew and Beth's story in Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series. We all want to know what deep, dark secret the Ramsleys have been hiding. Bethany Searson has been having nightmares from the elusive memories of her childhood. Are they real or fabricated? Undergoing a new therapy, she tries to sort out what really happened. Andrew Colburn Ramsley wants nothing to do with David Ramsley's legitimate offspring. However, after he rescues Bethany from a situation, Drew realizes her life is in danger and he might need some help from an unexpected source. Can Drew save Beth from a secret that could tear an entire family apart? We met Derek in Reluctant Husband. Find out more about him in the Broken One series, Sweet Valentine Book One. Derek Kramer lives his life on a schedule, his boss Cynthia's schedule to be exact. He works 16 to 20 hours a day with the woman and has to admit that his co-workers might be right when they call him whipped. Cynthia Stone is a prominent lawyer headed for senior partner in the firm, until her sister's death brings five nieces and nephews into her life, changing things forever. Now she's got to figure out how to balance her workaholic life with being a mom to these children. Derek thinks it's the funniest thing ever. His dragon of a boss can't cook, clean, do laundry, or get gum out of hair. How is she going to look after these kids? From parenting 101 classes to burnt suppers, the sparks are flying.